Hi. Hi, Clink. Okay, I guess we can start. Wait, let me just stop my script. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon. Welcome to this meeting of the Special Committee on Creative Industry and Performing Arts. Today is October 21. And in behalf of the committee, I'd like to call this meeting to order. So please allow me to invite you all to a moment of prayer to include in our thoughts everybody, especially our fellow Filipinos who have been affected by the pandemic in any way. Let's pray for those fighting for their lives in hospitals, at home, those fearing for the lives and health of their loved ones, and those suffering emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually, economically uh, from this pandemic. Let's also pray for the souls of those who have been taken away from us that they may live in eternity at the side of our dearest Lord. Dear God, thank you for giving us the opportunity to gather online here today as we go through this committee meeting. May you guide our hearts and our minds so that we may have the wisdom to plan and address the concerns of our people, both in government and the private sector, and how we can best serve our Filipino uh, workers, creative workers in the print and uh, publishing industry. Thank you for the rich and beautiful culture and talents that our dear nation has developed. And with your grace, may we protect it and may it continue to flourish. These we ask in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. And Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. So thanks to all those who joined us. The next item is the calling of the role. So May I hear a motion to dispense? Uh, I move to transfer the, the colleague of the room. Second. second. Great. There's a motion. Julie seconded to dispense. And hearing no objection, the motion is carried. The next item is the approval of minutes of the meeting held last October 7. And can I hear a motion to dispense? And approve the same. Mr. Chair, I Mr. move Chair. that we dispense with the reading of the minutes and approve the same. I second. There's a motion, Julie seconded to dispense with the reading of the minutes and to approve the same. And hearing no objection, the motion is carried. I would like us to acknowledge the resource persons present, both from the public and private sector. So, Comsec, take it away. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon to everybody. Welcome to the meeting of the Special Committee on Creative Industry and Performing Arts. Our resource speakers for today, coming from the Department of Foreign Affairs, we have Assistant Secretary Eduardo Munez with Director Cristina Popo, Corpus Popov and Principal Assistant Paula Ebora. From the Intellectual Property Office of the Philippines, we have Mr. Jeremy Bayaras. From the Board of Investments, we have Ms. Remedius Lim. From the National Book Development Board, we have Mr. Ryan Esteban and Mr. Dante Ang. From the Department of Education, we have Director Aris Kawilan and Ms. Christine Graza Magbo. From the Department of Information and Communication, we have Attorney Omar Sana. From the Department of Justice, State Council Janeline de Locura. From the Private Sector Book Development Association of the Philippines, we have Ms. Annie Rosa Almario. From the Filipinas Copyright Licensing Society, or PhilCalls, we have Mr. Alvin Buenaventura and Mr. Leo Almonte. From the United Print Media Group, Mr. Barbie Atienza. And from the Philippine Educational Publishers Association, Ms. Tina Balagtas. That's all, Mr. Chair. Right, thanks, Comsec. I'd also like to acknowledge our members, of course, our distinguished Vice Chair, Dr. Kiko Benitez. And uh, we have Congressman Coco Nograles. Thank you for joining us, sirs. Okay, so good afternoon again to all of you and all of those who are watching us live on Facebook. Uh, welcome to this meeting. Today is October 21. 
Today is the second session on the deliberation of House Resolution 2137 entitled A Resolution Urging the House Through the Special Committee and Other Appropriate Committees to Conduct an Inquiry in Aid of Legislation on the State of the Philippine Publishing Industry and Other Related Industries. Uh, this resolution was filed by yours truly and Congressman Kiko Benitez. In the last session, which was held last September 16, we commenced a deliberation on the state of this industry, and we were filled with substantial information on the industry's value chain, emerging trends, and the state of its education. I believe outside of this committee hearing, we even met with the stakeholders from CHED as they weren't able to join us in the first session, and we had an even deeper discussion on um, education and industry support that could possibly come from CHED and talks are ongoing and I hope that they will be joining us here and in the last session uh, to be scheduled uh, very soon. Anyway, back to the first hearing, Dr. Uh, Percival Peña Reyes, consultant of the Competitiveness and Innovation Group of the DTI, shared with us that three years ago, the industry's total gross value added was 49.2 billion pesos, which is 0.91% of the country's GDP. We also learned that the estimated employment in the industry was 574,000, with a total trade at US uh, 55 million US dollars. Um, 51 million in imports and 4 million in exports. However, when the pandemic hit, this was one of the sectors that experienced uh, its effects. Ms. Charis Aquino Tugade, Executive Director of the National Book Development Board, with the assistance of the Book Development Association of the Philippines, Comiket, and Filipinas Copyright Licensing. Society or Phil Calls gave a presentation where they identify the components of the book publishing industry, which are trade books, academic books, and textbooks. They pinpointed several pressing issues in terms of readership, as well as pressing issues related to creatives and content creators, such as the lack of literary agents to help develop intellectual property, capacity building activities, are also concentrated in NCR. There's also the absence of standard rates to help professionalize service cost. And there's a lack of enforcement of copyright laws on the ground, among other issues that arose. Clearly, these issues pointed out by the stakeholders have been highlighted and we continue to address them as we go along with our hearing today. Over the past decade, the publishing and print media industry has been, to use the current buzzword, disrupted, especially now that the industry is greatly impacted by the pandemic. Ebooks have largely taken over the niche formerly held by mass market paperbacks, cheap disposable books. Print on demand and online booksellers have changed the entire distribution system and have made self-publishing economically practical and sometimes even profitable for the first time ever since. Publishers are still adjusting to this and nobody knows how it is going to play out in the long run. Still, both the established players and small publishers of the industry using the traditional methods, but also the new ones, have a big advantage in at least some areas. Marketing opportunities, institutional support, intellectual property protection and government regulations affecting them. Hence, the topics that we will have a substantial discussion of. They can get their books into stores or online websites where buyers and readers will see them. They also still have to consider our reputation for quality, protection of intellectual property rights and from adverse regulations, if any, and government support. All right, so that being said, a few reminders for good order before I turn the floor over to the resource persons from the government agencies present. Please do observe online meeting etiquette, such as being mindful of the mute button. 
Kindly also address all comments and inquiries to the chair for proper order. Finally, please note that all messages in the chat will not be recorded in the official minutes of the meeting. So if there are thoughts and insights that you would like to share, please do so verbally. And uh, what we have here flashed uh, are the topics for today as I discussed and our last hearing will be next month um, on those two topics listed in the slide. So without further ado, let's start our second session of the inquiry. So may we now hear from our resource persons on the first topic, which is marketing issues and opportunities, local and international, as well as institutional support for authors. So we'll start with DFA, followed by DTI, and then DICT. And then uh, we'll move on to the NPDB. And I think it's very timely because uh, right now we are participating in the Frankfurt Book Fair. So definitely that's one of the main marketing programs being implemented. So uh, without further ado, um, DFA, you have the floor. Th thank you, Mr. Chair, and to the uh, other members of the committee, good afternoon. Uh, for those of you from the other sectors uh, who may not be familiar, I am Eduardo R. Martin Menez, the Assistant Secretary of the Office of Public and Cultural Diplomacy uh, of the DFA. And uh, as was mentioned, uh, the DFA will be presenting a brief PowerPoint on uh, what our uh, department does uh, in the area of uh, Philippine publishing uh, and other related industries. Uh, the next slide provides an overview of uh, our efforts. Uh, particularly, we will show how our posts help uh, in Philippine literature uh, and uh, Philippine publishing, um, including the support that we provide to uh, Filipino authors and publishers. And then we will go to the uh, issue uh, discussing uh, marketing issues and opportunities uh, in relation to the Department of Foreign Affairs. Uh, for those of you who have not heard a, a presentation from the DFA uh, under the Creative Industries uh, uh, hearings, let me just uh, reiterate uh, that uh, we have 94 foreign service posts, embassies and consulates around the world. Uh, and the office that I represent, the Office of Public and Cultural Diplomacy, and in particular, the Cultural Diplomacy Division uh, is responsible for uh, discussing, devising, and implementing a cultural diplomacy program. And uh, obviously, uh, when we speak about the Philippine authors and publishers, then uh, we would do that in the context of cultural diplomacy. Um, although, of course, uh, it could also be considered as part of economic diplomacy. Um, but uh, in the main, uh, both of these aspects can be combined. Uh, we recognize the very valuable assistance that uh, Deputy Speaker Lauren Lagarda, and even when she was uh, a senator before, uh, her advocacy of culture as the fourth pillar of Philippine foreign policy was translated uh, by her support, uh, as in um, monetary support uh, to the cultural diplomacy programs of the DFA 
And part of that, of course, was also in the area of uh, promoting uh, Philippine publishing abroad. The next slide, uh, yes, is uh, examples <coughs> of uh, our different posts, uh, efforts uh, locally, I mean, within their jurisdictions uh, to help Filipino authors. So on the screen, you see some examples of uh, publications that our embassies have helped uh, promote. Uh, the first that you see uh, is a uh, cookbook, uh, Cucinera Filipina, by a Filipino Argentinian chef, Cristina Sune, uh, that was. Uh, well, promoted uh, through our embassy in Buenos Aires in 2019. Uh, obviously, the book was uh, produced to promote Filipino cuisine uh, in relation to the culture of Argentina and other Latin American countries. Uh, through the funding support of Deputy Speaker Legarda, our embassy in Portugal uh, is uh, in the process of publishing two books. Uh, the first is The Islands Beyond the Empire, Portuguese Essays on Early Modern Philippine History, uh, which will make available in English several classic essays on Portuguese relations with the Philippines and the Documenta Filipina, the Philippines and Portuguese Archives and Libraries, uh, which is a, another legacy project aimed at uh, locating uh, and identifying historical materials relevant to the history of the Philippines in Portuguese uh, archives and libraries. Uh, these two uh, publications by our embassy in Portugal are being done in conjunction with the celebration of the uh, quincentennial of the uh, circumnavigation of the world. Uh, so as you can see, these are two examples uh, uh, which were initiated by individual embassies. Uh, and this is done uh, in other posts as well on an individual basis. For example, uh, our mission to the UN in New York recently also uh, co-sponsored the launching of a guidebook uh, called Inherent Dignity, which I believe was on the Filipino peacekeepers uh, uh, operations. And uh, we also have publications uh, targeted at the second and third generation Filipinos overseas, such as a book published by our post in New Zealand uh, in 2014, uh, titled New Zealand in the Eyes of the Filipino Migrant Youth Adjustment and Acceptance. Uh, so aside from publication, and uh, promotion of uh, individual books uh, by our various posts. Uh, we also have efforts to translate uh, Filipino books uh, for the uh, foreign markets. Uh, but again, these are also individual uh, efforts by our uh, embassies and consulates. Uh, when I say individual, it is through the efforts of the ambassador and the cultural officer in that particular embassy to uh, look for or work with Filipino authors uh, in order to come up with a publication and promote it uh, within that uh, uh, embassy's jurisdiction. So uh, examples of the translations 
that have been uh, done by Filipino uh, Foreign Service posts to try and expand the market uh, by uh, uh, in other languages, of course, would be uh, our Cambodian embassy translating into the Khmer language two Filipino children's books, Naku uh, Naku and Si Pagong at Si Matsing, uh, which was done in commemoration of the 60th anniversary of Philippine-Cambodia diplomatic relations. Our embassy in uh, Bangladesh, uh, who was headed, uh, which was headed by a career diplomat who is, a, who is an acknowledged poet, uh, Ambassador Vicente Bandilio, uh, translated or uh, assisted in the translation into Bengali of a book on Philippine folk tales. Uh, other efforts. We have also uh, tried to partner with certain publishing houses uh, our, uh, abroad. Uh, for example, uh, our consulate general in New York worked with the Penguin Classics in the US to publish Nick Joaquin's The Woman Who Had Two Navels and Tales of the Tropical Gothic. Uh, uh, this was done in 2017 uh, to mark the centennial of the Philippine national artist, uh, Nick Joaquin. Uh, and it was the first time that uh, Nick Joaquin's works uh, were uh, carried uh, by a uh, American publishing house. Another example uh, of how the DFA tries to promote the publishing industry and Filipino authors uh, is through the hosting of book launches. Uh, we have, of course, been approached, our foreign service posts have been appro approached by uh, Filipino authors to help uh, promote uh, these books. And examples, are, again, are shown on screen. Our embassy uh, in Australia um, launched the book, The Kindness of Birds, by Filipino-Australian author, Dr. Merlinda Bobis at the National Gallery of Australia uh, during the celebration of the 75th anniversary of the establishment of di diplomatic relations um, between the two countries. Um, our embassy in London hosted the launch of the Noli Mitangere audio book based on the translation uh, of uh, Leon Maria Guerrero, of course, who was another career diplomat uh, back in the days, and who was also uh, a Philippine ambassador to the United Kingdom. The English language audiobook uh, was the product of a collaboration between the Guerrero Publishing uh, and the British actor Richard E. Grant, who uh, provided the narration of the novel. And uh, our consulate general in San Francisco collaborated with the Philippine American Writers and Artists uh, uh, Incorporated to launch the book, Cuento, Lost Things, an anthology of Philippine myths composed of fiction, nonfiction, poetry, and visual art contrib contributed by Filipino and Filipino American writers, poets, and artists. Uh, the book contained reimagined stories of mythological creatures like the Aswang, Capre, Duende, and even creationists such as Malacastan Maganda, uh, as told to them by their mothers, grandmothers, and elders. There are other books that were launched by Filipino writers overseas, and usually our posts assist in the launch to help introduce the book to the local community and Filipinos uh, in, in that uh, area. Uh, for example, uh, the Philippines also launched an exhibit of Filipino children's book, uh, Karapat Dapat, Child, Know Your Rights at the UN uh, in Geneva to highlight efforts to implement the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Uh, 
during its 30th anniversary in 2019. And our embassy in Spain also hosted the launch of a biography of Gregoria de Jesus, uh, the, uh, the hero of, a Philippine, of the Philippine Revolution entitled Bayani Biographies, Gregoria de, la, de Jesus. Uh, we also uh, helped uh, Philippine participation in book fairs. And it was earlier mentioned that uh, the Philippines is presently uh, represented at the Frankfurt Book Fair ongoing right now. Um, uh, and the Frankfurt Book Fair is the largest and oldest trade fair for books and uh, related content in, uh, in Europe. And this year will be the sixth consecutive appearance of the Philippines at the fair uh, with the National Book Development Board as lead agency. Uh, this year's participation is another step in the long journey ahead for the Philippines and Philippine publishing with a plan to bid uh, as a guest of honor uh, country in 2025. We will now discuss uh, again briefly uh, certain issues and opportunities uh, from the perspective of the Department of Foreign Affairs. And as just uh, uh, explained, uh, we believe that with the National Book Development Board as the lead agency within, within uh, uh, the Philippines, uh, the, our country can and should participate in more book fairs and markets around the world uh, so that uh, our publishing houses and our authors will have more opportunities to share uh, Philippine talent um, around the world. Uh, it is ironic that uh, there was a time when the Philippines was considered as the third largest English speaking uh, country in the world. And yet uh, it does not seem that uh, um, our industry uh, has taken advantage of this uh, particular uh, unique uh, placement. Um, and uh, of course, we need to further expose our authors and their works to the international market and hopefully uh, get recognition uh, to help uh, spread uh, uh, this particular industry. Of course, uh, everything uh, comes with a price, uh, particularly in terms of marketing and uh, translation of Philippine books uh, to make it uh, well, uh, more readable uh, outside of the English language. And uh, funding has always been a challenge, uh, not only for Philippine culture as a whole, but in particular in the area of promoting uh, Philippine authors and Philippine publishing. Um, so this is an issue that needs to be <clears throat> uh, discussed and, and uh, uh, solved. And uh, as also mentioned earlier in the overview, um, with the advent of uh, information communications technology, the era of uh, paper books and paper publications uh, is facing many, many issues and challenges. And uh, the aspect of ebooks and uh, this type of uh, publishing uh, is an area that needs to be uh, examined. Uh, and perhaps uh, this is something that the Philippines uh, could take the lead in uh, and perhaps uh, at less cost than uh, you know, uh, publishing hard copies of 
our literary uh, and academic uh, work. So that is, briefly is, is the DFA's perspective uh, on this particular, particular issue. Thank you, Asik Ed. Um, all right, so now we'll move on to DTI for their presentation. Is there anything new that you'd like to add to what was shared in the last hearing? Hello. Uh, good afternoon, Chair, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, the Venetia. And good afternoon. Uh, this is Ivan Bernardo Ho from the Competitiveness and Innovation Group. Uh, good afternoon to the other members of the committee, to our officials, and also members of the, of the various government agencies, to our resource persons, and also to the stakeholders. So on behalf of the Department of Trade and Industry, I will be presenting to you uh, some of the identified marketing issues and also opportunities, as well as institutional support as part of our continuation discussion on the current state of the Philippine publishing and print media industry. Uh, next slide. Uh, next slide, Josh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so just a brief recap on, on in terms of the definitions identified by the department and what is currently being integrated in terms of our uh, 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 sector-specific system. So we have adopted the definition of PONCTED, which focuses on uh, the production of creative content with the purpose of communicating to large audiences. And aside from that, uh, the definition identified by UNESCO, which encapsulates the scope of the sector, uh, integrating its various formats, wherein it is, is not limited to physical, but also includes electronic and virtual. Next slide. Just to have a recap on terms of the sectoral uh, basic codes that has been identified by the department, we have identified at least uh, uh, codes from four different large uh, sectoral groups, uh, namely from manufacturing, uh, wholesale and retail trade, information and communication, and administrative and support services. So throughout the last session, uh, we have been engaging actually with the NBDD to, to further refine this and to also further understand the intricacies of each specific code in order for us to build more policy, uh, data-driven policy and programs. So next slide. So as we tackle the current state of the industry, we always check out the global and local phenomenon that is hindering both the development and growth of the sector. One obvious factor is the COVID-19 pandemic. It has been identified that globally, the sector supply chain was disrupted by impediments by the pandemic. In particular, the International Publishers Association highlighted the following issues. The establishment experienced financial losses due to canceled events, canceled orders, and increased costs from currency devaluation. There have also been delayed payments were also experienced from the supply chain. Global and printing uh, paper vendors experienced steep cost increase due to currency uh, valuation. Uh, our distributors, wholesalers and retailers have been temporarily closed or have limited operations. And our export dependent establishment were not able to cater uh, orders internationally due to the disruptions in the global freight system. Next slide. Locally, the book industry lost a total of 3.6 billion uh, in 2020, while sales in the printing uh, in the printing industry dropped by 53%. Revenue losses are mainly attributed, as mentioned earlier, to the supply chain disruptions. Issues on copyright infringement is one of the growing challenges reported in the sector. Uh, this has been exacerbated with schools transitioning to online platforms, wherein the rate of illegal downloading of books has been increasing. The digital shift has also caused the print advertising revenues to dwindle and decrease. Lastly, the growth of community newspapers has been disrupted. Losses in revenues were noted to the lack of advertisements and readership, forcing the decrease in the number of pages printed. Next slide. However, there are problems and pre-existing uh, constraints uh, in the industry even prior to the pandemic. According to the Media Ownership Monitor, newspapers has been losing relevance in terms of being a new source. 
with the rise of digitalization, it was reported that only 22% of Filipinos read from the newspapers, that these people are actually more uh, uh, accessing news through alternative channels and media, yeah, such as TV, radio, and the internet. In terms of non-schools books, IPO, IPO Philippines reported an 80% stagnant leadership rate among adult Filipinos. Because of better opportunities abroad, we have been uh, stuck with the problem of lack of technical personnel in the industry. This includes the lack of machine operators, press mechanics, among others. Similarly, as mentioned by uh, Congressman De Venecia earlier in, in his opening speech, there's a huge gap between the country's imports and exports of print materials, leaving local players at a disadvantage in terms of competitiveness. In relation to our local printers, they depend on imported paper as local manufacturers cannot compete in terms of price and also of quality due to high input costs and also high labor costs. Next slide. Given this context, the department sees that there are opportunities that await with, with our stakeholders in the PPM sector, among which includes the new forms of publishing products, such as audiobooks, podcasts, which has seen as an avenue for growth in the industry. With the increasing demand for content and access in the digital platforms, digital publishing is a clear road for expansion to the sector. With uh, social media engagement, both publishers and authors receive an increasing volume of consumer data, which can now tell us the general preference for this content. This can provide authors a more uh, uh, personalized content in terms of the genre that will be uh, given to the market. Next slide. As you can see in this particular section, we are still reviewing in terms of the R trade statistics. As reported, we have a total trade of 55 million in 2020, wherein 51 million of which is attributed to imports. Highlighting our point earlier that the country is still a net importer for this particular segment, wherein 57% of these goods are attributed to printed books, brochures, and other similar printed matters. The rankings of the top three imported goods are consistent in the five-year data range from 2015 to 2020. Relative to our exports, Germany is still the biggest market, nearing three times large to its near competitor, which is Vietnam, which accounts for at least a 1 million USD difference. Next slide. Going now to the demand for print advertisement, this is being hindered by the increasing access to digital platforms and the internet with the introduction of digital advertisement. It has been recognized that digital ads are relatively cheaper. Expenditure on print advertisement has seen a global downward trend. The global printing advertising industry is expected to decline. The market is expected to reach 64.96 billion in 2023 from 70.47 billion last year. Next slide. Seeking to obtain these opportunities, we see the need for the industry to adapt to the changing landscape of the pandemic, of the digital revolution, and also to the changing consumer patterns. The global digital publishing market is expected to grow by 64 billion USD from 2020 to 2024, wherein 41% will be attributed to the growth coming from the Asia Pacific region. With this growth in mind, with uh, promoting innovation in the Philippines publishing industry is necessary to capture uh, a portion of this growth. The enormous growth for podcast listening in the Philippines is an opportunity uh, related for expansion. Some other opportunities that the department has identified includes the, the gamification of games and other literature and the use of multimedia content in literature, both of which will make reading more engaging. Next slide. The immense rise and utilization of e-commerce by businesses and consumers are still attributed to the pandemic. However, the department sees the increasing potential for books as consumers purchase online 
and retailers shift to online book sales through the utilization of various e-commerce sites. Some key points that we wanted to highlight in the contribution of e-commerce to the sector would include online events, the, the top uh, products of books and magazines, and also the, the frequency of Filipinos that buy books. Next slide. Depending on the publishing platform, different marketing opportunities are actually possible. An author can either partner with a global book publisher, such as Amazon, Kindle, Lulu, and Kobo, which allows greater reach in the international scene. Or they can choose local publishers to specifically cater to the Filipino market, which includes our partners eBook Hub, Rex Bookstore, Adarna House. Also, uh, with the rise of digitalization, another option is to be an e-commerce platform permitting to sell content directly. Self-publishing creates more personal content for the author and allows revenue streams or a majority of the profits go back to the, to the author. An author can also build affiliate marketing programs, which are agreements where authors can commission another entity, usually influencers, to send traffic and or sales their way. Next slide. Book fairs and trade shows are some of the opportunities for authors and publishers to promote the increasing exposure of their products and engage with their readers and consumers. Among their most recognized activities include the Manila International Book Fair, the Philippine International Comics Festival, and what uh, our other resource persons have already mentioned, the Franco Book Fair. The department would like to reiterate and support these events and initiatives as this not only promote literature and authors, but also give them the opportunity to turn their ideas into reality. Next. Relative to the DPI, we have been institutionalizing same support measures to ensure the development of the sector. Among the initiatives to, uh, undertaken by the Board of Investment includes focusing on capacity building, which includes the seminar workshop for printers, and also the printing of industry curriculum and establishment of the learning centers. Aside from this, we're also focusing on knowledge exchange through the ASEAN Industry Printing Forum. Next slide. Relative to investment promotion, we're also registering those under RA8047 under the Transitional Investment Priorities Plan. To be able to avail this, the following must be noted. For books, we have new titles and first format by which the new book title will be produced or published. For publishing, a minimum of three titles with 500 copies, a minimum of three titles with 1,000 copies before either the first run uh, of trade books and textbooks. And lastly, uh, a minimum of three titles alone for ebooks. Some of the documentary requirements and regulations under the transitional SIPP that we must actually note here includes that reprints, revision, and succeeding editions of existing title would not qualify for the incentives. And aside from this, uh, the application must be accompanied by an endorsement from the NDDD. Next slide. While the implementation of the CREATE law and the promulgation of the SIPP, we expect that this will be further make our country an investment destination for the various sector, including the creative industries, which includes the PPM sector, as we provide a more comprehensive incentive package to our eligible businesses and enterprise. I won't go into detail in terms of the menu of incentives and enhanced adoption, since this is already listed in the slide. Uh, next slide. So the publishing and printed media sector in the Philippines has greatly shifted due to the effect of the pandemic. Presented here are broad strategies on how to expand the sector, some of which includes the promotion of the work of Filipino authors, adapt to trends in, uh, in consumer preferences, technical skills training for industry players, invest in R&D, assist our publishers and authors to shift into digital, and lastly, synergize the initiatives of both the private and public sector. With that, uh, with the DTI, that's for that's our particular information that we would like to share to the body. Excellent presentation. Thank you so much, Ivan. All right, so now we'll move on to the DICT. 
Good afternoon, Chair De Venecia, Vice Chair uh, Benitez, Honorable Hi, Representatives. Good afternoon, po, uh, fellow public servants and people in the private sector and fellow resource persons. Uh, Mr. Chair, we only this is our first time attending these hearings and we only received the uh, invitation a few days ago. However, uh, we, if you will allow us, uh, wish to share uh, some of the slides we used in our budget presentation, if that's okay. Uh, the, the DICT does not have any, uh, well, the, the thrust of the DICT, unlike uh, DTI and DFA, insofar as the public teaching is industry is indirect. So our, our main focus really is in the development of infrastructure for the Philippines. And uh, we believe that you cannot have a digital society, you cannot even speak of going towards a digital society if your foundation, which is connectivity, is not present. And we've seen that uh, very starkly in this uh, pandemic. So if I can share my screen. Nakikita na po ba? Yep. Okay, thank you. So we have three major thrusts. Uh, the first one is our national broadband program. We've completed the two international cable landing stations uh, in Valer Aurora and in San Fernando La Union, and there's a 250-kilometer fiber conduit running through that. Uh, we're building out our fiber backbone phase one, which will connect that to parts of northern Luzon, central Luzon, and uh, that will lead to the DICD being capable of providing internet at a cheaper uh, cost po, no? And we have our, connected to this, we have our government uh, network or GovNet project. We are already currently providing internet connectivity to 892 agencies' offices through the GovNet. So we entered into the MOA with DICT and, uh, DICT and BCDA have entered into uh, MOA. The implementation of the fiber backbone phase one is ongoing. Ayan po, magkakaroon ng backbone sa Benguet, Ilocos Sur, Nebesia, Bataan, Nambales, Aurora, La Union, Pangasinan, Tarlac, Pampanga, Bulacan, Metro Manila. Uh, this will allow us to greatly, uh, this will greatly increase our capability of providing one, uh, internet connectivity to government agencies. And ay, ang next po niya, no, uh, will allow us to provide or connectivity for our free Wi-Fi for all program. So under the free Wi-Fi for all program, what we do is we procure managed internet services. Basically, uh, we pay ISPs and telcos to set up free Wi-Fi sites. You know, procure puyan, and then we have to renew and pay them every year. Um, with the national broadband program, that will allow us to put up more free Wi-Fi sites and the cost of the bandwidth will severely drop because it will be now the ICT that's providing the bandwidth. Right now, we've established uh, ang last count po na nakita ko is around 11,000 free Wi-Fi sites around the Philippines. Because uh, this is as of August pa, no? 11,000 na po, 9,000 in public places, 1,800 in state universities and colleges and PESDA schools, and 2,927 uh, sites in government hospitals, rural health centers, Puna centers, and quarantine facilities. Uh, we're also developing the National Government Data Center, wherein government agencies uh, are able to co-locate their servers in our data centers. This leads to uh, economies of scale, because if you have a, a data center, a server room in your government agency for only five or ten servers, the manpower component is the same as if I had a data center with 100 servers or 100 racks. So we're, we're putting up these data centers now uh, and government agencies already are co-locating. There are 93 agencies already hosted in our GovCloud and 25 in our data center facilities. And then we have uh, ICT education uh, efforts. So when coming ICT Academy, essentially these are uh, ICT related trainings that we're offering. We have a digital workforce through the ICT Academy uh, where we have uh, open online courses. And then, ito po, actually this is in response to suggestions of uh, Vice Chairman Benitez uh, dun sa, kan sa isa niyang discussions, sa isa niyang bill. Uh, we, we have 4,745 Tech for Ed centers 
and we are upgrading some of them to digital transformation centers. And I would like to uh, shift a little bit and talk a little more about the digital transformation centers in tech for ed Essentially, these are, uh, we have agreements with local government units. They provide the space. And then we give them equipment and typically we'll also provide them with the internet connectivity. And we've had, sila po magmamanage, no? Sila magmanage, amin yung equipment. And then we tie up with a uh, cluster, a DICT cluster office. Uh, and then, Yung mga trainings namin sa ICT Academy uh, at sa ICT Competency and uh, Learning uh, Development Bureau, yung mga trainings na binibigay namin, pwedeng yung mga tao na walang connectivity, walang equipment, pwedeng dun sila natututo sa Tech for Ed Centers. And we are looking at expanding to more of Tech for Ed Centers and uh, upgrading some of them to digital transformation centers. We've actually had a few success stories. Actually, hindi lang a few, no? many success stories, but uh, there have been people na entrepreneurs, they've had uh, trainings in the Tech for Ed centers through the ICT's uh, programs. And then, meron na pong mga success stories that jobs were developed. Uh, yung iba nagiging online personal assistant, yung iba nagiging online tutors, and the like. And then we've also launched this, the 25 Digital Cities and Provinces Program. Essentially, we are trying to help the BPO industry uh, identify areas, uh, cities and provinces, where uh, they, they can actually look to the future to locating some of their offices in those digital cities and provinces. We have a checklist of standards, and we try to help the LGUs comply with these standards. Essentially, uh, ease of access, connectivity, uh, reliability of networks, etc. And then we have our digital jobs uh, training, uh, which we've already conducted uh, 297 training since 2017. We've trained 7,000 individuals, and of those, we're happy to say 1,553 were able to acquire online jobs. And we also have the digital startup program with DTI, DOST, and DICT. This is under the uh, Innovative Startup uh, Act. So uh, we're, finalizing, nice, uh, we're finalizing the guidelines. There's going to be a startup grant fund, and there's going to be a call for proposals and a board which will determine uh, who gets uh, funding for. Uh, we've done other things, but I have. Uh, I do not think this may be really relevant to the promotion of the ICT, uh, the publishing industry. Mr. Chair, essentially, uh, to recap, our focus is uh, improving internet access in the Philippines because we believe once there's connectivity, uh, then the opportunities for digital jobs and uh, shift to digital society becomes a reality. Thank you for allowing us, Mr. Chair, to present and for giving us the opportunity to attend this hearing. Thank you, Pat. Omar, at a short notice, that was still an excellent presentation. So thank you so thank much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Uh, now we'll move on to the last presenter in this topic before we open forum, which will be NBDB. The Chair, may I be recognized? And yes, go ahead. Do you Chair, thank you. Share my screen. Um, before you start, Chair Clink, I just want to acknowledge the presence of Congressman Apid De Los Santos, as well as Congresswoman Joy Tambunting. Thank you for joining us. Um, you have the floor, Chair Clink. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, honorable members of the committee. So uh, I am Dante Ang, the chairman of the National Book Development Board. Um, for those who may not be familiar with our small agency, we're basically the lead agency in the research and development um, of the publishing value chain, or basically the development of books. So this uh, slide shows you a summary of the services that we provide. Basically, uh, I know there's a lot to look at here, but I think you can boil it down to the fact that our mission is to help develop the publishing industry in the Philippines. So when you could say publishing industry, of course, there are there are um, broad categories of books that, that, that we try to promote, including trade books and, and textbooks. And as uh, was presented during the previous meeting, our secretariat has been um, doing a lot of work 
to uh, map out the entire value chain of the publishing industry. So this is our vision as um, uh, stated in Re Republic Act 8047. Uh, I'm going through most of these slides because I want to go through the more important ones. Um, this was alluded to earlier by um, the chairman and of course the presentation by the representative from the Department of Trade. And this basically shows you the disparity between the imports and exports of books as a product. So the 24 uh, figure refers to the number of books that, that we import. And for every 24 books that we import, we only export one book. So um, this would also suggest that there is a um, potential market in the Philippines for printed books, given the fact that even the domestic supply is not able to meet the domestic demand. Um, and of course, uh, a changing view that we are trying to promote at the NVDB is to uh, somehow influence the, the policy crafting to perhaps look at uh, at least some categories of books as potential export products. Again, I apologize for the number of items on this slide, but basically this tells you, if I may summarize it, that the publishing industry is under a lot of distress as is um, most of the economy. Um, but that begs the question of why pay attention to this particular uh, industry? And, you know, uh, Chairman mentioned earlier that the industry accounts for 500 something, so 570,000 uh, jobs. And of course, uh, he mentioned also the value added contribution to the total economy. And so I suppose one, one way to look at it would be, you know, helping. Uh, promote or uh, the, the helping uh, uplift the, the, the book publishing industry will not only translate to even more jobs, but also to uh, higher contributions to the economy. There's one particular bubble here that refers to debt ed, which I will talk to later. Um, the present board and the present secretary have been doing a lot of work um, trying to um, promote discussion between the private publisher stakeholders and the Department of Education because the DepEd is a um, major buyer of books. If you look at, for example, all the primary schools in the Philippines, more than 90% are in the public sector. So in a sense, in that particular category, it is a monopsony, of, um, uh, monopsony, monopsony market. If you look at the secondary level, I think more about 80% of the schools are, are belonging to uh, the public sector as well. And, and so uh, that, that, that justifies, I believe, or helps explain why this particular board and the secretariat team are working uh, to promote uh, the um, uh, products of our pr uh, private stakeholders. Um, so these next few slides basically spell out some of the uh, projects and programs that the National Book Development Board has been engaging. Uh, this is basically uh, divided into, of course, as I said, trade books and textbooks. Um, this shows you that our, our activities, despite the substantial cuts in our 2020 budget, which unfortunately we are, you know, seem to be facing with the 2021 NEP, um, we have been doing quite a lot on promoting books on the retail, on online platforms, on the retail side, and. Um, you know, these, these things could actually um, be enhanced. So we could probably do more. Of course, the, 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 um, the key thing here is, of course, uh, more budget support from, from Congress. Um, if I may, um, you know, I know there's a number of things here, but, you know, one of the important things that I'd like to, um, you know, call your attention to is the, the project of the NVDB to create a, um, a, a national database for, for books that will not only consolidate the bibliographic data, but also the, the, the market data. So what that basically means is that, you know, it will create a one-stop shop for buyers of books. And this is uh, something that we would like to have, you know, present to DepEd because, as I said, they are a key mar uh, market consumer in, in the industry. And uh, this will basically help the procurement process to identify what books are available and supply, you know, beyond the bibliographic information or where these books are available and more importantly, the pricing of these books. So uh, that of course will extend also to uh, uh, textbooks. As I said, you know, I, I don't want to take up your time. We have submitted this 
uh, presentation to uh, the secretary, the committee secretariat, um, and I'd be glad to answer questions later on. But let me focus on some other exciting things that we are doing. As I said, we're trying to change the mindset that books can be an export product. And so uh, it's not new that the National Book Development Board has been participating in international trade fair. But I think what, uh, is, what has changed is the directive uh, in the agency to go beyond merely showcasing what is available from the Philippines, but to uh, aggressively sell uh, rights. Um, right now, uh, as the chairman said, the, uh, the National Book Development Board has people at the Frankfurt Book Fair. Um, and again, you know, the directive for our team in Frankfurt is to focus on, on selling rights. Now, there are a number of international book fairs that the National Book Development Board participates in, but perhaps none is more important than Frankfurt because it is the biggest market for um, selling rights. Uh, although uh, we have been, of course, trying to participate in the others given the restrictions in travel through um, uh, digital and online uh, platforms. Then again, um, uh, you know, we, we were able to do many of our capacity building measures by diverting some of the um, uh, resources allocated for some of those trade fairs into capacity building projects such as the book nook. But as I said, you know, more, more, can, be, more can be done uh, with more uh, budget support. Um, again, you know, uh, the, the National Book uh, Database is an important thing. Uh, I am uh, received reports from our executive director that that project has been turned down somehow or is not getting support. So, uh, you know, I'd like to take this opportunity to appeal to the committee uh, to, to um, perhaps um, see the merit of, of, of that project. Now, this is where I wanted to spend a little bit more time on, and this is uh, I believe a framework that the committee could look at in trying to focus the kind of uh, uh, support through legislation that uh, that they uh, that they want to create. So th this is the uh, um, the ANSOF matrix, which is basically used for 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 marketing strategies. But it shows you the relationship between um, markets and products, and every segment, of course, is as you see here. Um, divided into existing and new. So existing markets and new markets, existing products and new products. So many of the uh, work that NBDB has been doing, I'd say mo uh, nearly all of it, um, has been in the lower left quadrant of that, of that matrix, which is um, uh, promoting uh, existing products in existing markets. And the appropriate strategy according to this matrix for, for that quadrant is market penetration. And here, as I said, there is still a lot of work to, to, to be done. Um, I mentioned earlier uh, in the previous slide that uh, this industry is um, in distress. And, and so um, there, you know, that, that might be something that uh, the committee would, would look at to, to help support um, uh, the industry. I mentioned in the previous hearing, if I may just summarize some of the things that may also address the penetration um, strategies appropriate for this quadrant, uh, the high cost of raw materials, particularly newsprint and uh, book paper, the, the high barrier to entry in, in, um, in uh, entering this, this field, the, the capital investments required are quite substantial. And of course, perhaps maybe um, uh, a revisiting of the Foreign Investment Act and possibly the exclusion of book publishing in the negative list of the Foreign Investment Act. So as you know, there's a constitutional prohibition on foreign equity in, in media. And um, I think there is valid argument to be made that you know, the book publishing can, can be exempted, for, exempted from that so that it may source uh, capital um, out, you know, from, from beyond uh, sources in the Philippines. The upper left quadrant, of course, um, is being addressed by the NBDB's participation in international events. And I, I'm glad to say that, uh, or confirm that the DTI and the others are, are other agencies of government and even this committee uh, have been very supportive in, um, in, in helping us do that. Um, uh, it was mentioned earlier that uh, the, the, the National Book Development Board is, is hoping to, to bid for guest of honor hosting at the Frankfurt Book Fair in 2025. 
uh, we have you know uh, submitted a, a big book uh, in that regard but uh, I think uh, um, you know additional support would would be would be helpful um, as it is our initial feedback is that you know we may have to present um, some something more robust in, in terms of financial terms to uh, the organizers of the Frankfurt Book Fair. Um, so far, only one Southeast Asian country has hosted it, and that was Indonesia. And I think we're seeing that um, Indonesia is reaping the rewards of that investment. Um, uh, this year, uh, Spain, I believe, is the one hosting uh, hosting uh, the, the Frankfurt Book Fair's guest of honor, and they are making an aggressive play in promoting, of course, the books published in, in that country. Now, with regard to uh, diversification and product development, um, I think the, 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 the key policy issue here is intellectual property or uh, um, the protection of, of property rights. I, I believe that this will be you know, the subject of the presentation later on by some of our stakeholders, particularly Phil Coles, but um, there is a concern among the, the private stakeholders uh, for the protection of, the, of their intellectual property. And um, with that, I just want to say that you know there there you know uh, should be a healthy balance with what DepEd is trying to achieve, which is of course fair use. But you know um, if we just completely disregard you know the intellectual property of our stakeholders, um, you know the DepEd and, uh, and and others may may not have anything to to copy in the future if we uh, allow uh, the book publishing industry to deteriorate further. She mentioned that there, you know the industry is facing a trifecta of challenges. There's of course the disruption that was already present before the pandemic. There's of course the pandemic and of course there are these other challenges uh, um, brought about by the developments uh, in, within the industry. So um, I, I want to uh, stress that because you know, elsewhere in the world, there, there seems to be a shift you know, from the traditional learn materials such as textbooks to software. And uh, I believe that if we are unable to address the intellectual property questions and, and provide adequate adequate protection for for the for the publishers, then you know the, this may be a, a a problem that may be exacerbated when the world, even including the Philippines, makes that pivot to um, uh, that that favors more uh, software um, in the uh, uh, for use in the educational uh, uh, sector. So, Mr. Chair, uh, we'll send you uh, the updated copy of our presentation, but I believe a preliminary report was uh, submitted to your office earlier, and uh, I think we will just end it at that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair Link. Uh, that was another comprehensive presentation. Thank you, sir. Um, all right. So now we open the floor for questions from the members. So if anybody wishes to ask, Anything from our four presenters, please go ahead. Comsec, may nagpalista ba? Kong Apid, Kong Joy, Kong Coco. There are none. Okay, so I'm going to get into my um, series of questions. I'll start with DFA, uh, ASIC Ed. Um, it was nice to see that uh, the DFA is assisting a lot of um, titles in uh, the promotion of their output to international communities. Uh, so how do we go about identifying which titles or publishers or authors to assist? Is it on a, on a request basis or is there some kind of criteria for evaluation? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, as I mentioned, uh, much of the assistance that uh, our foreign service posts extend are uh, individual efforts. Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, authors uh, or organizations will approach a particular foreign service post because they feel that they want to target the market or Alternatively, they are from that market. Uh, I mentioned some mixed uh, dual citizen authors who sought the assistance of the Foreign Service Post uh, in their area. So 
um, there is no uh, guidance from Manila except for the assistance that we gave for uh, in coordination with the National Book Development Board for participation in uh, the Frankfurt Book Fair uh, because that was a uh, joint venture, you, you could say that, between NBDB, uh, the DFA, and funding from, I believe, is still uh, Speaker Lagarda and, and perhaps some other uh, legislators. Um, but uh, for the most part, it really is uh, individual efforts by both the authors or publishers approaching our foreign service posts or our embassies who know these authors uh, and uh, asking them to uh, allow their works to be translated or um, distributed uh, in that particular market, uh, usually in celebration of some bilateral uh, anniversary. But, but uh, uh, we did invite uh, stakeholders from the publishing sector uh, when we had a stakeholder conference in 2019 and 20, early 2020. And indeed, uh, one of the outcomes of that stakeholder uh, uh, consultation was to explore further uh, cooperation and collaboration insofar as uh, the publishing industry is concerned. So the publishing sector has a direct line at the moment to DFA through you? Uh, I know that we've met with the National Book Development Board uh, a number of times, in particular with respect to uh, the book fair. But, you know, in the process, of course, the, all the other issues of possible uh, collaboration in other uh, uh, trade fairs uh, have also come up. But uh, I believe that uh, once we have uh, the creative industries uh, bill passed into law, then a more coordinated effort can be taken across all sectors. All right, thank you. Uh, and when you say that the DFA uh, helps promote uh, certain authors, organizations, or titles, or whatever, uh, that comes in the form of uh, offering your uh, venues as a possible site for a book launch? Uh, in most cases, that would be come. The, the most visible <laughs> type of support because uh, um, unless the, the Foreign Service Post programs the activity uh, in their budget in terms of maybe you know, helping the author bring certain number of books uh, to the post, um, then the easiest way that we can help is really is to just to offer the venue. Um, however, one of the examples I, I did uh, cite was we did try to source or work with uh, a publishing house in the US for them to uh, uh, actually come out with a, uh, uh, a printing of uh, Nick Joaquin's, uh, oh, I believe it was Nick Joaquin's uh, Centennial. Uh, so support comes in the form of, uh, you know, lending your venues, um, also helping out with logistics, as with the case of importing books, or sometimes you reach out to um, stakeholders from the publishing industry abroad, perchance that maybe they can do a limited print run of a book to be able yes. to. Ah, okay. So, yes. Although, okay. if I may add, um, you know, uh, looking forward, uh, there is always the possibility of entering into a bilateral agreement on this particular issue. Um, offhand, I'm not aware of a specific uh, agreement that would look to uh, collaborate bilaterally on uh, either, you know, uh, exchange of uh, literary 
uh, materials uh, between two countries. Uh, but I, I can imagine that such a provision could be included in a bilateral cultural agreement. There are none that are existing for the publishing sector as of the moment. Uh, none that comes to mind. Uh, I can, I can of course, double check. Uh, but yes, uh, no, nothing that I can think of at the moment. Chair Kling is raising his hand. Chair Kling. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, you know, I'd, I'd like to point out that the Department of Foreign Affairs have been, has, been, has been very helpful to the National Book Development Board and um, uh, in our project in Frankfurt, uh, particularly last year when uh, travel was impossible. Um, the Frankfurt Book Fair had a hybrid event and uh, personnel at the Consulate General in Frankfurt were the ones who were there physically present representing not only NBDB, but of course, of course the Philippines. And now, uh, um, and that, that support has existed even, even before my, my, my time as chairman of NBDB. And uh, because of the previous support, we are now also in touch, thanks to the previous board, with um, some of the personnel who were at the Frankfurt Consul Gen uh, Consulate General. Uh, so we, the other day we were meeting with uh, uh, some people from the Philippine Embassy in Spain who would also like to, to, to support um, not only Frankfurt, but of course promoting books in, in Europe. Um, with regard to the treaties, we are working on one in particular with the uh, Asian Classics Translation Program. Um, so this, the particular uh, uh, MOU has been going back and forth regrettably between, well, um, NBDB, the uh, DFA, and, and then the DepEd, uh, our mother agency. But hopefully we are close to, to signing that. That initiative will basically entail um, a bilateral agreement between the Philippines and China, where we, where we would mutually translate uh, books. So uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, about 100 books, uh, Philippine books translated into Chinese, mm -hmm. and then on their part, uh, 100 Chinese titles translated into English for, for our market. Um, the Check translation. I'm sorry? Who initiated that? The, uh, the Chinese government initiated that, and it's part of the effort in reaching out to different ASEAN countries. Uh, we've actually fallen behind Malaysia, which has already signed uh, a similar uh, bilateral agreement with, with China. The Chinese government wanted us to, to sign it last year, but, you know, um, of course, the Philippines had to do its due diligence in reviewing the uh, agreement. Uh, I, I'm also you know, uh, reminded that Singapore has also signed a similar agreement. So if ever the Philippines would be the third ASEAN country to, to participate in that. And of course, we're eager to do that because you can imagine a billion Chinese reading No Limitang and, and other Filipino classics would be, I think, uh, uh, tremendously helpful for us, not to mention maybe if we can include some of the newer titles in that translations program. Yeah. No, I mean, China certainly is a huge market, but are there any efforts for any such bilateral agreements to be forged uh, with the top three countries that the DTI cited as uh, markets for our uh, Filipino books? I think the first is Germany, but I think maybe that's due in large part to the Frankfurt Book Fair. But then the, the second one was, was it Vietnam? And then the third was Saudi Arabia. So are there efforts to penetrate those markets as well, since there's already an organic market forming? Well, uh, no bilateral agreements that I'm aware of, but the NBDB has, um, has had a translation program that's um, that, that dates many years now. So I, I believe in the past, there have been you know, uh, some initiatives to, to translate some books into Spanish, into Arabic, uh, but I, I, not, in, not in a systematic um, way or, or program that I am aware of. I believe that some of those initiatives were um, the result of specific um, publishers, foreign publishers requests of what I believe may be marketable in, in their market. But uh, it, it's something that um, you know, we, we would welcome. Um, Asek Menes uh, mentioned that you know, the books is part of their cultural diplomacy. 
maybe be, since he is here, maybe the NBD would, would like to bat for including books in the economic diplomacy program of the DFA. Um, I, so I, I, I believe that you know our, our books would more than more than qualify for that because you know I mean who who else uh, can tell our stories better than Filipinos themselves, right? So uh, why rely on foreign writers and researchers to tell our stories? So I think we have sufficient talent to to do that, and the NBDB would like to do more of that uh, if perhaps we can, you know, have the opportunity to offer more grants. Um, uh, to do the research, to to, to write manuscripts, so, um, so um, maybe you know more support. I think is the bottom line that we need. You like to uh, respond to that, Asik? Um, certainly. Uh, any initiative that would help, uh, we are always ready to to discuss. Uh, and uh, as, as mentioned by both uh, NBDB and, and the DFA, uh, as long as there, is, uh, there are resources to support uh, these types of initiatives, uh, then we, we can certainly uh, work together. Right. You have a budget for the economic diplomacy program that Chair Link mentioned? Uh, the uh, economic diplomacy is, is uh, under a, a different office, uh, the Office of International Economic uh, Relations mm -hmm. uh, under USEC Ipagire. And uh, uh, I would need to check if they have, I mean, how their money is allocated. And if any, uh, I would imagine could could uh, go towards promoting the Philippine uh, 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 book industry and publishing uh, industry. Great. Yeah, if you could um, give us a report on this at the soonest. Um, and uh, perhaps historical, even just the last two years or three years. Um, and then also for the 2022 budget, since we weren't really able to scan through that uh, particular program. Um, but the idea from Link is certainly a good one. Um, if it includes some kind of uh, programmatic support uh, for the publishing industry as to its inclusion in the economic diplomacy program. So yeah, just let us know baka sakaling mahabol pa natin, right? Uh, in the BICA. Um Okay. Uh, you also mentioned ASIC Ed about translations uh, into the foreign tongue, or well, you said local language, which is really uh, to be understood as the, the language uh, where, the, where such uh, book is being sold abroad. Um, so it's nice to know that you know, there are efforts to try to uh, penetrate the Chinese market through some kind of bilateral agreement, but uh, based on your uh, studies and your feedback so far, I mean, where, where are these opportunities um, existent to be able to translate into the local language um, and that there is a possible market waiting and all, all it needs is just some kind of support or for it to be jump-started? Maybe top three, top three to top five countries. Um, again, uh, the reasons for translation uh, could be twofold. Uh, from the cultural diplomacy perspective, it would be the driving uh, uh, factor there would be the desire to spread understanding about Philippine culture in which case the market size would not be uh, you know, the main consideration, uh, in which case the example of you know, translating into Bengali in Bangladesh uh, uh, was cited. But if the, the, the second uh, reason for translation being uh, penetrating the, the large market uh, in another country, then, as you mentioned, 
uh, those countries with a large readership, uh, such as Germany, uh, I mean, in, in terms of population, uh, Germany in Europe, uh, of course, China in Asia, Japan, uh, South Korea, uh, you know, uh, countries with a very well established uh, culture of reading uh, and a, an interest in, in uh, uh, well, reading about foreign countries. Uh, so yes, Germany, some of the Northeast Asian countries <coughs> uh, in the Middle East. Um, I know Iran having you know, been assigned there uh, is also a very uh, literary country and their own publishing uh, um, industry is, is uh, very well advanced just due to the domestic market. So yeah, that's also a, a country of 80 million people. Uh, in the Middle East, uh, Saudi is the other comparable size country. Turkey is also another very literary uh, country. So off, offhand, it would be a combination of uh, population size and the culture of reading uh, within that particular country. All right. Noted. Thank you. Uh, Paolo, you're raising your hand. Paolo Sibal. Uh, yes, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Toff, for, for this and inviting everyone. It's just a follow-up question with the DFA, and it's connected with... I'm Paolo Sibal, by the way, from the Philippine Educational Publishers Association. And, you know, uh, it's a follow-up question on Chairman Klink's... Uh, very incise comments on this. Uh, we often talk about uh, uh, the, the different book fairs in our monthly board meeting, uh, and we we know we know all the different book fairs as a, around the ASEAN and also in Europe and in 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 the Middle East. And actually, the big help here. And this is connected with translation. Is the big help here with uh, getting books translated is for the foreign markets to know that the books, what the books are available in the Philippines. And one of the best ways for them to know is through the different, uh, through the different, uh, sorry, book fairs that are happening, not not only in Frankfurt but. There, there's a big one in Malaysia. There's a big one. There's one in Vietnam. They have one in the Middle East. Of course, there's London and Chicago, naturally. And of, when when the pandemic is out, meaning to say we're we're finished with, with the pandemic, obviously uh, the big aspect here, the big help that we can get from DFA is to get some marketing support during these book fairs so that the, uh, the the other countries will know the quality of the titles that we are producing. And if they do know the quality of the titles we're producing, then translation demand can increase and then we can even have more translation. Uh, every every board meeting we have, we, we talk about the different uh, book fairs in the different countries. And, you know, we have the Hong Kong Book Fair, of course, the Beijing Book Fair, there's, there's the Tokyo Book Fair. And all of these book fairs uh, bring in a lot of interest of, of the local market. And this is really uh, key if we can uh, link up with the DFA and the NBDB, with the different uh, book fairs that are going on. Uh, I think what the chairman Top was trying to allude earlier, and please correct me if I'm wrong, was he was trying to find out if there was a holistic, uh, holistic uh, development program to to promote not only books but also the Philippine, the different Philippine cultures uh, by the DFAO. And when if we'll be specific with books, that's the easiest way that the DFA can. Uh, you know, uh, laser point their resources 
is the different major book fairs. It's already, uh, how do you say this? Maybe the NBDB, they're quite aware of the major important book fairs where the regions of the world congregate. If not, uh, the PEPA is certainly willing to give that information. Uh, anyway, that's that's just my follow-up comment on that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Paolo. Um, so actually, I am going to be pushing for uh, a more active participation in book fairs in Malaysia. I'm sorry, in Vietnam and Saudi Arabia, which you said, Paolo, there's an active book fair in the Middle East because they're the second and third biggest markets for our exports according to the DTI. So it's good that we are, you know, maintaining our presence uh, in the Frankfurt Book Fair and we're even going to make a play to be guest of honor by 2025. But we also have to look into those um, secondary and tertiary markets and also emerging markets. So I think it's aligned naman with a strategy that was outlined by Chair Klink uh, in his presentation. No? There's like uh, market penetration for existing and then also new markets that we should develop so i mean offhand i know that you have all of this information with your organization sir paolo but uh offhand what are those give me name three to five other markets wherein uh there is a proclivity or a thirst for filipino uh, publishing content okay uh, uh thank you uh care talk uh First of all, I'm gonna touch on Saudi Arabia. There might be a there might be a misconception. I know that as educational publishers, we export a lot of books to Saudi Arabia, and the demand is very strong for educational books in Saudi Arabia, basically because we have a very large OFW population, mm. and there's uh, there's uh, more than ten schools that are. Filipino schools in not only in Saudi Arabia but in uh, in in the Middle East that demand Philippine books. So there's a strong demand for uh, Filipino books in Saudi Arabia that, that are not translated, but are and these are DEC, uh, DEP ed registered Filipino overseas schools. Aside from aside from that, uh, of course, there's a big demand Germany. For example, we keep talking about Germany. And the reason why we talk about Germany is because uh, it seems to be the book capital of Europe. And a lot of the translations uh, done in Germany go into the different languages. It doesn't mean that it's done in Germany, it's translated into German. It could be in Czechoslovakia and it could be in uh, French or something. It just goes through Germany. So that's one example now of where, of course, the the demand would be. And then, of course, in the U.S., that's uh, New York and Chicago. Chicago being the the main book fair. Uh, there's also a, there's also a demand there that uh, cannot be ignored. the the Malaysian The Malaysian book fair I mentioned for South. For, for Southeast Asia, and then uh, the the Hong Kong and the and the Beijing Book Fair for the Chinese market. Uh, I don't know if that's already five. Uh, definitely, there's there's the Japanese one, but for for North America, it's really Chicago. Okay, and in New York. Um, thank you, Paolo. Uh Somebody from NBDB is raising her hand. Ma'am Ange, sorry, the name is not complete. Hi, hi. Um, thank you, Chair Doc. I'm Andrea Pashwana Flores. Hi, uh, Andrea. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Go ahead, ma'am. <laughs> I'm uh, uh, I just like to have a to make a comment on the Arabic uh, market. Um, perhaps you might want to consider the, the UAE, uh, which has the Abu Dhabi Book Fair. The Abu Dhabi Book Fair is one of the longest and uh, largest uh, book fairs in the Arab world. Uh, it also includes the Sharjah Book Fair, which is um, primarily for children. But also the, UA, uh, the Abu Dhabi Book Fair has uh, 
uh, the government, the UAE government gives a translation grant uh, for all those um, local publishers that um, sell uh, or buy trans, uh, buy foreign rights during the fair. Uh, so um, as an agent before, I had sold a couple of um, titles in that particular book fair. And what's interesting also during the Abu Dhabi book fair, um, they give all school children um, a voucher. The government gives um, school children vouchers to purchase books at the book fair. And since they're like uh, the world's publishers are also there, um, these children are also able to buy books from around the world. Wow. The, the voucher is sponsored by the government? Yes. Yes. Yes, Chair. Yeah, I should look into that. Um, <laughs> that's a really good idea. Uh, okay. Um, all right. I'll move on to my questions with, sorry, Ryan, are you raising your hand? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Chair. Yeah, go ahead, Ryan. I'd like to share our program, our translation subsidy program at the National Book Development Board, where in uh, in support to this, uh, I mean, in preparation for these international book fairs, we have identified six major languages or priority languages to uh, for translation in order to level the playing field in the international market. So we've identified the German, Spanish, French, Arabic. Japanese and Chinese languages, Mr. Chair. Okay. And, and uh, of course, uh, in uh, preparation for the uh, guest of honor bid, we have uh, engaged the services of uh, German literary agents in order to help us uh, uh, connect with the for our foreign counterparts and also to um, connect our uh, Filipino publishers to the German publishers to determine the, their the genre, what uh, people read in these respective uh, countries, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll move on to my questions for Ivan and the DTICIG. So Ivan, if you're on board. Yes, on top. All right. So you mentioned the paper issue. So how do we address that? Relative to that count of, I think we need also to consider here the factors that will be uh, affecting the industry. So basically, we have here uh, our representatives from the Board of Investments. And also, we can also connect that uh, given the high import costs and also, like I mentioned, the raw material inputs and labor costs. That will have to be, uh, uh, how do you consider, uh, that will be that will be need to be considered given that uh, we need to focus on the whole value chain. So right can now, give, can we compete in the paper production market or is that a lost cost because of how labor might be cheaper, logistics might be better in other mm -hmm. countries? I think relative to that count of we need to uh, we need to consult first with our particular champions here in the board of investment to specifically calculate and also to provide uh, coherent inputs for that uh, measure given that the representatives from the board of investment is actually coming from the services side, not mm -hmm. from the raw material side. So uh, I'll let our colleagues know from the resource based industry in order to provide the necessary inputs to this body. Um, isn't that in the charter of NBDB, um, Ryan, yung, yung paper tariff, is that part of your um, powers and functions or no? Mr. Mr. Chair, oh, we, yes, uh, go ahead. we give, uh, we give, um, yeah, we, we give um, um, tax breaks for publishers uh, printing textbooks only. So, but there's, the, the, the law is quite specific that um, the beneficiary are, you know, textbook publishers. Uh, although book. I think in, in the past, some of the beneficiaries have been trade books. No. And also, yung stakeholders ng UPMG, like kayo sa Manila Times, the newspapers, no also. No, uh, in fact, that's that's one of our biggest challenges, you know, for newspaper publishers. And Barbie Atienza might might touch on that later on. Okay. One of our most, you know, the one of our costliest inputs is paper. And uh, I'm not an expert, sad to say, in book publishing, even though I'm chair of the NBDB. But my my sense is that you know uh, many of them will have to import just book paper because you know I know that when we uh, when we uh, publish some books in Manila Times and. Uh, 
it's locally sourced, you know, raw materials are just not available. And if they are, they're very expensive. Mm. Uh, sad to say, you know, the pop, uh, paper paper making industry has deteriorated over the past decades. There hasn't been any significant investment in, in that sector, uh, probably not, not since the, the 70s. Yeah. So Ivan, maybe you can ask the BOI. Um, sure, Bob. Is this an investment that's worth considering, or should we just really um, utilize our uh, competitive advantage, which is really the the value add of our creativity um, with the creative sector, and then just try to get the the best kind of arrangement with uh, countries that are sort of you know very productive in that sector. Um, para we can get them cheaper. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Relative to that particular request, we will uh, coordinate with, uh, like I said, with the Board of Indecent and, and together with the different associations in terms of the paper production and paper mill here, uh, players in the country. Because ano, ah, parang emergency na nga to, eh. I mean, pre-pandemic already, it was deteriorating and then exacerbated by the pandemic pa. So can you imagine a world that there are no newspapers? <laughs> it's, it's, it's rather sad. Baka we should you know, come to its rescue at the soonest. Um, yeah, okay, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Check link. Yeah, I, I was just going to add that you know, the, the impact of this goes well beyond the, the publishing uh, industry. I mean, it also impacts packaging, um, especially now that there are some initiatives on the local government able to ban single-use plastics. Of course, paper is the preferred alternative. And so instead of our, you know, for example, in my case and Barbie's case, instead of newspapers going into uh, recycling operations, many, many end up in wet markets as um, basically packaging material for mm. what people buy in, in the wet market. So um, um, I think the DOST has been, uh, has had some programs in doing some R&D in paper production. I think what's missing is just support to bring some of those technologies to scale. Because I think if if I if I scan through what DOST is doing, it's more of the backyard operation, a mom and pop type of paper making, but none of the industrial scale. I think that would be beneficial to book publishing or even a newspaper publishing. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um Comsec, siguro we can request from FPRDI to just give us like a one pager on some of the programs that they have for paper production. Uh, using all of their R and D innovation um, output, baka you know it's tucked away in some lab or some state university that's not finding some kind of market in order to scale. So offhand, I'm thinking FPRDI, but maybe you can just ask you, Sekruena. Comsec, did you get that? Yes, sir. Oh, all right, thanks. Um, Ivan, let's let's discuss the technical manpower issue. Uh, sure, Paul. Uh, Mr. Chair. So, uh, obviously, a lot of people here are looking for jobs. Uh, a lot were displaced, but are you saying that there's a lack of technical manpower in this industry, which means uh, there are opportunities for some kind of capacity building so that uh, groups? Uh, relative to this particular point, Mr. Chair, I think we are our team or our technical staff actually gather this information through our interaction with NBDB. And relative to this, uh, I think this is a similar problem relative to the other creative industry sector wherein uh, the relative uh, wages and, uh, and salaries uh, for workers in the specialized in this particular sector are being uh, are more favored in terms of the other countries. So basically it's a wage comparison problem. But I think from our colleagues from NBDP can further elaborate on this further given our interaction, book, Mr. Chair. Wait, so you're saying that uh, our, our people are being pirated abroad because uh, the wages there are better? It's possible, Mr. Chair. 
I'm sorry, ano ba, ano ba yung technical proficiency na kailangan ng mga personnel in the printing press? I, I mean, is that... So maybe NBDB can better answer this. Well, Mr. Chair, if I may be recognized, um, it, it, this is all connected, I, I think, to uh, the troubles being faced by the entire publishing industry, both on the book side and on the newspaper side. I, I know firsthand from, from our own operations, and Barbie can probably uh, provide some additional inputs to this. Um, there's hardly any program that I'm aware of, um, a vocational program that actually trains press operators in the Philippines. So many of the press operators, including Barbie's uh, company, which has a billion peso printing press, operated by people who essentially learn on the job as apprentices. And the sad, the sad reality is that once, you know, you know, they, they are trained. Um, I think their DTI representative here can, can attest to this, that they are often pirated by other printing companies uh, outside of the country because they do pay much, much higher much higher wages, which is, of course, true for just about every sector of our economy. But we have very few to begin with. Um, and, and then when we do train people to a specific uh, skill level, then they are prone to, to pirating. Okay, uh, maybe we can bring Barbie into this discussion. Barbie, if you're around. Yeah, um, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, so, I mean, how long is the training period of, of people in your industry? Is it uh, a few weeks, months? As far as the uh, back end of the operations is concerned, which is the printing, um, I have to concur with uh, Chairman uh, Klink when he said that a lot of our people have been trained uh, within the company itself. Uh, for, for one, it's because when we started our, when we put up our printing facility, it was the only one in the, of its kind in the Philippines, or it was the only, only one of its kind in Southeast Asia. So that's, that's another matter. But training-wise, it's been an ongoing process since we started in the late 90s as far as training people was concerned. However, the threat there is that... Uh, I think we could already put them up to speed um, in a matter of probably half a year uh, to really get into a level of acceptable propensity. Uh, fortunately for us, through the years, we've already suffered also from some, some amount of turnovers, but not as bad as it would cripple us, as we have people who've been with us for what, 25, 30 years. And we've, I guess we've taken care of them pretty well, uh, uh -huh. so the retention is there. But uh, just the same, our threats in turnovers as far as skilled uh, print people are concerned has been um, abroad, overseas market, uh, rarely, rarely in the local. So among your stakeholders in UPMG, are you saying that there is a deficit of human resources in the back end? Uh, in the back end, um, I wouldn't say, no, well, we, we are always threatened. We are always threatened with that. Because uh, in our industry, in our association, not all publication companies would have their printing facilities. Mm -hmm. uh, there would be a handful that they print their own. So okay. as far as these players are concerned, um, you know, the turnovers are still uh, within acceptable levels, but we're always living with that threat. So... Would it be worth pursuing some kind of test the certification or specialization for your industry? Uh, Surely, is there, I, yeah. is there enough of a market that can absorb people who will undergo that three to four month training period? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a worthwhile endeavor, I believe, Chairman. Uh, considering um, we've always, you know, you'd always want to have sound operations and uh, be able to manage uh, the existing possibilities of uh, turnovers because of the overseas market. Mm -hmm. So that might be a good, it would be serving the industry very well. Uh -oh. Baka it's a possible ano pa, no? uh, institutional support for yeah. the, the severely impacted publishing sector and you'll get some kind of subsidy from TESDA yeah. uh, to be able to train the workers because they need a site. Uh, for the training. So publishing houses 
our printing process can serve as that site. That's, that's right. That's right. Okay, so yeah, we'll we'll look into that. Uh, they're not here uh, in this hearing, Comsec, not Testa, but we can just uh, write to them uh, and propose the idea. Um, Ma'am Remedios is raising her hand, and then I'll recognize Ivan. Um, thank you, Kong. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, um, Ma'am. Uh, this is regards with the uh, issue of the printing industry. And we are aware of that. That is why um, we have this um, memorandum of understanding among the BOI, PTTC, and uh, PCPF, wherein um, we are currently crafting um, training programs for, the, for them, uh, for the upskilling and reskilling of their workforce. So that's uh, one of the ongoing initiatives of um, the BOI and PTTC. Training programs, ma'am, meaning you're going to be coordinating uh, it through TESDA, which is an attached agency of DDI? Uh, through PTTC. Uh, Philippine Trade Training Center. Yes, po. Uh, po. Meron din kasi silang training programs, so they have these training programs. Um, so currently, they're crafting po yung, in coordination with PCPF, they're crafting um, the modules for that. So that's one of the initiatives we're doing now. Are you, what is PCPF? Uh, Philippine um, Printers uh, Foundation. Okay. All right. So, yeah. so whether we we pursue it through TESDA or the PTTC, I think what's important is that there is some kind of training program uh, to address that issue that was raised by you, ma'am, and also Ivan. Um, but then since we're also brainstorming on institutional support for an industry that's severely impacted. Um, I think it's also worth pursuing uh, maybe printing presses, publishing houses can be accredited as the site so that they can receive some kind of uh, fiscal infusion from the state to be able to train uh, more technical personnel to handle the back end. So, I mean, it's just let's just try to combine as many objectives as possible um, to address, you know, to hit me, uh, several birds with one stone. Okay. Um, Ivan, you were raising your hand and then Omar. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Relative to uh, our interaction uh, to TESA or our uh, request for TESA, I think we also need to consider and also request data if the press machine operation NC1 relative to how is it performing and its delivery in terms of uh, towards the industry, whether is it really uh, answering the needs of the sector and also how uh, the quality and uh, of the uh, of the graduates relative to the performance needed by the sector. Uh, that's all, Mr. Chair. Thank you. So, Comsec, there's an NC1 na pala. Um, for uh, uh, what what is it called again, Ivan? Uh, press machine operations. Press machine operation. There's an NC one. So let's go. Let's find out uh, who did test the partner with in coming up with this NC one certification, and then where are the available institutions where uh, these might uh, be offered? Because I would guess that you know, I mean, it's a learn. There has to be a learning site and it has to be a printing press. It can't be parang, alam mo yun, imaginary. I mean, they have to get their hands wet in the actual operations of the machines. Diba? So let's find out. Um, somebody else was raising their hand. Uh, Mr. Chair? From the uh, yes, from the ICP. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just going to make a suggestion, although yung nga po, uh, an actual site with an actual printing press might be necessary. But for jobs training that can be done online po, uh, uh, collaborations can be had with our uh, tech for ed centers uh, who are, which are relocated throughout the Philippines. We have about 4,000 of them. Uh, we can use those as training sites for perhaps other uh, aspects of job training such as mga how to use uh, digital uh, editing tools, how to do layouting and the like, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. 
So I hope the stakeholders were able to take note of that, that the ICT is offering that service. Baka for the other personnel that you guys engage with, maybe they can avail uh, at the barangay level because there are tech for ed centers. Um, but I mean, there are some skills talaga that cannot be taught online, such as, you know, we're ha working with all these machines. I mean, hard to imagine that. Unless we have augmented reality na. <laughs> Matagal pa yun. Okay, sige. Um, next question for Ivan. Uh, you mentioned the global print media advertising industry and you shared with us some data. So, um, do you have an idea about uh, what is the market share of uh, the Philippines uh, for that? Relative to the particular data that we presented, Mr. Chair, unfortunately, we, were, we weren't able to actually get or obtain data specific to the Philippines. We only are able to get data at the Asia-Pacific level. Uh, okay. Siguro, you can work with, uh, you can also inform USEC FITA na you can work with the four A's and the other advertising groups um, in the country so that we can make a better determination um, of like uh, the current market share and if we're road mapping, like what's the ideal market share that we wanna be able to capture within a short, medium and long-term period. Oh, okay, uh, Mr. Chair, relative to that, uh, I would just like to inform the body on the record that uh, since the TTI is implementing the digital advertising roadmap, we're now actually engage, uh, we're now in the process of engaging the various uh, groups under the advertising sector. So we're now planning uh, meetings under EMAP and also uh, ASC. But we're also in the road to meeting some other groups like what like what you mentioned, four A's and the like. Yeah, and UPMG because like. They also, I mean, that's we'll like note. top of their revenue, eh, advertising, not just circulation. Um, on the next suggestion uh, of uh, the gamification of content as an emerging trend, um, and I do remember former USEC Ernie Abelia was also looking into um, gamifying the No Limit Angere um, lore. Um, and uh, siguro the question is, does the NBTB or the DTI through the CIG already have ongoing talks with the Game Development Association for this particular proposal? Um, I Mr. think uh, circling first. <laughs> yeah, Chair Clink, go ahead. Yeah, Mr. Chair, with, with regard to the NBDB, no, we, we, we uh, don't have um, any discussion yet with the, uh, the gaming um, uh, manufacturers but um, yeah we'd certainly be open to it we've recently just um, started working also with uh, comic book um, publishers and illustrators and stakeholders other stakeholders in, in in that sector because we see that there you know there's a lot of potential uh, particularly with the um, um, launching of Tress in uh, in uh, in Netflix um, but if I may digress a bit and just comment on on what Ivan had presented earlier, um, if if I may, Mr. Chair, uh, he, he said that you know the, there there may be a diminishing relevance of newspapers in um, in the market. I mean, I I, I would I, I think maybe put that into context. You know, there may be fewer people reading print, but I think you know uh, all newspapers, including Barbies, I think, and others at UPMG. Will testify there has been some there there have been an exponent there's been an exponential growth in newspaper readership because of our platforms on online and on social media. The the problem is I think you know quite particular to the newspaper publishing sector. Um, the challenge for us is monetization. So we have many more reading the news now, but you know people like um, to read their news on social media for free. So this is is the challenge for, for, for us. But uh, what we're seeing outside of the Philippines, in fact, is that uh, traditional media, uh, particularly with the New York Times, uh, they have been edging out uh, other content providers on the social media sphere, basically because newspapers invest in covering the news. I know in this particular election, I have you know at, at least you know uh, 12 people covering uh, those who have declared their candidates so far. And so this requires an, 
you know, some resources. I'm sure Barbie has many more reporters uh, devoted to, to, to election coverage. But I think the point is that um, um, there is, uh, I, I think, some argument to be made that there's more relevance now of newspapers. The problem for us is how do we survive given the new uh, business model that we are de dealing with in the uh, in the in you know um, in today's age, you know, with social media and other things on the internet. Uh, but going back to your question, no, we we would be happy to reach out to the gamification um, uh, associations to see what collaborations would be available. I'm sure our stakeholders, particularly in the comic books uh, uh, publishing, would be particularly interested in that as well. Yeah. Thank you for that, Chair Uh So, Siguro Ivan, before I um, let you speak, uh, this is also the reason why uh, when we first broached the, the idea with um, Shucks, what's his name? The ASEC of USEC FITA. ASEC NAP. ASEC NAP. Gosh, my, my, my brain is fried. Sorry. That's the reason why uh, when we engaged him with regards to the digital market study that we commissioned, I didn't want to limit it to the digital pivot of film and the performing arts. Because there's also the digital pivot of uh, print media that needs a little bit more data uh, with regards to, you know, how to monetize and the capacity of uh, the market for online subscription or even uh, for how um, digital advertising can be better used uh, and activated uh, to be able to make these pivots more sustainable. Um, so I know that we had already agreed on the scope of the digital market study, but maybe um, if more budget opens up, you can also include print um, so that maybe the UPMG and the other print media stakeholders can be assisted in this regard. Uh -oh. I mean, based on initial consultations that we've had, there are some success stories of the digital pivot, um, but then a lot are still sort of struggling on how to monetize and be sustainable. And you need, you know, data to be able to support all of these strategies. So I think that's where DTI would be most useful um, to the stakeholders. So it's just something to consider. If you can't anymore expand the scope of the digital market study, uh, maybe uh, create a new one um, for this particular industry. Yeah, so yeah, I'll move on to my next uh, sorry, did you want to add anything, Ivan? Uh, actually, yes, Mr. Chair. Relative to your uh, first point regarding the gamification of content, uh, although the DTI, relative to our game development industry roadmap, hasn't completely uh, interacted or touched upon this particular topic on the gamification of content in terms of publishing, we would gladly actually integrate this in terms of our discussion with the sector. Uh, as mentioned, we are actually in close relation with the Game Development uh, Game Developers Association of the Philippines in the crafting of that particular roadmap. And given our particular recommendations here in the hearing, I think uh, we could further integrate this and also provide inputs to this particular sector once there are data and once there are discussions uh, relative to, uh, to our freelancers and also game developers here in the country. Uh, relative naman, uh, Mr. Chair, to your other point in terms of the market study digitalization for this particular sector, uh, we'll raise this to USEC PITA and ASECNAP in order for us to really help this particular sector if there are uh, if there are any more budget or any more resources that we can provide. But more or less, we can also integrate this particular study in the ongoing uh, background paper that we are doing under the TV, radio, and print media sector. So it's possible that we can include some key points uh, that has been mentioned in order for us to fully integrate some content and some inputs relative to the book publishing roadmap uh, that is also uh, no, being undertaken. Uh, that's all, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ivan. I'll move on to Omar and the BICD. Um, actually, it's actually a question for... 
Omar, it's more of a question to the stakeholders, no? Since we have CICT here, and this is not just for print media, but also for um, book publishing, whether trade or text. Uh, what kind of what kind of services or support do you guys need from the DICT? Since his uh, presentation was prefaced by their mandate uh, of um, really enhancing the digital connectivity and digital infrastructure in the country. Yeah. Can we hear from the stakeholders? What, what support do you need from the DICT? Uh, Paolo, from the educational, from the textbook sector. Yes, uh, thank you, Chairman Tov. Uh, Paolo, again, from uh, Philippine Educational Publishers Association. Uh, as you know now that uh, a lot of the schools are on blended learning, especially the private schools and a lot of the public schools. What we really need with the DITC is a stable platform where we can uh, we can educate the students with their learning management system, which is now the standard around the world. Uh, not only textbooks, but uh, online learning management system where the the books are interactive. And uh, so sometimes we we go to schools in the province and we try to sell them the LMS, the learning management system. Uh, sometimes their their internet is not stable enough for um, for the LMS. So many times we we just have to do a workaround or just give them a recording, but that's not the same as. Uh, uh, the learning management system that's really the platform now around the world. I mean, that's the that's the gold standard, that's the accepted practice in all developed countries. Yeah, Omar? Sir, sorry, what's the question? Um, uh, internet connectivity, Puba. Yes, yeah, stable platform. Ah, uh, yes, sir. Okay. So, uh, two things po. Ano. First of all, yung sa free Wi-Fi po namin, under the free Wi-Fi law, we're mandated to put up uh, free Wi-Fi sites in public places and uh, state universities and colleges. Hindi po sakop ang DepEd schools, although we are moving towards providing for internet sa DepEd schools. Kaso nga po, even if we do provide uh, internet for DepEd schools and SUCs, eh, hindi naman nga po pumapasok yung mga bata. Ano. Uh, so uh, aside from investments in infrastructure, <coughs> we've also been uh, helping uh, in inter we've been engaging in interagency efforts in making sure that the processes for obtaining permits uh, for telecommunications infrastructure for the private sector uh, is faster. In fact, uh, if you look po ngayon, uh, we've actually had a very huge growth sa ating rankings in uh, global internet speeds. You know? So we have uh, a whole of government uh, partnership uh, approach, mostly with ARTA, DILG, DPWH, and other agencies to make sure that the infrastructure of the private sector, the telcos, uh, hindi po sila hampered kahit na pandemic, inaalaw po na ng interzonal travel yung mga tao nila. So policies and uh, aside from that, there's also government spending for the National Broadband Program. Mm -hmm. We will be investing in uh, fiber infrastructure for areas that are unserved, underserved, and which are geographically isolated and displaced areas. Uh, yung LMS nyo po ba, sir, requires what average speed for it to be medyo okay na, usable na? I'm going to have to ask my technical department about the speed necessary. But uh, in the provinces, it's not stable enough yes, for, some, for some of the schools. This is pre-pandemic, and then I'm hoping post-pandemic, it's, be, it's going to be better. Like you said, you're, you're laying out the groundwork for a better system. But I guess 
the question on publisher's mind would be the timetable. Mm. Yes, sir. Uh, and so far as uh, yung pinakita ko po kanina na, nation, na provinces covered sa national fiber backbone, matatapos po yun by end of the year. And then for phase two, uh, that should uh, provide for most now of the zone uh, by end of 2022 po. Um, Pasensya na po, but I will really have to say that uh, the NBP really lacks funding po. No? Um, they, we've said time and again, give us uh, 18 billion and we're going to have a fiber backbone network in the whole Philippines, even in the farthest reaches. But now with the Mandana ruling po, uh, where some, the LGUs are getting more uh, budget and then some uh, functions of the national government agency will be devolved to the LGUs. We are crafting a policy whereby we'll only be, be building the backbone, the first, uh, <clears throat> the first mile and the middle mile. So we're go, we're in discussions with LGUs. Na sila na po since may budget sila uh, for them to be the ones to put in the middle mile and the last mile. So yung direct to the consumers and yung connection from the main grid, the network, to the provinces. Several provinces actually are quite enthusiastic about this, but uh, continuing and ongoing po yung discussions uh, because they, of course, lack uh, personnel with the expertise in how to design yung magiging eventual networks nila. So we're engaged naman po sa kanila. A, a, Discussions are ongoing, but I cannot give a fixed date kailan kaya ito. But we are looking to pilot a few provinces na po very soon. Uh, I would say first quarter, second quarter next year. So this, these are developing programs, sir, no? Pasensya na po. But uh, yun, as nag -iba -iba yung uh, needs and nag -iba -iba yung capability nag -iba -iba yung budget uh, na nabibigay, we were tra really trying to adjust. All right. Thank you, Omar. Thank you, Sir Paolo. Um, what about from the trade book sector? Is BDAP here, Annie? Yes, I'm here. I'm um, thinking, I well, I'm thinking if, if this is the ICT turf, but yesterday we had a webinar for our members on um, e-commerce on on um, online online payment platforms and uh, one of our members said that it's been hard for them to convince their provincial uh, clients to put their uh, passwords their m pins for gcash for example or whatever password is is asked of them because there really is a distrust um, and they feel they, a general a general distrust and they and they feel that their their password their password and their data and information about themselves will be uh, will somehow spread in the internet so i feel like there has to be a campaign so that um, citizens will be more digitally sophisticated um, and they know how to safeguard their data um, and they will also be encouraged to do to participate in e-commerce. Kasi parang in Manila, actually in Manila meron meron din ganito, but but I think there are fewer there are fewer cases. But for us uh, trade publishers who are really shifting to e-commerce because bookstores are still uh, physical bookstores are still closed, um, we really need to develop our own uh, digital uh, online storefronts. We need to develop our own selling websites and this will entail that consumers uh, go through online payment portals. So, so maybe the ICT can help with an information campaign uh, on security and uh, how to how to safeguard your your data. Yeah. Omar, is commerce your ano, jurisdiction or is that DTI? That's DTI for the most part, Mr. Chair, except as regards uh, data privacy, that would be NPC. Pag cybersecurity po, that's us. If it's cybercrime, that would be DOJ or Office of Cybercrime or the Cybercrime Investigation and Coordinating Center. 
Sir, what's your capacity to be able to support this particular initiative? Mr. Chair, we have ongoing trainings po on cybersecurity and how to be safe online. But these are more, yung how to be safe online, these are more general. Mm -hmm. They're not specific to how to protect your financial uh, data online. Ayun po. Um, but uh, if there is, ano po, uh, uh, it's a good suggestion. There can be co some coordination po with our Cybersecurity Bureau and ICT Literacy and Competency Development Bureau po. Um, you can email the legislative liaison divisions uh, email po and then I will connect po uh, for any proposals. Thank you. you. Post that in the chat. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, sir, sir. All right, thank you. Um, but DICT has a capacity to, ano, diba? to, shucks, what's the term for it? To be a web host? Is that? No, yes, Mr. Sure, Chair. Uh -oh. so, In mean, fact, we also offer to government agencies that we host their online meetings uh, subject to availability nung, nung slots po. Uh -oh. Pero yung paggawa ng mga online platforms and portals for e-commerce, is that something that DICT can offer? Uh, Mr. Chair, no. What we can do is we can assist agencies uh, with their uh, design. Because typically, these platforms entail procurement, entail hiring the services of a developer, hiring uh, management ng systems for maintenance later on. Uh, we do not have the capacity to be the actual IT technicians and uh, give IT support uh, for, for maintenance, etc. But typically, agencies can uh, go to us for technical advice. So if there are proposals for platforms from various developers, um, if these are uh, major programs of agencies, they can actually ask the ICT and collaborate with uh, uh, coordinate with us as to okay ba yung design, uh, functional ba yan, uh, will this really be able to provide the kind of uh, need, uh, will this be able to provide for their needs? But for us to do po, to provide the po, Mr. Chair, with additional budget, we could, um, we've done some of the platforms for the Central Business Portal, for example, which we're doing with, I think we're now connecting with DTI, no? Uh, it's a single portal from registration of your corporation all the way to obtaining your BIR uh, registration, SSS pag-ibig, etc. And eventually up to business permits. But that one naman kasi, Mr. Chair, that was, uh, that's a program by ARTA and there's some cost sharing doon. Uh, ayun po. We are... Theoretically, kaya, Mr. Chair, but budget support and uh, agencies have their own IT services and procurement services and their own provisions for digitalization uh, programs and projects, Mr. Chair. So since their project yun, budget nila, we just uh, give them technical advice and assistance. Okay. Um, Chair Klink, uh Diba you mentioned that your NBDB is working on an online portal for ISBN? ISBN, man? ISBN. It's, it's for the National Book Registry, Mr. Chairman. Ah, okay. Uh, are you working on some kind of e-commerce platform for your stakeholders? Uh, not if you're if you're referring to a platform where we you know where we can sell you know products like books and no. Uh, but uh, you know the National Book Registry is is more of a more of a database mm -hmm. that um, you know, for example, DepEd can can look into in, in in you know selecting books, appropriate books, or maybe even if the DFA is looking for appropriate material for its cultural diplomacy uh, programs. You know the, the, that's where the National Book Registry would would be helpful because it will not only have the bibliographic information which we're consolidating with, I think, uh, the help of the National Library of the Philippines, but also the other metadata that, you know, will say where it is available, the price, and, 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 uh, and, and that sort of information. So um, not a, plat a selling platform, but uh, uh, 
at the registry. But if I may, Mr. Chair, if you're looking at you know uh, uh, the technology side, if you go back to that ANSOFT matrix that we talked about, you know, if you want to address the penetration, of course, I think basically you need better infrastructure. So the national broadband would, would be one. And of course, other terrestrial infrastructure, common tower policy, I think should be reviewed in terms of policy, policy issues for penetration, maybe a review of the e-commerce law. And then if you want to look at, if you want to look at, you know, uh, developing foreign markets, you know, Singapore is, is doing something interesting, which is um, a, a digital trade treaty uh, that it's negotiating now with uh, uh, a few countries. Uh, I believe, for example, the United States has a digital trade treaty with Japan already. And I think uh, some members of the, um, the foreign chambers of commerce, particularly the American Chamber of Commerce, have, you know, they have been pushing for the Philippines and the US to negotiate a digital trade treaty. And you know, of course, that would not only make it easier for Filipino book buyers to you know, have their credit cards accepted in Amazon and elsewhere, maybe in Europe, where they buy books. But I think the other way around, it may, it may make you know, local books more accessible for purchase um, uh, by, by you know, foreigners. Um, Chair Clink, do you think uh, a state-sponsored e-commerce platform is going to be effective or are there a lot of e-commerce platforms being managed and operated by your stakeholders already? So it's really more of um, digital infrastructure and you know maybe digital trade treaties, as you mentioned. Well, I, I don't think you can have enough um, uh, points of sale. I think one of the challenges in... in um, in the industry is you know has to do with also consolidation in the uh, in the in, in the in the bookstore sphere right um, the biggest player being national bookstore but you know national bookstore can't be in every city or, or village in the in the philippines um over the past year we've seen some initiatives from our stakeholders um uh and uh online platforms such as shopee and lazada that's something that um that I, I, you know, NBDB has been a follower in that. Uh, our stakeholders, I think, uh, led the way there. And uh, uh, this year, we we had something with uh, with Lazada and Chappie where we try to, for example, try to subsidize at least the cost of some textbooks in a, in, in a very modest effort to promote some local textbooks. But you know, I think the 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 market would welcome more points of sale. Um, if 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 uh, if there's an initiative there, I think that would be that would be welcome. So yes, yeah, I mean, after uh, further consulting with your stakeholders, can you let us know in the check link? Like, what's a better way forward? Parang, do we want you know state subsidies for existing platforms, or do we want um, a, a separate platform operated by government um, for e-commerce? Because parang the since resources are always scant. Um, yeah. What's a better investment for the sector? All right. We'll we'll uh, we'll consult our stakeholders, Mr. Chair, and then get mm -hmm. uh, report to you their 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 comments. Thank you. Um, actually, my last question for Omar is uh, on the digital jobs PH platform. Um, I'm not sure we have an organization representing that specific stakeholder in this industry, but. You know, there's a lot of creative talent uh, from freelance writers to content creators um, in this sector. I mean, how might they be assisted by that particular platform that you mentioned? And, and how does it work? Parang, do you just aggregate all of the listings, the job listings? Uh, it, it starts with three get that from the peso office at the lgu i mean how how do you hear about all these job things and then you have this platform where people can look and see if there are available work opportunities mr chair uh, it starts Paul, first with uh training so we have a database of everyone who's been trained uh what uh, uh trainings they've attended and completed tapos po uh we maintain the database and then we don't really source from from uh, other uh, get uh, jobs listings from other sources. It's 
uh, interested uh, companies who write to the digit, digital jobs team. Uh, so, you train people and then they become part of your roster and then you linalakun yun sa mga companies. Uh, uh, these people that we train, baka you want to hire them. Ganun? That is my understanding, Mr. Chair. Uh, and many of these uh, people who get trained, pagka nagkaroon ng opportunities, dun sila sa Tech for Ed Center nag, nag, nag uh, tatrabaho. Mm. Baka we can find a way to improve that program pa. Kasi pa, I think you need a stronger linkage with the meso offices of the different LGUs plus the industry associations that are always on the lookout for talent and personnel and then parang i think maybe the digital jobs can be an aggregator of all of that which is can be accessible from the tech for end centers anyway we'll we'll work closely with your office um to fine tune the program but i think that you're it's a good start parang you're you're at the cusp of something we just have to connect everything better connect everything Okay, uh, just a few questions for thank you so much, Omar. And just thank a, you, Mr. Chair. A few questions for uh, Chair Clink. Uh, so, actually, the first one is not really a question, but it's just a report uh, to you um, that uh, we in the last hearing we talked about how you know one of the best ways in which the state can support the industry is by serving as its market. And Dep and obviously is one of the biggest institutional buyers of our um, text books and sometimes even the trade books. But Ched wasn't with us in the last hearing. And so we had a separate meeting with Ched. Uh, it was me and like 50 other people from Ched. So I was fielding all of those um, queries and uh, receiving all of the presentations. So at least now we have, we've started the conversation on how um, we can better link up with CHED, which is like maybe the other half of like institutional buying of textbooks and trade books. Um, and so Siguro, we can maybe strengthen the synergy between NBDB and CHED, even if you're attached to the Dep Ed. Um, so let's just uh, maybe I know, parang, uh, we can get we can help connect you with them if you can't reach out to them on your own um, and all those people that we met with because they were certainly very open and they also had a lot of suggestions also for this particular industry and so um, yeah we can uh, sorry Jack like you Thank wanted to Okay. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, uh, Chad is um, a member of our Board of Governors. Uh, um, re regret, regrettably, uh, it's only a representative who uh, sits in our monthly meetings. But we would welcome uh, any opportunity for uh, us to get to know and work with others in the uh, in the Chad. Uh, so, by if there if there's a chance to meet more, uh, make more friends, uh, we would certainly welcome it, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, but I definitely raised with them all of the issues that were brought up in the first hearing. And then parang we got their side of the story on, for example, the issue of like photocopying, which, you know, speaks to like intellectual property and why that is. And so it's not as cut and dry as we thought. Parang their mm -hmm. issue of affordability. Uh, but what was interesting also is accessibility. The parang a lot of their requirements aren't even available here. So yeah. well, that that's the chicken and egg, Mr. Chair. So if yeah. you don't have a if you don't have a healthy publishing sector industry, then you precisely don't have the materials that that supply the needs uh, uh, of of our learners. What Chad is trying to say. So it's chicken and egg. So um, unless you make the industry healthier, so that they are able to you know uh, make or print more books, uh, maybe increase the variety of books available in every in, in many disciplines. And then uh, you will have that you will have that kind of scenario where you will resort to basically, um, you know, ignoring intellectual property, go photocopying and whatnot. Uh -oh. 
So like I'm sure there are solutions here, but siguro closer synergy will lead to that. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, great. So so yeah, we'll we'll just message after the hearing so we can figure out like if we should set up a meeting or or just endorse you through a letter. Anyway, we'll we'll figure it Thank out. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um and then okay, so you know. I've been hearing this a lot that we're making a play to be a guest of the guest of honor um, for the 2025 Frankfurt Book Fair from DFA to NBDB and DTI also mentioned it. So, uh, and DFA. So, uh, what does that mean to be the guest of honor? And uh, what are the resources required to attain that distinction? Is this something that we have to pay for or something that we have to earn the respect of peers for them to confer us with that title designation and what is the ROI of being a guest of honor in a Frankfurt book fair or any book fair for that matter just so that we can be enlightened yes thank you thank you Mr. Chair Uh, well uh, I just want to say first off that you know the National Book Development Board has been trying to participate in the other fairs that were mentioned earlier, uh, including London, Bologna, and 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 others. Uh, I think, with the exception of the Beijing Book Fair, uh, but you know, the biggest of them all is Frankfurt, and that's why we have we we have decided to continue the initiative started by the previous board to pursue the guest of honor um, posting, hopefully by 2025, and um, we further clarify that the main reason for us is to, as you suggest, you know, uh, quantify the return um, for the investment. So um, there, there is uh, an investment required because it's not free to, you know, you have to put up a bid essentially to, to be guest of honor. And to be guest of honor means that you have the spotlight on the Philippines, not just on the, on the book publishing industry, but on the you know, entire country itself. Um, now, uh, the other cost that's related to that, um, you know, since we have been unable to attend the book fairs, uh, so has to do with translation. So we have been, we have been, uh, you know, the secretary has been very creative in trying to spend the, the allocations um, for some of those international events for translations, hopefully in preparation for guests of hosting in, in 2025. And that is uh, also a substantial undertaking um, uh, or, or we're, we're looking at probably a hundred books. Now with regard to the specific number, the ROI, I, um, that's something that we're trying to, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're still trying to, 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 to pencil push. You know, it's, it's um, uh, I, I think within NBDB itself, we've, we've had to shift our focus mainly from showcasing to generating rights sold. And so that that's been the directive for at least for this you know beginning with our participation this mm-hmm. year you know to come back you know from that event with you know pesos right or dollar in dollar terms how much or right sold so that's been the priority now hopefully we'll be successful of course we'll know after the event but that that's that is precisely the um, precisely the uh, the aim now I, so I regret that I don't have the number yet. But it's something that you know um, um, we are actively pursuing, uh, and I should also mention that perhaps the the return will not be limited to the year that we may be hosting. But in the case of Indonesia, um, I think what we're seeing from, from you know after the guests of hosting, they are also reaping you know uh, more sales, more rights sold, even you know in the years after they they have they have hosted um, our they they were guests of honor. At Frankfurt. So, um, when were they? I guessing? just want to put that in the context. So, that, you know, if, if we come up with a number that you know this, that doesn't sound so so attractive, I mean, you have to put it in the context that you know the impact of this may be spread over several years. Yeah. When when was Indonesia the host? Or the Ryan, uh, do you recall the 2015, uh, Mr. Chair? Uh, okay. Is there a way by which we can ask? the NBDB counterpart of Indonesia for all this economic data? Yes, um, Mr. Chair, we, 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 we've had some activities with them and, and uh, the organizers of the Frankfurt Book Fair have also been 
helpful in giving us some data and other case studies that uh, will will help us, you know, uh, supply you with, you know, ROI and other benefits that we hope to generate by our participation. Mm-hmm. Oh, because parang I think all of that will be essential with regards to maybe um, supporting any kind of proposal uh, for, you know, uh, budgetary support. <laughs> yes, Mr. Chair. And of course, if, you know, I may add lastly, you know, the, the Secretary has spent a lot of time this year just mapping out the whole value chain. So that that will also, of course, factor in uh, the computation of the return, you know, like how many jobs generated, how, many, how much contribution to value added to the total economy or GDP. So all of those things, you know, how many um, books in dollar terms were exported. So all of those things, I think, will 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 have to be uh, included in in the computation for the return. So, so we're just to funnel it into yeah. um, this thing asks. Uh, Parang uh, the the methodology or the process by which one becomes a guest of honor and what is the needed uh, investment in terms of pesos, um, yeah. to that and then the ROI, uh, which is not necessarily within the same year as you said, and it's yeah. very similar to what was shared by the fashion industry that br- building brands and investing in these trade fairs is not something that ROIs on that same year, but it's something that happens over a multitude of years uh, with regards to brand incubation. And in this case, right. para just really strengthening the brand equity of Filipino publishing output. So, yeah. oh, Well, offhand, Mr. Chair, uh, you know, we, we did find out what, you know, what Indonesia spent. And I, I don't think that will serve much of a purpose for, for our case because, I mean, they, they have a different market. And of course, uh, you know, I think the initiatives of the previous board when they broached that number to some legislators. So there was some sticker shock, but I think we have to um, give, give you know, uh, our, our own computation. Of course, the pandemic being the backdrop. And of course, then with the specific, um, specific profile of, of our domestic uh, market, uh, domestic stakeholders, I think we'll have to come up with a, a, a more reasonable more attainable number to to give us a bid to to Frankfurt, and but the challenge would be, of course, to convince them that they're you know of the other benefits that uh, of of picking the Philippines as a guest of honor. Yeah, because you know, Chair Clink, uh, uh, the ROI of film incentive is one is to eight. For every one peso that you spend on a film incentive, it yields an eight peso return on our economy. Mm-hmm. So. Say it's really not a losing investment for the DBM, yeah. uh, and no, yet, it's not. Right? So, parang it's these yeah. things. Uh, uh, if we can get those parang heuristics yeah. or, or yeah. rule of thumb on ROI, I think they'll be very helpful yeah. and really. Yeah, well, and offhand, you know, maybe the you know the the multiplier number for the manufacturing sector might be a starting point. Uh, you know, yeah. manufacturing has a high multiplier, and and I I, I suppose that we can adopt that. You know. Uh, that number also for book publishing because you know in a, in a sense you know book book publishing is a manufacturing activity so uh, yeah. uh, so that, that there's there's a starting point anyway to to to, to derive that number plus all the intangibles that we all of course but so not power, everybody projection of culture not everybody appreciates the intangibles but but we do, we certainly do um, uh, so the last question, Chair Link, before we move on to the next topic. Uh, you mentioned intellectual property rights issues, uh, especially with uh, the online pivot of DepEd uh, because of the pandemic. So uh, are there ongoing talks at the moment with DepEd uh, for this particular issue? And is the IPOFIL anywhere near uh, this particular issue? Well, the NBDB itself has conducted uh, at least a couple of um, uh, consultation meetings between DepEd and the stakeholders, specifically tackling intellectual property. But I regret to say that you know we've only scratched the surface. Mm-hmm. There are really um, uh, deep issues I think that have that have to be resolved. Um, uh, you know, on you have on one hand DepEd um, seeking fair use. But of course, you on the other hand, you you have the publishers seeking economic viability of the industry. 
So um, uh, you know, the, a, a balance has has to be has to be found some somehow. And and I think uh, the only way to do that would be you know uh, more meetings and more consult more consultations. But as I said earlier in in my in my report, this is a, a very important issue, not only with regard to textbook, but what the, what the entire trend of the, uh, the the entire trend in the education sector. If you can't resolve intellectual property now with textbooks, you know when Paulo Cibal talks about learning materials and software, you know those same issues will 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 uh, will be pro you know again crop up uh, will surface if they're not resolved now. So um, it's it's an important issue. If if I may also mention that uh, there is a pending bill in the House, uh, House Bill Seven Nine Forty Six, which introduces. A single amendment to RA 8047, uh, essentially, essentially allowing the Ped to photocopy books, but of course, the, with a provision that you know it follows uh, the intellectual property laws of the Philippines. But uh, um, the Ped says that it has not been consulted on that particular piece of legislation. But we noticed from our tracking that that bill had already passed second reading in the in its committee and there's a counterpart bill in the senate senate bill 1881 and so if we're looking at um you know um protecting the intellectual property of the publishers uh, i just want to mention it here that perhaps those bills might be steps uh, in the wrong direction okay uh yeah we'll certainly look into that uh Luis? Uh, we can discuss after the hearing. Yes, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I know that DOJ is on board. So I know, and that DOJ is part of the NCIPR, the National Committee on, on Intellectual Property Rights. So maybe hear from the DOJ. I mean, what's your stand in this particular issue? Comsec. Yes, hello, good afternoon, Chair. Ah, uh, yes, hi. Yeah, State hi. Council. Your name's not uh, complete. That's, right? uh, uh, just call me Jen. Jen, all right. Yeah. So, Jen, um, what's the DOJ's take on this whole thing? I mean, fair use on one hand, that Ed is asking because of the pandemic. On the other hand, economic viability and intellectual property rights issues of the publishers whose work are being you know, used for uh, photocopied for the the printed modules or for or maybe being used online without their permission. I mean, give us a give us your uh, diagnosis. Yeah, in the first place, uh, good afternoon to everyone. And uh, well, as at, at as for this uh, confidence, uh, I have not been given the authority yet to give official opinion. But maybe I can give my personal uh, position on the matter. Um, well, for purposes of education, um, maybe we can uh, use fair use at that. But on the other hand, we cannot compromise the uh, intellectual property right of the publisher and as well as the um, whoever be the author of the materials that would be given or that will be used by the um, learners, uh, given that we are shifting to the um, online form of um, learning situation, um, pending the face-to-face -face, um, uh, classes efforts uh, in the coming month. Um, as to the um, usage of the materials, uh, for educational purposes, maybe if um, the permission of the um, owner of the uh, materials could be sought for before the same could be used uh, by the learners, if uh, it is really that um, necessary at, as of this moment to utilize the same. But I would like to say that um, we cannot compromise some legal aspect there, thereof, but if the well owner or the publisher would permit that the, for the use of the materials, then I think that would be fine. 
Okay, maybe if we can request for a position paper uh, from the DOJ uh, on this particular yes. issue to be submitted na lang. Uh, and I think this is a good segue to the next topic in which we have uh, presenters um, and then we'll go into a QA. and uh, The second topic is actually on intellectual property. Um, so before I recognize IPOFIL and DepEd, um, to speak on the matter. Um, I want to thank those who attended the first part of the hearing. If you, uh, if you have somewhere to go or, or if you have another meeting, uh, feel free to just uh, quietly log out of the hearing. So uh, thank you to um, ASIC Ed and, and Ivan and Omar. Um, but check link, you might want to stay. <laughs> till the end of the hearing. Uh, but of course, everyone's welcome to stay. All right, so now let's, uh, let's uh, move on to intellectual property issues. Let's start with a presentation from IPOFIL to be followed by DepEd, and then we'll move to the private sector. Uh, Hello, good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is Jeremy from uh, the Bureau of Copyright. And, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, and sorry, I yeah, I, I I'd like to uh, first of all apologize, Mr. Mr. Chair. I was uh, informed that I will be taking the place of Director Cuyo just before the hearing, and it was because he's in a meeting right now, uh, Mr. Chair, for the Copyright Summit in November, and I was hoping his meeting would be over by now. Pero hindi pa. So I would like to request, Mr. Chair, if we can uh, be excused from presenting. Uh, now and just uh, uh, submit our comments later. Uh, and siguro, I would just like to respond the lang, Mr. Chair, to uh, the issue of uh, the death bed and um, the publishers. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, we are actually looking uh, at the possibility of into the possibility of issuing a fair use guidelines next year. So because our, our agency, Mr. Chair, is uh, actually uh, uh, actually exists for uh, to balance the interests of the publishers and of course the public uh, so we uh, we are um, uh, thinking of the possibility of uh, really making uh, a clear uh, guidelines on what fair use uh, is and when the, the, uh, when can government educational institutions invoke Fair use, Mr. Chair, and uh, also uh, this is also the reason why, Mr. Chair, in the IP code amendment, we uh, proposed that uh, we proposed that uh, uh, the a provision on extended collective licensing be 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 passed, uh, Mr. Chair, because uh, through the extended collective licensing, uh, educational institutions can. Uh, just use a work and then pay the publishers or the collective management organizations uh, a presumptive, I would say, presumptive royalty. So just in case uh, authors or other rights holders uh, uh, who are not known as of the moment or cannot be uh, identified as of the moment can uh, collect from the authorized extended collective licensing uh, organization uh, who previously collected the, the ACL uh, remuneration, Mr. Chair. So, Jeremy, nabanggit mo ba yan sa hearings natin on intellectual property code amendment? Uh, it was Director Kuya who was there, Mr. Chair. Sorry. Tala mo, every time um, yung usapin ng extended collective licensing is being brought up, it's usually, ano eh, uh, viewed from the lens of the music industry. Na obviously, maraming mga concerns si mga members kaya in its current version, hindi included yung ECL. Pero kung may epekto din pala siya dito sa, sa publishing and print media sector, in particular yung textbooks and yung use niya by schools, baka that's something that you should bring up. And baka mas mag-soften yung stance nung uh, mga colleagues namin 
Ah, uh, yes, Mr. Chair, we will submit na lang po uh, a position paper including the educational sector, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. So when do you plan to release the guidelines on fair use? Uh, next year, Mr. Chair, uh, we are still uh, studying uh, the, the possibility, Mr. Chair, because uh, fair use, sabi nila, is essentially a uh, the determination of fair use is essentially a judicial function. So uh, we don't want naman to preempt uh, any judicial determination of fair use, Mr. Chair. So uh, hopefully, uh, may resolve yung issue na yun by next year, Mr. Chair. What do you mean by um, judicial um, uh, resort? Uh, like it means, Mr. Chair, a case? is there an ongoing case? It should be, there should be a case, Mr. Chair, before fair use can be determined. Uh, that's how it is interpreted right now, Mr. Chair, uh, that we cannot uh, uh, determine fair, fair use before but we can always invoke fair use, Mr. Chair, but as to whether it is really fair use is a judicial determination. So there needs to be a case before there is a final say on whether filed the use was actually... A case filed before the courts or a complaint file filed with IPOFIL? With the courts, Mr. Chair. Uh, so is there, a, is there a case or has a case been filed? Maybe this is a question better answered by the private sector, Pepa, Paolo. Hi, uh, okay, so far, uh, I think uh, what uh, Sir Jeremy was talking about was uh, in, in foreign countries like the United States, Canada, and even India, uh, fair use was uh, determined by the courts because there was no clear legislation on what fair use actually is. But uh, I guess that doesn't preclude uh, the Honorable Chair or who, who, whoever in, uh, in the legislature uh, to come up with a law. But nevertheless, that's been the practice around the world. And so fair use was decided because there's no clear legal uh, interpretation of what fair use actually is. Uh, uh, on, on the question, there, there is no case pending now with the Supreme Court. It has to be, if it's a judicial case, it has to be in the Supreme Court. And there's no pending case that, that could be used as a landmark basis. But are, is the sector pursuing? Or you'd much rather that, you know, you just uh, course it through, you know, proper discussions with that and to be uh, able to... Well, for example, uh, sir, if, uh, if discussions with DepEd or with DOJ, if they come up with their interpretation, actually, then that could be used as a basis for uh, bringing it up to the Supreme Court. But as of now, since there's no case, they, they can't even actively decide. I mean, yes, we could uh, speak to the DepEd or we can speak to the NBDB, but all these pronouncements would actually become, uh, would actually not be legally binding mm -hmm. at the moment. Even if we have some kind of an agreement, it won't be legally binding until it, a case is actually raised with the so, Supreme Court or if Congress with its power decides to come out with a clear legislation on the issue. Okay, so we're let's hear from Deb Ed. They're the second presenter. Um, anybody from Deb Ed? Would you like to? Comsec? See, somebody was raising her hand from that pad earlier. Um, sir, um, Director Alice Kavilan is here. Great. Director Alice, you have the floor. Sir Aries, A R I Z. Aries. Um. Yes. Good afternoon, um, everyone, Mr. Chair. Hi, good um, afternoon. Yes. Uh, 
uh, as of now, um, uh, we, um, we are already engaging uh, uh, field calls on talks regarding um, intellectual property concerns. And uh, we hope that uh, the matter will be uh, resolved uh, the soonest possible time. We also plan to um, engage with the, uh, uh, with the uh, Bureau on uh, copyright to, to help us uh, on the determination of certain concerns that uh, um, we have opened up with field calls also. Um, we, um, uh, for, for my part, um, Mr. Chair, uh, I, I would agree with the, the statement of the DOJ a while ago, uh, representative from the DOJ a while ago, that uh, we really need to um, respect the uh, rights of the um, copyright owners or the intellectual property owners. Um, I, I guess, Your Honor, um, uh, with the ongoing talks already with um, field calls, uh, we really um, are of the positive sense that uh, the, the matter that uh, they would uh, be raising uh, will be addressed in no time. Mm. Mr. Baka, Chair? Baka you should engage PEPA also. No? Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, in fact, Mr. Chair, we will also uh, be engaging NBDB uh, uh, on these uh, intellectual uh, property concerns. Good. Okay. Uh, update us na lang siguro, no? Yes, Para Mr. Chair. We don't dwell on it too much in this hearing. Uh, I see that there's a Rowan Orebia raising their hand from DepEd. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Uh, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair. I may just uh, may just be allowed to add to what uh, Director Aris mentioned. I'm from the legal service of DepEd. Uh, okay. Yes, uh, from the DepEd side, we do uh, acknowledge the need for balance between uh, social functions of intellectual property as well as uh, and the, the intellectual property rights. It is uh, anchored naman din po sa 1987 constitution that the use of property bears a social function and all economic agential contribute to the common good. Uh, for DepEd po, uh, indeed there should be a balance between the exclusivity of intellectual property in favor of rights holders and the reasonable access to intellectual property, which in turn fosters further creativity. So, uh, there should be a balance between protecting the interests of intellectual property rights holders up to foster creativity and innovation, and on the other hand, also promoting the interests of the general public, and more particularly the learners in our schools to access intellectual property and also to foster creativity. As mentioned po by Director Aris, uh, we've been very, and also by NBDB Chair, uh, Chairman Ang, that DepEd has been also very active in coordination with them as well as in reaching out with the private uh, sector, uh, publishing, pub, uh, publishing industry sector, so that we'll be able to come up with a better understanding of our stance insofar as public basic education is concerned and, and the basic education sector in, in general. Po. Uh, DepEd through the BLR po, has also been uh, active in providing capacity building activities to our teachers and uh, DepEd personnel, as well as uh, our learners also. So that we uh, to, to be able uh, to enhance their knowledge and understanding of intellectual property in the context of basic education. And in relation to that, to also have knowledge of when do we be, when we would be able to, uh, to use or be able to invoke uh, uh, intellectual property copyright, for instance, copyright exceptions and limitations, so that they'll also be able to appreciate uh, not only the access to these materials in the context of social uh, uh, social use, but also uh, to honor and respect the intellectual property rights of the rights holders. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Great. Um, any more from the DepEd family? Okay, so then the private sector, there were two 
that were slated to present, uh, Peppa and Phil Calls. So Paolo has has been uh, actively participating in the hearing. Maybe we can hear from Phil Calls or Paolo if you would like to add anything. Oh, sorry. Uh, Chairman Tuff, I have a very, very short presentation. Uh, yes, go ahead. Regarding this. Okay, if, if I may. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Paolo Sibal. I'm the president of the of PEPA, the Philippine Educational Publishers Association. And good afternoon to members of Congress, Chairman Clink Ang, E.D. Cheris Tugade, fellow presidents of book organizations, the uh, much respected attorney Dominador Buhain, uh, Ma Madam Annie Almario of PDAP, fellow publishers, Okay, uh, just a just a quick rundown, actually, and uh, it's an overall presentation. But uh, you'll see why we we put it under intellectual property. So next slide, please. So next slide, please. Okay, there. Uh, just a quick look at the Philippine ratings, math and science, and reading. Obviously, as uh, mentioned before in Congress many times, the Philippines score in math and science is very low. Uh, we're one of the lowest in science. We're the lowest in 58 countries. And if I'm not correct, uh, 2022 is uh, a piece a year. So there, there's going to be another testing coming up. Um, the most probable reasons for the low ranking and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, is the the low quality of the self-learning modules that were developed during during and before the pandemic. Actually, uh, there were some modules made that uh, were of low quality and uh, suspect is the uh, is the what do you call this? The uh, resource or source materials. Uh, the teachers were made to do SLMs instead of concentrating on teaching. And this divided their attention and time. And many teachers were not really trained to do, to do writing, but they were actually very, very good educators. But mm, Many were very, very good educators, but not really good uh, writers. Uh, curriculum standards not up to par, distance learning to implement uh, most essential learning competencies, and the continuous focus on the DepEd on just the minimum standards. Uh, next slide, please. So, textbooks and the pandemics with at least 800 plus private schools that were closed, private school enrollees significantly down. Uh, it's only 32% of 2019. This is 2021, it's only 32% of 2019. Next slide, please. Okay, so total enrollees for for the Philippines, 27 million down to 21 million last year, and then back up to 26 million, but it's still lower than 2019. It doesn't mean that there's less students. Actually, we have uh, more population than before. So the question is even more glaring with the private school enrollees, which I mentioned earlier, only 32% of 2019. Uh, next slide, please. Awesome. Okay, this this is just a snapshot, and I don't want to burden everyone with the whole process of publishing. But the one in the the whole this whole picture, this whole process is actually the the book publishing process where the end users or the buyers are institutional buyers, the private schools. 
uh, and the government and the learners by the 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 learners either get the book the textbooks from institutional buyers or from the government now it passes through the purple area which is the publishing side sales marketing and distribution production and operations we get our input from the teachers the government lgu and from the schools and the feedback from the schools now we we just want to highlight the portion in red the portion in red here shows that uh, what happens when the government moves into slms the whole it bypasses that whole operation of the publishing site and only connects with teachers and lgu uh, the teachers to get the uh, source source material or the the written material and then it's delivered to the government in the form of dep ed and then the government gives it to the lgus in the form of uh, printed material or money where the LGUs actually print the modules themselves and deliver it to the teachers for the students. So that, that was the process of the self-learning modules. Uh, recently, uh, there was an improvement here where the During that time, well, let's let's talk first during that time of the pandemic. Uh, during the time of the pandemic, uh, a very uh, very critical portion happened where not only did the private, not only did the public schools come up with their own self-learning modules, but the private, many private schools because of the because of budget and economic crisis also moved into creating their own modules. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, now this is not my own opinion. This is actually the opinion of the whole board of PEPA. Uh, when I say the whole board, they this was in consultation with the members of, uh, of PEPA. So when NBDB, uh, E.D. Charis Tugades approached me she actually was seeking marketing needs for textbook publishing. This was actually the, the guiding principle that uh, we were supposed to present in, in this meeting was the marketing principle, the marketing needs. However, when I brought it back to the, the board and to the members, uh, the overall picture that they presented to me was something else. And the picture that they presented was that uh, they can market all they want, but the problem is uh, if if we're if the intellectual property is not not safeguarded, then uh, the point is uh, the market is weakened because instead of buying, then instead of buying the books or buying the ideas or buying the cre creation of the authors, uh, the work is just lifted. So it's actually a stricter policy, stricter policing of the IPO will actually help marketing. Many copyright infringement, whether private or public schools, uh, we actually not only I'm not only speaking of our company, which is Phoenix, but also, also the other companies, whether Rex, Vival, Aviva, or some other companies that you may know, uh, we deal with the private schools and the public schools. And we have documented evidence of even private schools lifting uh, passages, sometimes even the whole book, from from the textbook into their own modules. And we also have the same thing with uh, the DepEd self-learning modules lifted from the, 
from the private publisher's textbook into the self-learning modules. So the need here is something else. The need here is on the one side, there's a marketing need, but market as we must, market as we like, uh, the, the problem, the glaring problem is intellectual property. And we were hoping that, uh, I don't know, we were, we were discussing it with the board if perhaps uh, an agency, maybe like the National Book Development Board could be given, or the IPO or something else, whether it's the NBI, could be actually given policing powers. Uh, well, most likely the NBDB, given a larger budget, could have policing powers and could actually highlight many copyright infringement being done, not only with the text, but textbook, but also with the trade books. Perhaps NBDB would be closer to the market and they, they would be actually more responsive to this stricter policing of the intellectual property. So that is, that's why this is number one in the points raised by the Board of PEPA. Okay, number two, for public schools, whether textbooks or modules, it should be developed and made by private publishers based on the law. And this law is the continuous strict implementation of RA 8047, specifically sections 10 and 11. When we say sections 10 and 11, what we mean is that the DepEd follows the mandate of RA 8047, which is to uh, not to develop their own learning materials, but to buy textbooks and learning materials from the private publishers. And also that uh, this should be this should be developed and done strictly in partnership with the National Book Development Board and the private publishers. Uh, number four, ownership and content should remain with the publisher and cannot be removed from publishers without consent nor scanned without due process of the law. Uh, this is in connection with number five, reiteration of the publisher's position paper submitted regarding House Bill 7946 an act amending RA 8047 and several other house bills for the scanning and conversion of textbooks to digital for the use of a free online platform. So obviously uh, we've seen about five bills that are roughly connected to this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, scanning and conversion of textbooks to digital, uh, to digital and for free online platform. Uh, we've written a, together with PEPA, together with uh, BDAP and Philbooks actually came up with a position paper regard, regarding this. And our concern here is that uh, the, there are house bills uh, for the scanning and conversion of textbooks and other books but there's no mention of any kind of just compensation for any of the scanning and conversion. Okay, number six, in order to continue to feed and nourish the mind of the publishing industry, the publishing industry should not be closed during times of national crisis. Uh, it's there because uh, Every time we do a lockdown, it seems like it's usually before school opening, and it certainly affects the the quality of the books. And we just wanted it in there, hopefully that the, the government and Congress can do something about this. Now this should be number seven, and it's very important, but somehow it it was integrated into number six, which is the online subscri subscription based library where students can access books for a fee. So we're proposing that uh, either, either CHED or the DevEd or the National Book Development Board 
come up with an online subscription-based library where all Filipino students, whether elementary all the way up to graduate school, can access books, but for a fee. And this is in connection also, and the same practice is being done internationally. This will prevent now uh, uh, the scanning and conversion of textbooks for a free online platform. Uh, okay, now an online platform and directory for the promotion of all Filipino published works. This is in connection with what uh, Chairman Clint mentioned earlier. Uh, and this was brought up by the, by the board of PEPA. Uh, was the idea is we have an online registry of all the books. This could be the idea is to fund the National Book Registry of the National Book Development Board. And on our side, from the private sector, it's for marketing purposes. So foreign 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 buyers or even local buyers have one place to look and they know that it's complete. All the books that were published and developed in the Philippines is in one directory. And like Chairman Kling said, it would, it would have all the information on the book, including metadata on subject and topic matters. And, and a link also to where the book can be procured. And then number eight, textbooks should always be reserved for Filipino authors. Now, uh, this is already the practice in the Philippines, but uh, we were putting it there because uh, although it's a practice, and I think there, I believe there's a there's an old presidential order that covers this. Uh, it could be perhaps uh, legislated to be so, and. The old Filipino, uh, the old uh, presidential order was to develop the Philippines based on the Filipino ideas of what is what is the culture of the Philippines, uh, and we would like to push for this to be codified. Uh, the exemption to this would be supplementary material, supplementary educational materials. Now that's where uh, foreign and imported books could come in and foreign ideas could be inculcated into the education of the Filipinos. I guess that's it. Uh, that's it for my presentation. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, um, Sir Paolo. Uh, do we have a presentation from Phil Coles as yes, well? Yes, Mr. Chair, good afternoon. Hi. I'm Alvin Buenaventura, and I'd like to share my, if I may share my presentation. Yes, Alvin, you have the floor. Uh, can you see, sir? Yes. So, uh, medyo mahaba po ito. Pasensya na po kayo. Ay, okay lang po. Uh, ito po ang publishing industry ecosystem ayon sa uh, reproduction rights organization. Yung pong primary use, yung po yung ating pinag-uusapan kanina. Kung saan ang author ay lumalapit sa publisher at kapag ka nabenta na yung libro, ay binabayaran ng royalty sa author. At ang publisher po ay may contribution dahil hindi naman po raw manuscript yung ipinapublish kundi nagdadagdag ng value yung publisher dun sa akda. Now, uh, sa susunod naman pong level ay yung secondary use. Kung na-print na yung libro at uh, kailangan tong i-reproduce sa pamamagitan ng photocopying or digital copying, ay uh, kailangan din po ng karampatang bayad. Dito ang tawag po ay remuneration. Bakit po? kailangan ng remuneration dahil yung pong reproduction rights ayon sa IP code ay exclusive rights ng ating mga author. 
at uh, doon po pumapasok ang field calls o Filipinas Copyright Licensing Society. Ang aming po mga kasapi ay tinatawag na right holders dahil ito po ay mga individual authors, publishers, at yung pong tagapagmana or heirs of the author. Kung mapapansin po ninyo, nasa pinakababa ng, ng inverted triangle yung fair use kasi hindi po kailangan kainin ng fair use yung second level o yung kabuuan dahil babagsak po yung buong ecosystem. Uh, naiintindihan ko po yung uh, pinag-uusapan kanina tungkol sa fair use pero tatalakayin ko po ng mas malalim sa susunod. So, ang mga CMO or RRO, yun po yung old term, reproduction rights organization. Nagtayo po sila ng, ng organization ng 1984. Pero ang pinakaunang uh, reproduction rights organization ay itinatag sa Germany noong 1957 dahil po sa pagdami ng mga photocopying machines. At uh, eventually, ito pong mga RROs na ito ay hindi lamang yung printed materials ang minamanage kundi pati ibang rights ng, halimbawa po yung resale rights ng ating mga visual artists. So nag-morph po sila or nag-evolve into CMOs or Collective Management Organization. So ipopoint out ko lang po na sa Japan, kahit po sila technologically advanced, ay meron silang tatlong uh, CMO. Yung pong JAC ay para sa academic publications, JRRC ay para sa newspaper and magazines, and JCOPY ay para sa trade books. Ang South Korea po sa ngayon ay nag-evolve na into a multi-purpose CMO dahil hawak na rin po nila yung resale rights maliban dun sa mga rights ng nasa uh, publishing industry. Uh, the largest uh, CMO in the world is the Copyright Clearance Center in the United States. And I also like to point out that all these countries like the Philippines have fair use Uh, provisions in their own copyright laws. Pero masagana po ang kanilang publishing industry at malakas po yung mga CMOs nila. Uh, ang pagtatayo po ng CMO ay uh, nasa ating uh, RA 8047, nasa ating National Book Policy at tinatawag pong Collective Reprography Licensing. At kaya po uh, nag-usap-usap ang mga pinuno ng IPO field ng NBDB at sa private sector, ang heads ng BDAP at ang union ng mga manunulat sa Pilipinas para itatag ang field calls. At uh, naitatag po siya noong 2008 at uh, naging miyembro ng IFRO, yung pong International Umbrella Organization, noong 2009. Uh, bakit po mahalaga para sa field calls yung provision sa Universal Declaration of Human Rights? Ito po yung nasa Article 27.2 na mahalaga po ito para sa amin dahil at naiintindihan ko po na maraming mga usapin tungkol sa pagkakaiba ng copyright at human rights. Pero para sa field calls, ang copyright po ay human rights na dapat respetuhin. Bakit po? Dahil ito po ay kabuhayan ng mga tao. At kapag ka naapektuhan po ang kabuhayan ng mga tao, we violate their rights to a, their right to live decent lives. Uh, wala na po silang mailalagay sa na pagkain sa lamesa nila. So, mahalaga po sa amin yung connection ng copyright at human rights. Ang field calls po ay nakatanggap ng uh, tulong mula sa Norwegian government at sa Norwegian Copyright Development Association para po sa aming initial operations noong kami ay tinatag noong 2010 to 2012. At meron po kami mga awareness campaigns. Isa po sa pinuntahan namin ay ang ginawa namin ay yung puntahan sa Pangasinan Uh, ginanap po ito sa Capitol ng Pangasinan sa Lingayen at may link po kami sa head ng tourism office at ang local group po ay ang Ulupan sa Pansiyasay Salitan Pangasinan o UPSP. Ito po ay local group ng writers dahil uh, isa po sa ginagawa po ng Philcos ay i-develop yung mga local writers to empower them para alam po nila yung kanilang karapatan, alam po, meron po silang basic na kaalaman sa copyright. Ang huntahan po ay ginagawa namin sa pakikipagtulungan sa Intellectual Property Office of the Philippines. Nagpapadala po sila ng isang abogado para magsalita tungkol sa IP. At uh, sa side naman po ng field calls, ay meron pong isang author na nagsasalita sa business side ng publishing at sa craft of writing. At sa, sa side naman po ng field calls, ay nagsasalita ako tungkol sa collective management. 
meron din po kaming seminar para sa mga estudyante na tinatawag na Copyright Made Easy. Uh, tinatalakay po dito yung basic ng, basics ng IP at copyright, plagiarism. Uh, binibigay po namin ito sa mga estudyante na, na nasa stage na gumagawa ng research. Uh, pero may mga ibang universities na ibinibigay naman namin ito bilang orientation sa kanilang incoming first-year students dahil tinatalakay po dito yung plagiarism. At uh, noong pong 2013 ay pinalad kami sa pakikipagtulungan ni uh, Kling Ang. Uh, naging uh, unang licensee po ng Philcols ang the Manila Times College. Ang chairman po namin noon ay si Dr. Isagani Cruz. At sumunod na rin po within 2013 ay nakapag-license uh, kami sa DepEd dahil po sa K-12 materials. So kailangan nilang gumamit ng mga akda ng mga Filipino authors at karamihan po sa mga akdang ito ay miyembro po ng PhilCol. So nung nareceive po namin yung remuneration noong 2013 ay agad kaming nagdistribute sa mga member publishers namin tulad ng Ateneo Press. Ito po ang dating director ng Ateneo na si Rica Bulipata Santos at uh, tinanggap niya rin po yung cheque para sa isa sa mga professor ng Ateneo, si Dr. Asunta Puyeng King, na kanyang kaibigan. At ito po ang yumaong si Serbian, uh, recently yumao po siya. Siya po ay isa sa founding uh, member ng Philcols. At uh, ito po ang iba sa mga tumanggap ng remuneration ng 2013. Kung mapapansin po ninyo, kasama po dyan ang 13 authors na si Budget Tan at si Kajo Baldissimo. Mahalaga po sa usapin ngayon si uh, Ma'am Damiana Eugenio uh, tungkol po sa, sa problema o, o issue natin sa fair use. Uh, siya po ang tinatawag na mother of Philippine folklore at pagka-retire po niya sa UP sa pagkalipas na mahabang panahon ng pagtuturo ay hindi na po alam kung saan siya hahanapin. So akala namin ay orphan work na yung kanyang akda. Pero nahanap po namin siya sa, sa swerte ano po, at ang kanya pong seven books on Philippine folklore series uh, na mention kanina ng BFA na meron silang Philippine folklore series at ito po isa po sa mga akda ni Ma'am Damian ay ginamit doon. At ginagamit po ito sa mga textbooks. At nung nahanap po namin siya, uh, siya po ay 93 years old na bedridden. One year siyang bedridden. Pero matalas ang kanyang isip. Nagpabihi siya ng magara at uh, nagpalagay ng ng lamp sa kanyang higaan at binasa yung mga documents na dala namin. Nung sabi namin na meron kaming check eh, na galing sa Department of Education, ang sabi niya ay, uh, to quote, mabuti nagbabayad na sila ngayon. Dati-rati, kuha lang sila ng kuha. Ang DEX. Ah, DEX pa po ang tawag niya sa Department of Education, hindi pa DepEd. Ibig sabihin yung pong uh, gawin ng DepEd na gumagamit ng basta-basta na akda, ay eh, masyado na pong matagal nilang ginagawa. At ang duration po ng copyright, ah, pagkatapos po nito, a few months later ay binawian ng buhay si Ma'am Damiana Eugenio, pero masaya kami kasi ah, nakatulong ang field call sa kanyang mga pangangailangan. At ah, dahil po ang copyright ay lifetime of the author, last 50 years, nung pong kami ay nag-distribute noong 2016, yung kanya pong tagapagmana or heir ang tumanggap ng, ng remuneration. Ito pong uh, distribution namin ng 2013 ay uh, ginanap sa Ayala Museum dahil ang Ayala Museum at ang Filipina Heritage Library ay licenses din po ng Philcols. Ito po ang ilan sa mga tumanggap, si Francisco Colaico, author ng Wealth Within Your Reach, si Professor Egay Summer ng Ateneo de Manila University. Ipopoint out ko rin po si Volt Contreras ng Inquirer. Bakit po mahalaga si Bolt Contreras? Dahil kanina po pinag-uusapan na sabi ni, ni uh, Chair, Chairman Clink na mataas ang readership sa online. Totoo po ito. Totoo po ito. Bakit? Dahil yung pong mga akda ng mga uh, columnist at mga journalist na binabasa sa labas ng Pilipinas. Na nadiscovery po namin ito dahil nagpadala ng remuneration yung aming counterpart copyright agency sa Australia para sa mga Philippine authors at karamihan po dito ay mga journalists at uh, si Bolt Contreras ay isa po dito. Ito po ang iba pang mga inquirer, uh, inquirer uh, 
columnist na si Nenis Santa Romana Cruz, Manuel Quezon, Ceres Doyo, kasi po yung kanilang mga topic ay yung pong uh, people power. So ginagamit po ito sa mga paaralan sa Australia at from uh, websites, kapag pinrint out ay meron pong maliit na kabayaran. A small cent uh, is collected and it goes to the CMO. The CMO then uh, collects them and after many years, i-re-remit -re -re po sa counterpart CMO. Gusto ko rin pong i-point out na sa mga ibang CMO ay meron pong association ng journalists, uh, editors ng mga newspaper and magazines, critics association dahil yung pong mga akda ng mga nagsulat sa dyaryo, mga magazine, ay nire-reproduce sa ginagamit sa mga paaralan at meron din po itong karampatang bayan. Ito po ay binibigay sa kanila at na-witness ko nga po ito noong 2016. Yung mga hindi po nakapunta sa aming distribution ng 2016 ay dinadala namin sa kanilang bahay, yung, yung kanilang remuneration. Uh, ito pong nasa gitnang nakagre ay si Luwalhati Bautista na siyang uh, author ng dekada 70, Bata-bata, Paano ka ginawa? At uh, ito rin po, susunod ay si uh, Father Bert Aleo, isang heswitang makata. Uh, ginamit din po ang akda niya, kaya nag-distribute din kami. After three years noong 2019, nagkaroon po muli kami ng distribution at ito po ang pinakamalaki naming amount na ibinigay sa aming member publisher. Uh, during that time, si Attorney Andrea Pasion Flores na nandito ay uh, general manager ng Anvil Publishing. At... Uh, Binigay po namin yung, yung share para sa Anvil Publishing dahil yung members ng Anvil, yung kanilang mga akda ay ginamit din. Ito po ang iba sa mga tumanggap noong 2019 ng, ng remuneration pero December po ito at pagdating ng pandemic ay hindi na kami tumuloy. Gusto ko lang po i-point out yung pangalan ni uh, Sir Boots Dalisay dito sa 2019 dahil yung kanya pong akda ay hindi po column sa sa star kundi yung kanya pong mismong libro ay pinotocopy, nireproduce at na-share digitally. At kaya meron pong karampatang remuneration. Siyempre, nagulat siya dahil hindi niya expected yung amount. Pero gumagana po ang sistema ito sa ibang bansa. At ang hope po ng Philcos ay mapagana ito sa atin. So pupunta na po ako sa piracy and IP issues para gusto ko lang po magkaroon ng context kung sino ang Philcos at ano ang aming ginagawa. So na-mention po ni Kong uh, Tof na nung siya ay nag-aaral pa sa Ateneo ay mayroong photocopy shops. Ito po ay nasa ISO sa katapat ng CAF. At uh, paglabas niya po ng Bellar Building, lala lalakad lang kayo ng konti. Nandun po yung blessings. Uh, Pre-pandemic, lahat po ng mga universities, mga schools ay mayroong photocopy shops sa loob ng paaralan. At uh, sa USD, kung saan naman ako nag-aaral, ang mga, mga copy shops ay nakapalibot sa, sa schools. Ang ginagawa po ng Philcons ay lumalapit kami sa University Legal Council para magkaroon ng license agreement. Pero tama po yung sinabi ng mga nao ng mga abogado na wala po kasi yung fair use test case. So wala po para sa kanila ay dahil wala naman test case, free for all, pwede namin gawin ito, pwede kaming kumopya. So nakita po ng Philcons na problema ito at sa kasalukuyan ay eh, marami pa rin nagaganap na photocopying. So ang ginawa po namin ay nung nagkaroon ng amendment ng 2013, ay pinilit po namin na magkaroon sana ng IP policies sa mga schools and universities. Nagkaroon po. Kaya lang, kahit po nagkaroon ng IP policies sa uh, amendment sa RA 80 to 93, ay voluntary pa rin po yung licensing at wala pa rin test case. So sabi namin, talagang mahirap dapat magkaroon ng test case. Nung nagkaroon naman po ng debate at saka ng Uh, batas para sa free tuition law na, na nagawang po namin ng way na maisama yung reproduction of materials. Uh, yun to po yung photocopying, ito po yung technical term. At uh, during the, 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 the crafting of the uh, implementing rules and regulations, eh, present din po ang field calls, ang aming pong pamunuan, si Dr. Butch Dalisay, ang aming pong legal counsel, at kinausap namin ang CHED Unifast. Naisama po ito sa IRR, kaya lang ay eh, voluntary pa rin po para sa SUCs and LUCs. So, yun po yung mga na-encounter namin na problem, kaya hindi po kami makapag-license sa mga schools and universities. Now, meron din po mga problema na nagaganap sa mga review centers 
kung saan ang mga review materials ay ginagamit, pinaphotocopy, ibinebenta. Sa ngayon po ay wala kaming miyembrong publisher ng, ng review materials. Uh, yung pong MSA ay isa sa pinakamalaking uh, nagpuproduce ng mga review materials. At dahil exclusive rights po ito, yung pong publisher ang dapat na gumawa ng daan para uh, makasuha, nalimbawa, yung mga review centers na gumagawa nito. Uh, sa isang banda naman po ay gusto ko pong i-commend yung IP office yung pong kanilang IEO or IP enforcement office dahil meron po silang mga ginawang hakbang para matawag ang atensyon ng mga namumuno sa online uh, shopping platforms. Nag-invite din po sila ng mga speakers sa FB, sa Facebook at YouTube para turuan ng copyright owners kung paano mag-take down ng mga copyright infringing materials at paano ang dapat nilang gawin ko i-report kung merong gumagamit ng na illegally na nag-upload at nagbebenta ng kanilang akda online. Ang, ang IEO rin po ay active in monitoring copyright infringing websites. Alam ko po yan dahil madalas po sila nagsasend sa amin ng mga reports at uh, iba, ang iba pong mga sites na ito ay nire-report ka naman in turn sa aming counterpart abroad. Now, uh, last month sinabi po ni Kong Tof na there are things that should be talked about in the neighborhood. Uh, pupunta po tayo doon sa dapat pag-usapan natin sa uh, ating neighborhood. At uh, ito po ay emails, screenshot ng emails na nareceive ko mula sa mga teachers ng DepEd. Sabi niya po dito, ito po ay May 2020, last year. Sabi niya, good day, pwede pa ako makahingi ng hard or soft copy ng teachers, guides, at learners materials o all subjects sa kinder to grade 6. Ilang tao, ilang year na po kami walang textbook, lalo na sa grade 6 po. Kahit teacher's guides and learner's materials, malaking tulong na ito sa aming mountain teachers. Salamat po. So, ito po ang pangalawa. Sabi niya naman, eh, kailangan niya ng soft copy ng learner's materials sa industrial arts, etc. Uh, module 1 and 2 ng 2018. Para po ito sa student senior high school online teaching. Urgent need. Very thank you. God bless. So sumagot po ako sa kanya na hindi po namin pwedeng gawin yun dahil uh, at kung mapapansin po ninyo yung kanyang email ay merong at deped.gov.ph sa dulo dahil ito po ay maaaring isa sa mga opisyal uh, sa malayong lugar no? kung saan man siya uh, nagtuturo at nagpe-prepare ng module so nung sinagot ko po siya, eh, siyempre hindi po niya nagustuhan yung sagot ko. At ang sagot niya sa akin ay, If you don't want to help our Filipino students, student by giving soft copy of Mojo, just fine. Thank you. So, <laughs> so wala po ako magagawa doon. No? At uh, ito po ay yung panahon na gumagawa sila ng mga Mojo. So pag-usapan po natin yung mahirap pag-usapan sa neighborhood. Naglabas po ang DepEd ng ng kanilang Department Order 18, Series of 2020. Sa palagay po ng Philco, ito po ay anti-RA8047. Bakit? Sa, nag, naglalaya, nag-uutos po ito ng large-scale reproduction. Para sa amin po, hindi ito fair use. Uh, bakit po? Nagsasabi si Attorney Roan kanina na we should balance. No? Tama po, balance. Pero 100% po ang nasa DepEd. Zero po kami. Asan po yung balance? Pangatlo, copyright infringement na minensyon ni Paul Lucibal. At sa tingin po namin ay uh, lumampas yung kapangyarihan ng DepEd at nagkaroon sila bigla ng legislative power. Uh, sa sistema pong ito ay napilita ng ating mga guro na gumawa ng mga module kahit wala naman silang sapat na training para dito. At wala rin pong karampatang bayad sa kanila bilang mga author dahil ang promise lang sa kanila ay future points for future promotion. Una po, ang sabi po sa, sa Department Order ay ang mga materials ito ay dapat ready for mass printing. Malinaw po sa IP code na ang reproduction or substantial portion of the work ay exclusive right ng author. Tinalunan po ito ng DepEd. Gusto ko pong i-point out din, saan ba nang galing yung, yung ganitong klaseng fair use? Uh, nung pong uh, 1978 ay mahal ang textbook at 38 pesos. So si uh, Strongman Marcos ay gumawa ng presidential decree 1203 kung saan ang mga libro ay nire-reprint 
under, uh, under that presidential decree. It was repealed in 1998 at nagkaroon uli ng amendment noong 2013. Bakit? Kasi po ang nakalagay dun sa 1998, uh, 1998 na provision ay multiple copies for classroom use is not an infringement of copyright. So noong 2013, nung nagkaroon po ng amendment, pinalitan po ito to limited copies for classroom use is not an infringement of copyright. At kasama rin po sa Section 230 nung amendment sa IP Code, ay dinedirekta ang ating uh, book industry na magkaroon ng fair use guidelines. Kaya nga po ang uh, uh, BDAP ay nag-craft ng kanilang fair use guidelines. Mahaba po ang dokumentong ito, pero um, in essence, ang sinasabi po ay ang fair use or free use para sa book industry is reproducing or using for free only 5% of a work. If a book is 100 pages, 5 pages lang po dapat. Bakit? Kasi kawawa naman po yung mga gumawa. Kawawa naman po yung mga author at mga publisher. Nababiolate po yung kanilang copyright. Nababiolate po yung kanilang human right. Pero naging patuloy po sa pamamagitan ng department order yung rampant na reproduction. So unfortunately, the DepEd became a, yeah, an institution na nagpo-promote ng unfair use, masquerading as fair use. Uh, sinasabi po ng DepEd, uh, kung ilalagay ko po yung sarili ko sa posisyon ng DepEd, uh, tama naman po kung susundin ko po yung Section 184 na dahil ito ay ginagamit ng pamahalaan at para sa public interest, ay pwede silang Pwede nila itong gawin, pero meron pong kulatilya ito sa dulo. Dapat po ang use ay compatible with fair use. At ano po ang sinasabi doon? Uh, pagdating po sa limitation, yung limitation po kasi yung portion na yan sa IP code, eh. meron pong limitation to the limitation. Ano po yun? Yung susunod po na provision, ang sabi po sa 184.2, the provisions of this section shall be interpreted in such a way as to allow the work to be used in a manner which does not conflict with the normal exploitation of the work and does not unreasonably prejudice the legitimate interests of the rights holders. Saan po galing yun? Ito po actually ay kinopia dun sa Bern Convention kung saan ang Pilipinas ay pumirma. Ito po ay international treaty. Bakit po ito mahalaga? Sapagkat yung pong exemptions ay hindi po absolute. Pwede lang siyang gamitin on special cases at malinaw it should not harm the legitimate interests of the author. So it was placed in the, in the IP code to emphasize that fair use is not a free-for-all copying. The limitation like fair use should not conflict with the normal exploitation of the work. And in our context, the normal exploitation of the work is what RA 8047 is. DepEd should procure the materials from the private sector dahil kabuhayan po nila ito. If the limitation like fair use affect the livelihood of the author where his or her book is not bought due to free for all copying masked as fair use, then this goes against the author's legitimate interests. So para sa akin po, masyado naman po tayong legalistic kung maghihintay pa tayo ng court case para lang ma-determine na 100% hindi nag-procure ang DepEd at zero ang nasa publishing industry. Kami po ang bumubuhat na aming mga manggagawa. Nasaan po ang puso ninyo? Sinasabi ninyo magbalikatan tayo, magtulungan tayo. Asan ang tulungan? Sinasabi po ninyo na let's balance this for public interest. Asan ang balance? 100% po yung nasa inyo. Zero kami. At isa pa po sa nakakalungkong na ibabalita ako sa inyo, maliban po sa na sinabi ni ni Sir Paolo Sibal kanina, eh ang DepEd ay gustong bilhin ang copyright ng textbooks. Ito po ay report din ni Attorney Buhayin sa kanyang letter. Uh, nandito po siya ngayon, nakikinig siya. Bakit po kailangan bilhin ng, text, ng DepEd ang copyright sa textbook? Ang duration po ng copyright ay lifetime of the author plus 50 years. Aanhin po ng DepEd itong ganitong kapangyarihan. 50 years. So nakakabagabag na balita po ito para sa akin. At ang panghuli po, sa, para sa akin po, ito yung legislative power. Ako po ay simpleng mamamayan lang ng Pilipinas, hindi po ako abogado. 
Pero malinaw po sa akin ang gumagawa ng batas sa Pilipinas ay ang Kongreso lamang. Yung pong ating upper house, ang Senate, yung ating lower house, ang ating House of Representatives. Pagka na-harmonize yung batas, isasubmit sa presidente para sa kanyang approval. On a limited scale, the president can create laws through executive orders, but they should be in line with existing Republic Acts. In the case of the Department Order of DepEd, the Department Order repealed a Republic Act. Saan po galing yung kapangyarihan ng DepEd? Mas magaling pa po sila sa Congress at sa Presidente. Nakakalungkot po ito dahil ang, ang aking pong ama ay isang guro. Nirerespeto ko po ang lahat ng mga guro. Pero sa nangyayari po sa ating mga guro na pinepwersa sila na gumawa ng mga module at, mag, at lumabag sa ating IP laws, sa, sa akin po ang tingin, ito po isang uri ng opresyon ng mga opisyal ng DepEd. At sino po ang dapat tumawag ng pansin sa DepEd? Ginawa ko po ito actually, Mr. Chair. Ako po ay madaldal na tao at makulit na tao. I know that you've been trying to, to coax me to speak even during the last, uh, the last uh, session. But I'm reserving my strength. So, sinubukan ko pong lapitan ng Intellectual Property Office of the Philippines. Napakaraming Zoom meetings. Alam po ni DDG Ted Pasqua ito. Alam ni Attorney, Ted, ni Attorney Emerson Cuyo ng Bureau of Copyright. Sino po ang pwede magsabi, magtawag sa pansin sa DepEd? Hindi po sila. Bakit? Dahil ang pinuno po ng DepEd ay secretary. Cabinet level po ang nakaupo doon. Ang head po ng IP office ay USEC. So wala po. Sumunod po ay nilapitan ko po ang head ng NBDB. Naiintindihan ko rin po na hindi nila pwedeng, hindi sila pwede maglabas ng statement. Ang kanila pong sinabi ay wala pong abogado sa aming uh, ranks. At wala rin, kulang din po ang budget ng NBDB para mag-hire ng lawyer. So yun po ay isang problema. So kaya po sabi ko dapat may magtawag ng bansin at may magsabi na teka lang, sumusobra na yata ito. So ang tanong ko po Mr. Chair, may kapangyarihan po ba ang committee ito na sabihin sa DepEd at tanungin sila kung saan galing ang kapangyarihan nila? na i-repeal sa pamamagitan ng department order ang isang existing Republic Act. Yun po ang aking unang tanong. At pangalawa, pwede po ba nilang i-recall itong department order na ito? Dahil hanggat hindi po nila ito nire-recall, sinasabi po ng DepEd na hindi na namin kailangang maihalal sa pwesto para maging mambabatas kasi pwede naman kaming gumawa ng batas sa pamamagitan ng department order. Ilalagay ko po ulit, Mr. Chair, ang aking sarili sa sa posisyon ng DepEd, doon po sa sinasabi ni Attorney Aris na licensing agreement namin. Naiintindihan ko po ang hesitation nila kung bakit hindi 100% na makapagsara ang aming licensing agreement. Bakit? Sapagkat kahit po ang mga miyembro namin ay award-winning authors, national artists, at uh, mga premyado at magagaling na mga profesor, eh meron pa po kaming hindi nakocover. Ito po yung mga author ng Orphan Works. At nalulungkot po ako dahil nung last na debate na, na nakikinig ako, ay sinabi po na isang mababatas na yung Orphan Works daw, ay yun yung inabando na ng mga author. Ako po ay nagsusulat. Meron po akong dalawang libro nung unang panahon ba. Kayo po ay nagsusulat. Lahat po ng kilala kong author ay hindi inaabando na ang kanilang isinulat. Nagkakaroon lang po ng mga pagkakataon na maaring namatay sila ng maaga o namatay sila na walang heirs. Katulad po ni Arturo Rotor. Si Arturo Rotor po ay sabay na tinapos ang medisina at music sa UP. Siya po ang best short story writer nung kanyang panahon. Nagi po siyang doktor at siya po ay nagserve sa PGH. Namatay po siya ng 1988. So required po yung kanyang mga isinulat. Ang, ang kanyang pong uh, copyright ay hanggang 2038 pa. Saan po kami hihingi ng permiso na matay na siya, na matay yung asawa niya at wala po silang anak? Yung po yung orphan works, isa lamang po ito, napakarami po nating mga orphan works. Kaya nga po ang proposed legislation namin ay sana pag inamend yung IP code ay isama yung extended collective license. Ano po ba yun? Kasi meron pong hindi, pag, hindi malinaw na paliwanag tungkol doon. Ang extended collective license po, ang basis po niyan ay yung collective bargaining agreement ng mga union workers. Dahil po merong freedom of association, hindi pwedeng pilitin yung kapwa worker na sumali kung ayaw sumali sa union. Pero 
kapag nanalo sa CBA, yung pong benepisyo ay umaabot sa mga non-members. So ito pong eskema ito ay inilagay sa collective management organizations na para po mabigyan ng ng uh, ng peace of mind yung mga end users ay may kapangyarihan silang gamitin ang akda dahil binigyan sila ng extended collective license ng ng batas so hindi na po sila may agam-agam pa na ay teka orphan works to hindi ko to pwedeng gamitin nasa batas na eh at malinaw din po sa isinabit namin Mr. Chair na na position paper sa inyong opisina noon pa at sa opisina ng ibang mga congressmen na sa extended collective license dahil ito po ay nasa batas na ay pwede kaming uh, pwede namin i-distribute din yung remuneration hindi lang sa mga member kundi dun sa mga malolocate namin na orphan works authors so meron na po kaming budget pang hanap sa kanila meron na rin pong uh, tawag dito system so ito po ay isang legal creation mula sa Scandinavia kung saan yung human rights is uh, very high ang respect for gender equality is very high sa Scandinavian countries po ay mataas ang respeto respeto sa copyright and human right ang narinig ko po yung isang congressman na nagsabi na ay magpangit siyang ano hindi hindi dapat siya extended collective license because it will violate the rights of, of, of authors para sa akin po, nakaka, nakakalungkot po marinig yun. Bakit? Kasi sa Scandinavian countries, hindi po sila nagpapasala ng, nagpapasara ng media network dahil lang sa galit yung presidente sa kanila. Hindi po, hindi po nangyayari sa kanila yun. So yung kanila pong legal creation ay sa tingin ko ay wise at makakatulong sa atin. At maliban po sa orphan works, it also can be extended to online works. Kaya po wala silang problema ngayon kahit nag-pandemic. Dahil nagagamit, hindi lang sa orphan works, kundi doon sa mga works online. Ang tawag nga po namin sa Denmark, sila po yung pinakamataas yung extended collective license ay sila po yung nasa copyright nirvana. Dahil respect, may respeto sa lahat. So, ang pangal, pangalawa po ay yung proposal namin doon sa free tuition law na sana, total na pag-usapan na rin naman po na merong uh, mag-allocate mag ng pondo para sa Uh, SUCs and LUCs sa pamamagitan ng free tuition law. Bakit hindi na lang po natin palitan yung May sa salitang shall? Para po yung mga SUCs and LUCs ay kumuha na ng license para po sa karapat may bigay yung karapat dapat na remuneration pati dun po sa ating mga uh, mga authors. So yung pong uh, yung po yung aming recommendation at yung pong amendment do sa RE8047 ay tatalakayin po ni Attorney Andrea Pasyon Flores. Maraming salamat po, um, Mr. Chair, sa panahon at sa pakikinig at sa mga miyembro ng committee. Thank you, E.D. Alvin. Um, so, si Andrea is going to present the RE8047 amendments. Um, Chair... Uh, Chair Toff, would you like me to present it now or would you like it in the agenda? There is a regulations. Okay. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Sige. Later okay. na lang siguro. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you. Um, so, siguro ma mahabang usapin itong IP, no? Maraming issues. I mean, offhand, I think kailangan um, yung gaya ng uh, sinabi ko kanina sa NDDB Uh, uh, no, sorry. Uh, I said it pala to uh, Ipofil. Um, Pag-aralan natin ng husto yung, um, yung proposal sa IP code kasi ongoing yung discussions and yun nga, parang right now the body is leaning towards um, not including ECL uh, but the voices that we've heard on the ECL proposal is coming from just one of the creative industries. Yun yung talagang pinaka na-highlight pero may impact din pala siya dito sa, sa publishing sector. So, um, Julie noted, let me synthesize muna everything that you've said, ED, um, para uh, we can argue for its restoration sa, sa committee um 
And then uh, mm -hmm. with regards to the issues on DepEd, Siguro will will set up a meeting. No, uh, although DepEd is here, and uh, I don't know if you're ready to respond to all of the points that were raised. Um, because if not, we can set up a separate meeting, para we can do a deep dive. Hello. And see what we can do moving forward. Um, Sige, Dep Ed Rowan. Would you like to respond? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, yes, po, uh, we would appreciate if a separate meeting would be uh, conducted for that purpose, as this, is, this entails uh, a lot of concerns and uh, various considerations. Then po. And uh, the involvement also from our SADEP Ed, because this involves various strands. Then po. Thank you, po. So who shall we coordinate that with? Siguro you said Tony O'Malley na lang. Yes, sir. Yes, Paul. Mm -mm. So Luis, let's let's set up a meeting between DepEd and all of the relevant um, bureaus, offices, and yes. then also Phil calls and Pepa. Definitely, para, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Para mapag-usapan natin point by point lahat ng mga nabanggit ni ED. Yes. Um, will that be all right with you, sir? Ed, our our friend e from Phil calls. Ed Alvin. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I can hear you, sir. Yeah. Would that be all right with you if we? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That would be fine. Separate meeting. Um. So, sino Thank sino you for arranging offices? that. Sino sino ba yung mga offices na kailangan nandun? Would you know Ed Alvin or? Uh, pwede niyo po isama na yung ano po uh, oh, IP Learning office uh, Bureau of Learning Resources ba yan? Yes sir, the Bureau of Learning Resources is headed by Attorney Aris Kawilan Okay O sige, o basta Luis ano na lang, yes, coordinate na lang natin with with yes, Mr. Tony, <laughs> lahat, ng, ah, lahat ng appropriate um, we, could, we could include as well Ched uh, just in case uh, I think uh, ito pong ano ni Sir Ryan uh, meron bang naglabas yun ba ng department order ang Ched E.D. Alvin uh, I would not know sir hindi, wala, hindi ko po siya uh, minamonitor uh, okay so wala naman ata silang issue sa Ched at the moment um, pero IPOFIL was mentioned, baka we can include them also. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Take note ko na lang po. And then maybe a DOJ representative para lang they can also take note of all the points. DOJ. Noted, Mr. Chair. All right. Sige. All right. Ako, siguro before we move on to the next topic, uh, well, definitely we'll take like a quick break. Um, but before we move on to the topic, uh, kung na-envision kung na natin yung isang vibrant creative economy dito sa Pilipinas, then we have to have a strong intellectual property regime. And tama si E.D. Alvin na there are only two ways by which creatives are able to earn through the professional fees that are given to them and also through remuneration by way of intellectual property. So if you take out intellectual property remuneration, that's like one half of their potential earnings that are lost uh, in the process. Diba? And remuneration is also a sustainability mechanism. So just because an author or a publisher is able to make a killing of a profit in the first sale. Doesn't mean it's going to last forever. No ubus din yan. So important na you have these sustainability mechanisms in place. And so definitely uh, we are with you, sir, and the stakeholders in uh, really ensuring that the intellectual property 
of our authors will be respected and by no less than the state that's the that's the foremost um, implementer of all the laws that are present so uh i think this needs a a, a separate meeting altogether but uh all hands on deck now and we'll invite more members to be present um and siguro some of the some of the team working on the ip code will will invite them na rin para they they're able to understand better um, all the all the reforms that you're proposing okay great so we'll move on. Uh, wait, before we move on, I think we need like a quick break, a three-minute break. So we'll resume at 5.23 um, with the last topic, which is on regulations affecting your industry. All right, thank you. See you at 5.23.
Right, it's actually 5.24, so perhaps we should resume. Um, so now we'll move on to the last topic, which is uh, other forms of regulations affecting the PPM industry um, and other concerns as well. So we have three presenters uh, from government and one from the private sector. We'll start with the DTI Board of Investment. We have Ms. Remedio Slim and then uh, DOJ State Council, Janeline Bilokura, if, you, if there's anything you wish to share. Um, and the third will be uh, NBDB um, Attorney Andrea Pachon Flores, and then the private sector through the UPMG um, and Barbie Atienza. So uh, DTI, BOI, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Yeah. So good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Remedio Slim, representing Director Angelita Arcelian of the BOI. So for this afternoon session, I will be providing you the highlights of the incentives being offered under the CREATE law, which may also be and may benefit the publishing and printing industries. Uh, just a brief background, the Philippine Board of Investments is the DTI's lead government agency responsible for industry promotion in the Philippines. So BOI takes the lead in the promotion of investments, assist Philippine and foreign investors to venture and prosper in desirable areas of economic activities, and also registers qualified activities under the relevant investment priorities plan, which is the interim strategic IPP under the CREATE law and administers incentives to compliant registered projects. Um, so there are different laws that are important when we consider the registration of the book publishing and printing with the BOI or any of the IPAs. So RA 8074, which is a development of the book publishing industry and RA 11534, or the Corporate Recovery Tax Incentives for Enterprises Act or CREATE which was signed by the president on March 26, 2021, and which took effect last April 11, 2021. So the effectivity of the IRR, which was signed by both the Secretary of Finance and the Secretary of Trade and Industry, took effect on June 26 of this year. The enactment of RA11534 has repealed the incentives provision of the charters of all investment promotion agencies. So all IPAs and other incentives administrating entities shall cease to grant incentives to registered activities based on their respective charters and shall commence compliance the provisions of the new Title 13 of the NIRC or the National Internal Revenue Code with respect to the grant of fiscal incentives. So CREATE covers all IPAs such as the BOI, Philippine Economic Zone Authority, Subic Bay Metropolitan Authority and Clark Development Corporation, among others. So under CREATE, IPA shall maintain their function under the laws governing them, except to the extent modified by CREATE. So under CREATE, the reduction of corporate income tax of firms from 30% to 25% effective July 1, 2020 applies even if the firm is not registered with any of the IPA. However, for those domestic corporations registered under any of the IPAs and with net taxable income not exceeding 5 million and with total assets excluding land not exceeding 100 million, the corporate income tax rate would further be reduced to 20%. We also have an enhanced incentive package for qualified projects, which we will be discussing in the succeeding slides. Um, part of what was amended by CREATE under the laws or under the charter of IPAs is the approval or disapproval of incentives, where projects with investment capital of 1 billion and below will be made by the respective IPA where the firm applied, while the investment capital of more than 1 billion will be approved or disapproved by the FIRB. Um, so before a firm may be able to avail of incentives under CREATE, 
um, the firm's activity must first be registered with any of the investment promotion agencies. So what are the qualifications in order to be registered under CREATE? First, um, the activity must be covered by the Strategic Investment Priorities Plan or SIPP and must satisfy the qualifications set forth therein. Um, pursuant to FIRB Resolution Number 5-21 dated April 14, 2021, the 2020 IPP serves as the transitional SIPP pending the issuance of the newly formulated SIPP under CREATE Act such that projects or activities that will qualify under the transitional SIPP shall at the minimum be, re be registered under Tier 1 without prejudice to an upgrade if qualified under the newly formulated SIPP. Um, so in addition, I would also like to highlight item number two, which states that if the project or activity in which it is engaged or proposes to engage in the nationalized in is nationalized by the constitution or by law, the ownership requirement of the constitution and or such law has been complied with. So in the case of the book publishing and printing industry, we understand that it is considered under mass media. Therefore, unless there will be a law that will amend this, no foreign ownership will be allowed when they apply with the BOI or any of the IPAs. As to the method of filing, um, the requirement is supposed to be filed electronically in a system that is prescribed and has been created by the FIRB. Um, to date, the electronic filing system is still being processed. So in case the system is not available, such application may also be filed manually, accomplished in two copies and sworn to before a notary public. Um, as you can see here, um, publication or printing of books and textbook is included in the mandatory list or special law which contains areas or activities where the inclusion in the IPP and grant of incentives is mandated by law. Uh, so the following are the qualifications for registration of publication or printing books or textbook under RA number 8074. So I will no longer be discussing each one of them. However, I would like to highlight that application for registration must be accompanied by an endorsement from the NBDB. Um, under the CREATE, uh, all IPAs are adopting a uniform policy and offering a single menu of incentives. So these are actually fixed menu of incentives under CREATE, which may be available uh, to qualified book publishing industry. So for qualified export enterprises, a uh, firm will be entitled with four to seven years of ITH. The option to either avail of the a special corporate income tax or SIT or enhanced deduction after the ITH period shall be exercised by the registered enterprise at the time of application for registration. So such option shall be irrevocable. So meaning if the firm will apply in BOI, part of the application document shall state whether the firm will go for the SIT or the ED or enhanced deduction which will eventually be reflected on the terms of conditions in the certificate of registration of the firm registered to the investment promotion agency. So for the duration of the availment of incentives, the firm won't be allowed to switch its availed incentives. Domestic enterprises, on the other hand, may be granted an ITH for four to seven years, followed by enhanced deduction for five years. So other incentives available for all industries are duty exemption on importation of capital equipment, raw materials, spare parts or accessories, and VAT exemption on importation and zero rating on local purchases. So the list of our enhanced deduction is found in the blue part of the slide. Uh, the period of availment of the income tax-based incentive shall commence from the actual start of commercial operation with the registered business enterprise availing of the tax incentives within three years from the date of registration, unless otherwise provided in the SIPP and its corresponding guidelines. Um, in the previous slide, I mentioned that export enterprises shall be entitled to 5% as SIT based on gross income earned. 
So in lieu of all the national and local taxes. So for the gross income earned, only the following items listed on letters A to K shall be considered as direct cost for purposes of computing the total 5% tax rate imposed. Um, these are the breakdown of the enhanced deduction I, I showed a while ago, which I mentioned in slide eight. So in the interest of time, I will no longer be enumerating each one of them. Um, so for this slide, a list of items which are not covered for deduction under training expense is also listed in order to ensure that only eligible training expenses are covered. And since the activity under book publishing may entail higher power costs, firms may benefit from the additional deduction of power expense, which is equal to 50% of the total power cost utilized for the registered project or activity. Um, so the SIPP shall provide the requirements and conditions for a registered project or activity to be granted the enhanced deduction from the start of commercial operation, provided that the Secretary of Finance, upon recommendation of the Commissioner of Internal Revenue, shall issue revenue re rules and regulations on the process to avail of the enhanced deductions. Um, so for additional incentives, registered enterprise that fully relocate outside of the NCR will be entitled to an additional three years of ITH. So for those registered enterprise that locate in areas recovering from disasters or conflicts will be entitled to an additional two years of ITH. Um, as mentioned in my previous slide, um, the 2020 IPP serves as a transitional SIPP pending the issuance of the newly formulated SIPP under the CREATE Act, such that projects or activities that will qualify under the transitional SIPP shall at the minimum be registered under Tier 1 without prejudice to an upgrade if qualified under the newly formulated SIPP. So maybe you would ask, what would be the relevance if a project or activity will be upgraded, upgraded from Tier 1 to let's say tier two or tier three. Um, here you can see, uh, dito sa matrix na to, uh, that the higher tier number has longer ITH entitlement. So for example, tier one for, the, for exporters um, located in the national capital region has four-year ITH and 10-year uh, either ED or SIT. Whereas in tier two and tier three, the length of ITH period is longer. So the same also, uh, when you can see the farther you are from the national capital region, let's say for um, line two, metropolitan areas or areas contiguous to adjacent to the national capital region has five year ITH period as compared to those located in the NCR. So to sum up, the higher the tier and the location of the industry that is farther to the NCR will have longer ITH period for the availment. Okay, so thank you. That's all. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ma'am Remedios. Um, now we'll take up NBDB, uh, or rather, sorry, DOJ. Janeline, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, considering the constraint of time when the invitation was received, um, my presentation has not uh, been granted yet of uh, an official imprimatur. So nevertheless, I will share what is on our or on my initial um, uh, synthesis on the subject matter. So when as regards um, printing and publishing um, industry, um, we shall going to look at our basic or primordial um, codification, the Philippine Constitution, um, considering that um, this uh, matter concerns, um, well, education materials and others, um, we look into the uh, state policies, and one of which is the state's priority uh, to uh, 
foster education um, under Article 2, Section 17 of our Philippine Constitution. At the same time, we look also into the protection conferred by our Constitution on the rights of our property owners or intellectual property owners. And we look into the uh, Bill of Rights, and that is on uh, no person shall be deprived of his or her property uh, without due process of law. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we encountered before some issues on uh, taxation um, over our uh, books or imported uh, publications. So we look into also on our international instrument of which the Philippines is a signatory, uh, the 1950 Florence Agreement on the Importation of Educational and or scientific and cultural materials, of which as a state party, the Philippines is enjoined to undertake uh, not applying custom duties and other charges uh, when importing or in relation to importation of books, publications, and documents, um, educational, scientific, and cultural materials, and others. Um, additionally, um there was uh, a clarification before um by the uh, uh department of finance as well as the department of customs where they have issued uh, some instruments or orders for dfa uh, sorry for the department of finance it was a department order 57-2011, whereby affirming that some import or imported uh, books, whether for commercial or personal use, except when they are for advertising purposes, are exempt from um, value added tax. And for the Bureau of Customs, they have issued uh, also affirmation on the same by virtue of its custom memorandum order 10-2012, whereby affirming that uh, imported books, whether commercial or for personal use, so long as they are not for advertising purposes, are exempt from uh, customs duties. Now for the latest one in our uh, CREATE law, uh, the amendment uh, was made on section 109, one uh, paragraph R, whereby providing that the sale, importation, printing, or publication of books and any newspaper, magazine, journal, review bulletin, or any such educational reading material covered by the UNESCO agreement on the importation of educational, scientific, and cultural materials, including the digital or electronic format thereof shall be also exempt from uh, VAT or considered transaction exempt from VAT. So a, there was uh, an issue before uh, regarding the whether or not the ebook are VATable or not. Maybe this provision can say something on the matter. And uh, well, uh, for the uh, intellectual property rights, uh, the discussion may be made by IPO. So I move forward on the latest uh, rules of procedure for intellectual property case, uh, rights or cases um, by, released by the Supreme Court. The recent one is on 2020. Um, for litigation purposes, um, the Supreme Court has considered the rising number of IP rights uh, cases, so it released AM number 10-3-10-SC, whereby uh, the number of days to render judgment has been set at 60 calendar days, which is shorter from the 90 calendar days to promulgate decisions in regular cases. I think that is it for now as for our initial um, synthesis and maybe if we will find another relevant information on the matter, we may be including the same in the 
uh, position paper, which we may be submitting uh, as the need arises or as requested earlier. So, Mr. Chair, I think that would be all on my end as of this uh, conference. Thank you, Ma'am Janeline. Uh, we'll now proceed to the NBDB with Attorney Andrea. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, again, um, members of the committee and colleagues in business. Uh, I'm uh, the consultant of the National Book Development Board as regards the, um, the creation of their roadmap for the book publishing industry. Uh, I will be presenting two things uh, today. Um, one is the publishing SWOT, which is um, the product of um, two workshops with stakeholders and um, uh, an initial list of uh, stakeholders um, publishing agenda. May I ask if you can see what's on my screen? Yes. Um, uh, if we can begin with the strengths. Um, uh, the industry is full of talented people. So from creators to publishing professionals, and um, they have a solid commitment to the industry. Uh, uh, books are a very emotional product. You know? So when uh, most profession, mo most publishing professionals are committed because they love the product. So a lot of them took pay cuts uh, during the pandemic or decreased, uh, allowed that their work days to be decreased to help companies uh, they're working for cope with the pandemic. It doesn't mean that decreased work days mean um, Decrease workloads. As a matter of fact, a lot of them are, were saying that uh, workloads were actually increased, though they took uh, sub substantial pay cuts. Um, another strength is the publishers have a wide network. They are also very vocal and they have um, uh, always found a way to lobby their, for their interests. Uh, they because they are well organized, um, many industry and author organizations have traditionally looked out for the stakeholders' interests, such as the BDAP, PEPA, the PBI, the UMPIL, the Union ng mga Manunulat sa Pilipinas, and the Philippine Pen, and many others. There's another one, the Freelance Authors Group, which is an online group of uh, freelance authors. Uh, they have a CMO, the Filipinas Copyright Licensing Society, and which is a very vocal. Uh, um, organization active uh, in, in, in behalf of the stakeholders. Their weaknesses, uh, especially during the pandemic, is a heavy reliance on the traditional print supply chain. So number one, publishers who relied heavily on physical and print distribution found that inventory caught in physical stores also meant a lot of money tied up in stores that were closed for the duration of the pandemic. Publishers have a set network to, dis to distribute their print books, and you will see this in the value chain that we will be submitting um, with a roadmap, including book fairs, schools, uh, literary festivals, all of which were stopped during the pandemic. Um, this also meant a tremendous loss in sales. There were a lot of um, inventory Im imported uh, in time for the book fair uh, in 2020, um, but those books were not sold during the Manila International Book Fair. So they languished in warehouses and with nowhere to, dis to distribute them. So money, uh, money invested in this uh, inventory is tied up. Uh, and because a lot of um, schools and a lot of the consumers want um, current copyrighted books, which means mostly they will purchase within a five-year period. So the the, the longer these books languish in the warehouses, they are running out of time to sell these books. So many publishers had to push back also a lot of their publication dates you know, given the uncertainty of the situation, meaning um, there are huge drops in sales uh, for also for printing corporations who relied on the usual rush for printing jobs during seasonal months, such as back to school and book festivals. Uh, it also triggered a dominant effect no, on the income of authors whose royalties are understandably also lowered given the drop in sales of their books. So pushback releases also brought uncertainty to marketing efforts, further putting a downward pressure on, on sales. So unlike other countries, the support for micro and small enterprises, especially maybe of the global North countries, are very strong. 
Uh, but of course, it's uh, understandably possibly lacking uh, here. So the burden of having to support employees throughout the period of the pandemic, uh, even though there's a sales down, downturn, they, these have fallen to, to business owners. Um, also, publishers have um, uh, recognized a lot of opportunities because of, um, uh, of uh, technology, one. Uh, there is a recognition that uh, technolo technological infrastructure of, a con of our country is not yet at its best now, but will slowly be improved in the near future. Um, uh, we are we're glad to hear uh, about the, the DICT presentation and, and all they have to offer for the country. But also, um, it also forces them to pivot to digital selling and examine uh, various digital formats. So this, this does not just necessarily be um, our ebooks. They include audio, hybrid versions, and of course, um, uh, AR books that are, are already uh, coming out in the market in other countries. So the accelerated shift to e-commerce allowed also, also allowed publishers to, to sell their books in, on online platforms. No? This means the deep discounts paid to brick and mortar booksellers are now passed on to consumers. Now, this helps make books more affordable, more affordable. It also accelerated the payment turnarounds now for a lot of publishers as e-commerce sites pay faster than physical stores, which accept mostly consignment arrangements from local publishers. Uh, the presence of e-commerce sites where publishers can sell their books also translated to more sales during the pandemic. So the democratization of the distribution of books means that publishers need not only rely on bookstore chains to accept their books on consignment to reach consumers. Now they have, they have a vast array of titles that can be contained in the infinite number of shelves made available to consumers to browse through these e-commerce e platforms. Publishers are also slowly learning to engage with consumers through social media platforms. Even traditionally conservative publishers like um, academic presses are learning to use social media to reach consumers. So they no longer rely exclusively on the library market to sell their books, but they've learned to engage through B2C um, efforts to find customers. So academic and scholarly authors are also um, individually learning to be more tech savvy, tech savvy uh, writing regularly on social media platforms to keep their readers engaged. They also found a lot of opportunities from social distancing. Publishers are now enjoying access to consumers, including the newfound ability to service consumers nationwide through ubiquitous logistics companies that are able to deliver books to the farthest consumer. Uh, the need for social dis distancing, uh, which resulted in the shutting down of malls, strengthened contactless sales of books. This also made consumers more open to paying for shipping costs, giving them more confidence, we feel, to pay for goods online with credit cards, back transfers, GCash, and other payment walls. COD options are also helping customers or consumers who are um, distrustful of online payments. And so they, uh, all these are helping uh, small business owners reach out to their, to their customers. Uh, more people are also able to attend events as most events have been virtual. Uh, they, 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 uh, they multiply their, their audience now and also because having to, not having to deal with traffic and uh, all, all sorts of things that we used to do, um, that we used to have before. Um, Readers spend more time online, making them easy to reach and communicate with. with authors trying to build an audience, this is a great opportunity. And um, the focus shift you know, from physical and face-to-face -face, um, has made it easier to find more authors from the regions. The so regional presses have been able to find a presence online uh, selling uh, so you also have had um, digital publish publishers do this uh, from the regions, and they've slowly learned to compete with Manila-based publishers, uh, which hopefully encourages more publishing from the regions. Um, on content, uh, ebook and audiobook production, including blended formats, are increasing. Other formats for marketing, such as podcasts, to push books and encourage engagement, are all slowly finding their way, you know, uh, even with uh, Philippine publishers. There's a rise also in the sales of short form content, uh, short reads that can be read online. 
Um, work from home arrangements have also resulted in an increase in demand for cookbooks, self-help materials, home learning materials, children's activity books, and dystopian novels. There's also an increase in demand for inspirational books and books on mental health. Uh, hobbies, concerns, and issues brought about by the pandemic have become good book subjects. Uh, now more than ever, um, as we know, teachers are also becoming authors or content creators, finding themselves having to rely on the vast amount of content available on the internet. Uh, but however, there are a lot of threats as well, uh, also previously mentioned. Um, many Filipinos have lost their jobs, which uh, means a decline in the purchasing power and decline in the purchase of books. Now we do have the numbers for those. Uh, uh, the un unemployment rate, so I think at 8.2% um, uh, as, uh, as of 2020. So there is a huge drop, now, that's as of 2021. There's a huge drop in enrollment in the private schools, as was already mentioned, no? as a result of parents losing their jobs. Many students seem to have migrated to the public schools, many private school students, that is, or have chosen to stay out of uh, traditional schooling altogether if you can't find them there. So this, um, they're probably doing um, homeschooling. And this has resulted in, a, in lower sales of textbooks uh, for, for, for private schools. Many private schools have also closed due to low enrollment or the inability to adapt to distance learning. Uh, so also mentioned before, Dep Ed Order Number 18, um, which um, made teacher where teachers were told to make their own modules uh, to be distributed to students highly affected the publishing industry. Um, Infringement because of Dep Ed Order Number 18 was rampant. All the teachers who were burdened with making modules relied on published textbooks for their content. So there were cancellation of purchase orders from many of our publishers, with many schools merely asking for samples from which to copy their modules. There's a low, it seems that there seems to be a low level of copyright law knowledge um, coupled with some kind of um, with government seemingly, seemingly acting as an enabler no? through Dep Ed Order Number 18 and the infringement of textbooks for teachers uh, in, in their creation of SLMs. Um, the MELC, it was also, also mentioned on the most essential learning competencies imposed by the Dep Ed may have or may result in half-baked um, graduates in the future. So where in you, our current curriculum only uh, focuses on functional literacy, while the well, international exams such as TIMS and PISA um, measure mastery. So this is um, compounded with the debit requirements to only do MELC curriculum for social distancing, um, which might um, uh, jeopardize the employability of our future workforce. Uh, the improvement of technological inf infrastructure may seem as a threat by some who are not digitally savvy, some publishers, or would look at the internet as a tool for massive infringement. Uh, case in point are the following House bills in Congress calling for mandatory and free use of content. So these House bills were already mentioned. No? One of them is uh, 7946. Um, which provides for the scanning and conversion of public school textbooks into ebooks and other digital format. Uh, and there's a related bill, it's HB 802, 8020, you know, um, uh, which is also providing for the scanning and conversion of public school textbooks into ebooks and other, other digital formats. I also like to um, bring the attention to House Bill 7568, which is an act digitalizing all books necessary for public education and establishing the Philippine Online Library, providing funds therefore and other purposes. So these three bills seem to um, allow for um, a massive uh, scanning of 100% of the content uh, into online digital portals without permission or remuneration. Uh, there are threats to trade books as well. Um, uh, because of uh, uh, the problem of discoverability, perhaps lesser known or debut authors may be less likely to find publishers willing to risk money on them at this time. More money will probably be reserved for commercial titles 
for authors who are more bankable to keep sales up. Printing and reprinting of books take more time um, and are more expensive because of delays in the process due to the lockdowns or various quarantine procedures. And these delays result in missed opportunities and added costs, as well as higher prices. There are delays in the shipments of books to prioritize more essential items during periods of quarantine, uh, which result in slower sales and missed opportunities. And we also already talked about piracy and infringement. Um, uh, the DTI mentioned the uh, big bad wolf, no? the infiltration of the Malaysian company that um, administers the big bad wolf into the market. No? Uh, it's very cheap and most of the books there are sold below cost because they're usually remainders. So when they're remainders, um, there are no royalties that go back to the authors. No? So whatever you pay for there, that's why it's cheap. No payment goes through the value chain anymore. Uh, so that's why it's it's very cheap, you know, the books there. And so the, the perception that books should be cheap uh, devalues you know, the, the books. You know? So um, to compete with that, publishers have to have to have to drop their prices to be competitive. You know? And and uh, it's hard, it's hard to be competitive, you know, um, given a, our, 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 our local um, environment. Okay. Uh, there, because of digital also, no, competition for time spent on books is very high, given the presence of streaming apps like Netflix, Amazon Prime, and others, as well as TikTok, Twitch, YouTube, and even other different online games. So it's, it's, uh, it's um, uh, a contest for, for, for market eyes. Uh, and the work from home arrangements or hybrid arrangements have an effect on the efficiency of the production of books you know, as well as uh, on their sales. The production is slower now because um, people are at home. So given all that, uh, this is an initial list of the legislative agenda. Uh, so the, the agenda is based on the suggested aims of legislation on core indicators of the UNESCO Global Report. No? So these are a few of them. Uh, the introduction of national cultural policies that support creation, production, and distribution, and access to diverse cultural services in support of the various elements within the value chain of the industry. Uh, an investment in creativity, which is the first stage of the value chain. Data collection and sharing for monitoring and policy making purposes and inclusion, inclusion of multiple government agencies in policy making. And like we're doing now, civil society collaboration and policy innovation and the implementation of government programs to serve the public interest. So um, based on that, one of the goals, Anna, is to have a Filipino culture-centric educational system and the policy making decisions of the DepEd. Although I think it's known that um, being uh, uh, culture centric is in the law and no? the education act um, i think uh, one of the 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 examples that they, they want to show uh, that it's not quite that way is deped order number 35 of uh, 2019 in their procurement of the self the supplementary learning resources uh, if you look at that list it seems like 70 percent of the books named there are Imported materials, no, which not only is contrary to a cultural centric learn to cultural centric learning, but also contributes to trade imbalance in books. No, it was mentioned that the imbalance is twenty four to one. So, um, because of the large ability of the DepEd to procure these books, if seventy percent of those in the SR SLR list are imported, and that certainly contributes to the trade imbalance in this industry. Um, in a lot of the countries in um, uh, in the world, uh, there is some kind of quota for local material, no? uh, especially in public service media and any content aimed at children. Uh, that UNESCO reports points to 90 countries with an average quota of 25.8% local. But for children, they're recommending 50%. So if there is a quota like that, 
this would encourage domestic production of content and investment in creators to produce local content and encouragement for co-production schemes with foreign entities if foreign input is necessary, uh, an intensif intensification of capacity building in the regions through creative-centric schools, perhaps, and the creation of financial incentives and easier licensing of content for use in the regions if content in the regions is not yet available. Um, we'd like to push for an investment in creators. So in the value chains for both trade and textbooks, many of the creators are not part of the formal publishing business. Um, they're freelancers, you know, as most creatives are, or are in other professions, not necessarily creative, but they do creative work on the side. So rarely do their work uh, on, their, on their creative output. Would, they're not usually full-time, nor they are actually um, uh, remunerated well you know, for creative output. So um, perhaps the encouragement of grant mechanisms for authors and incentives for publishers to translate content into regional languages despite low demand in the regions might be considered. Um, one of the highest uh, ISBN uh, producers in the ASEAN is Thailand with over 9,000 ISBNs you know, compared to our around 6,000 ISBNs in the Philippines. 40% of those ISBNs are solely for translation. So that pushes the, num the production, local production tremendously. And we'd like to ask for the adoption of local and regional procurement rather than centralized procurement by the DepEd for its books and learning resources to encourage more culturally diverse content and local production of content uh, as further as we would be further discussing. Um, okay, so within Republic Act 8047, uh, these are a few of our, a few of the, the amendments that we'd like to push. Number one is the updating of the definition of a book to future-proof the book and not have I'm sorry to have to mention the debit again, for example, call um, self-learning modules non-books because they're less than 48 pages. So, so publishers feel that there was a circumvention of RA 847 when Department Order 18 mandated the creation of SLMs to be less than 48 pages. When they sourced the SLMs from publishers, they tried to dissuade, also dissuade publishers from putting their ISBNs on their SLMs uh, in, in contradiction to the proprietary, proprietary, proprietary nature of, of these books. No? Uh, um, currently in RA 847, registration of the NBDB is voluntary. Uh, so this is, this is very difficult, no? even in the, in the uh, um, production of the roadmap. So we'd like to suggest mandatory registration or a sharing of data with other government agencies of companies, individuals, and book publishers, sell, uh, sellers, printers, et cetera, with the NBDB. Um, we, are, we are made aware that uh, there is a central business portal um, that uh, could be tapped and perhaps the NBDB registration because it's voluntary, it does not really give uh, the full picture of how the industry looks like. It might be made to share in that data with other government agencies to help bridge information gaps needed for policy creation. And the corollary request to this, um, and it has been discussed over the years, is the suitability of the NBDB to be placed under the DTI rather than the DEP-ED for it to be able to respond more to the industry's needs. Um, there seems to be perhaps a seemingly nepotistic relationship that's hard if it's, it, it just feels hard to be talking to someone who you might be dependent on on your budget, for example. Um, so that has been uh, discussed a lot over the years um, by the industry. And it has again been mentioned on the inclusion of, man, of um, the use by DEP and of NPDB's evaluation tools for textbooks and SLR procurements you know, to, to promote the use of local content in the public schools and transparency in the evaluation process. I'm not sure if this is a big ask. You know. uh, perhaps um, uh, the harmonization of R847 on a specifically provision sections 10 and 11 on decentralized procurement with RA 9184 
um, exempting some activities from the single largest completed contract on the current 50% of the approved budget costs to promote the procurement of government or debt and perhaps from micro and small enterprise publishers. No? And especially this might this may encourage regional procurement of books um, and encourage creation in the regions. Uh, there, we'd also like to include the provision of uh, government procurement to make use of the national, the current um, project of the NBDB, the National Book Database, database um, for the procurement of books because it's transparent, um, it has complete information, and it's easy. Uh, because we're an archipelago, um, perhaps uh, tax and duty free incentives for logistics might be uh, uh, considered uh, uh, to um, for shipments of books uh, locally and internet and from from international or, or from imports. Uh, okay, um, so I think. I've mentioned this, the amendment of RE984, uh, uh, volume five um, for acquisitions from the lowest bid requirement. Because uh, the publishing industry, book publishing industry is um, largely a micro and small uh, enterprise. So you have very few publishers who are able to, to bid with a debt ed um, given this uh, requirement. Um, it was already mentioned, uh, the IP codes um, amendment uh, amendments, um, if uh, extended collective licensing be, be put back on the table uh, to recognize the rights of orphan works um, uh, in an inclusion of uh, copyright and the power to take, take down um, uh, uh, infringed work. Um, and and like like was what was already said, no, uh, the, there is a call to um, against the mandatory digitization and public access of debt and approved books as proposed by these House bills and Senate bills uh, for being unconstitutional. And that's about it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Attorney Andrea. Uh, you know, we'll need a copy of all these presentations uh, that have been shared so far, so we can synthesize further. So kindly just submit to the Comsec, and then Comsec, if you could kindly um, uh, cascade to all the members, I'll, I'll I'll personally need it prior to the meeting that we'll have between DepEd and the publishing sector, um, as well as copies of the two department orders that were mentioned. I already have the compilation, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, regarding the presentation. Thank Thanks. You. To um, now we'll move on to the last presenter, which is UPMG through Barbie. Barbie, you have the floor. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, and ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you for this privilege of presenting to you uh, as the uh, grand finale for, for today's hearing. Save the uh, first for last. First, I'd like to give a, a background of UPMG for everybody's um, uh, information. A little background about the print media, uh, where it's coming from, where we are now, and what, uh, what our situation is, and which, what, in what way we will, be, we will be able to solicit help by form of uh, legislation. Uh, so the UPMG is the United Print Media Group. I'm Barbie Atienza. I'm the president of the association. It's an association of um, all the major publication companies in the Philippines. We have uh, 32 member companies uh, claiming more than 100 titles. Um, these are some of the titles that we represent at UPMG. Now, uh, it was founded in 2001. Earlier, there was a, uh, there was a, uh, there were different forms of organizations which merged into this current setup. We have uh, publication companies, broadsheets, tabloids, magazines, and books in the association. Um, now going to the print media, print, the print media as a, just as a simple background is maybe a, a, an industry that is a tale as old as time. It, it basically started when, when the 
paper as we know it now after papyrus was invented in China in 105 AD. And then when mechanized printing was invented in Germany, um, it has a purveyor, the messenger of different kinds of news and information from royal decrees and orders to town talks, uh, theatres, uh, news about ends of war, deaths, etc. It was also a, it has also been a carrier of announcements, classified ads, advertising to boost sales efforts, notices, and of course political campaigns as uh, we're, we're getting into now. It's uh, basically a medium where we capture history as it happens. No? That's a, a print media. It keeps people informed. That's a mission that we have always, providing them with accurate, reliable, and timely news and information, where we also take um, uh, keep sacred the highest levels of responsible journalism. We provide news and information on areas of global news, national news, provincial, local, entertainment, lifestyle, sports, science, technology, health, and uh, what have you. Um, we are challenged all the time. Even before this present situation, we have faced uh, threats where a lot of our journalists have, have been, um, whose life have been endangered and even taken uh, in the past. We have faced typhoons, earthquakes, floods, natural, uh, natural calamities, even crimes, of course, when it's, it's happening, we have to be there. The wars, of course, the current pandemic, that despite the threat of COVID-19, our people are there uh, still pursuing and uh, uh, carrying out the mission that we have for ourselves. Fast forward to today, today's challenges involve basically business viability. With the emergence of digital, uh, we have been affected quite significantly. However, on the other hand, as early as 15 years ago, we have resolved the digital is not something that we look as threat, but if we look at it as a new frontier and a new uh, opportunity for expansion on how we can deliver our, our content, which is our main product. Uh, we have less advertisers. Readership uh, count is, is threatened. Um, and of course, uh, the, the main bulk of the business viability problems that we are facing now is the cost of production or the cost of business uh, involving raw materials, utilities, labor costs, taxes, and inflation. And in other words, in short, this is an industry, a vital industry, very important industry. And I was glad to hear the chairman um, utter earlier that can you imagine a society without newspapers? Well, uh, it's something that's uh, a dreadful scenario. But at present time, it is easy to admit that this is an industry that uh, definitely needs a lot of help. And to be uh, more specific about it, um, from a much longer list, we cut it down to present it to this committee on um, from a, a very long, long, much longer wish list. We thought about the most specific, most important, most crucial, most urgent, and most doable, doable and realistic. So we cut it down to basically three points. Mr. Chairman, one is we're looking at um, looking at legislation that would provide for us VAT exemption in paper and ink, which are the basic raw materials that we have. And also possibly a VAT exemption for our advertisers. Now, the rationale for this is that one, for the paper and ink, the prices have been skyrocketing for the last five to 10 years. They've been going up by an average of about anywhere from seven to 15% annually. This is something that we acknowledge is beyond the control not only of us, but even our suppliers. There's a global uh, phenomenon on this, that it's not, it's not only happening in the Philippines, whether it's uh, 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 sourced from, from foreign suppliers or the local suppliers, prices have really been going up. And we accept that it's something that's, uh, that's really beyond the control even probably of our, of our own state. Ironically, uh, because the prices are going up, 
the circulation or the production of our newspapers, our tabloids and magazines have been going down. So there is a decreased demand. But still, even with the decreased demand, what follows is the manufacturers here and abroad have also less production. And then what happens is it results into escalating prices for paper as well as in ink. Um, what it, what it, uh, this actually shows one example, a major uh, publication company in the Philippines whose uh, purchase of paper has decreased quite dramatically the last five years. From 2017, with 16.8 million worth of paper, it is now down in 2021. Of course, uh, one factor would be the current pandemic. It's now down to 1.2 million on, uh, on, for, the, for this year to date. And in imported products or imported paper, it's down from 8 million in 2017 to basically 504,000 of US dollars for this year. And consequently, what happens is with the decrease of the, the orders, it also it actually um, is an indication of how our own circulation or the number of copies that we produce have dramatically decreased. Now, what are the effects of this decreased circulation or publication? Now we have less, people have less access and because they have less access to newspapers, the consciousness, the awareness of what's happening around are definitely affected. And because of our inability to reach more people with our content, it gives way to the proliferation of fake news. Because, you know, one time, I was speaking before a group of students in Baguio and one of, during the open forum, one of the students asked me, uh, how, do we, how do we verify if a piece of information on social media is uh, fake news, legit or fake news? And I said, you check out your mainstream media organization, most of which are already on online. If you don't want to read the paper, check it online. But again, um, the way to check it is actually also to counter, to, to cross-check it with the, hard, with the hard copy. And with less copies in the circulation, that becomes a problem. No? Um, and also uh, with less publication, um, there is also a, a uh, palpable uh, decline in the way journalism is practiced, in the way, in the level of journalism, professional and responsible journalism is concerned. It also further diminishes the youth's interest in reading as well as in developing their writing skills. If we are able to acquire or the, if we are able to um, convince the committee to help us in pushing for that, that exemption, and so therefore bringing down the cost of raw material, grow, grow over pricing, which is be under control. Uh, on the contrary, the imposition of the value-added tax is not. So maybe that makes it more doable, more realistic. The raw materials comprise about 40% of our total production cost. And with a 12% uh, decrease uh, with the absence of the VAT on our purchase of paper and ink, there will be a savings of about 5% in the total cost of production. And at the present state, we feel that this is a very big, very huge help, a resuscitatory intervention that we, we, we do need very much at this time. This, this will also turn out to be a minimal impact on government revenues, not much loss, but a lot of help to our industry. The other side of VAT exemption is VAT exemption for advertisers. Advertisers have, uh, well, they're also undergoing a lot of business reversals. But some marketing gurus would always say, when in crisis, it's even more compelling for businesses to advertise. They have a, a well, businesses have a wide range of choices to advertise in as medium. There's TV, there's radio, there's out of home, there's digital, and of course there's print. But um, now under these circumstances, Decisions are more price sensitive. We strive to market more and sell more. However, uh, we feel that there's a lot of help 
if we are able to reduce uh, the cost for advertisers as far as the purchase of uh, advertising spaces are concerned. Uh, this means, uh, well, print advertising has been on a st steady decline. Karina, there was also a question. Uh, I also asked uh, one of the marketing companies that uh, uh, do regular surveys. The to uh, Mr. Chairman, the total spend in advertising as far as last year was concerned is a to for the Philippines is a total of 200 billion pesos worth. This is on uh, published rock rate. So realistically, it should reduce, it should redound down to about 50 to 75 percent of that. So total sales should be about anywhere from 100 to 150 billion. Now, sad state of it is that in the print media, we are now reduced to 1% of the total pie. So we're looking at a 1 billion peso advertising share of the pie in spending. And there are at least 50 players in the field. And that is the pie that we are uh, dividing, dividing among ourselves. The effects of less advertising is it could result into company shutdowns. Company shutdowns result into layoffs, retrenchments, and higher unemployment. This will also result into displaced creative workers, including writers, printers, layout artists, and graphic artists. There is a diminished, of course, this is the this is the end game. If we will be weakened by the realities of life, there's a diminished source of news and information and less channels of communication crucial to any society. The impact of a VAT exemption is one is there's increased competitiveness as far as the print media industry is concerned. There will be more companies that will be more viable, more income for the companies and the employees, which, we said, which would be, which would be down, down to additional boost to the overall state of the economy. And then there will be a revived and more robust fourth estate which we know very well is vital to a preservation of a democratic society. The second is an income tax reduction and tax assistance package. The tax reduction, we know that uh, the CREATE law has reduced corporate income taxes from 30 to 25% this year. Of course, this is spurred by the pandemic. The print media industry wanting to survive, wanting to hold on to our sworn, uh, sworn dedication to provide the public with a service that it deserves has been in a disaster even before the pandemic. It has already been in dire need of oxygen. This is the ayuda that we are uh, seeking for. We've been seeking for this in the last few years. Now, thank you for this opportunity to bringing it to the table for a possibility of realizing that dream. In order to salvage a crucial and um, critical industry playing a vital role in society, we ask the government, we ask the legislation to help us in the survival mode. And we propose a further reduction of the regular corporate income tax from 25 to 15%. Second part of the tax is the tax assistance during or a tax holiday during times of, uh, of disasters, not only the pandemic, but also uh, calamities during the time of crisis. Uh, this is not uncommon worldwide. There have been practices or there have been examples that have been set already, first in the first world countries like the USA, Canada, and France. But lately I've also gathered that in Singapore, some of the major publication companies have already come, have uh, really sought the, the help, the assistance, and the government, the Singapore government, has come to their rescue of remodeling their, their business setup so as to be able to ensure that they survive this, uh, this uh, challenging times. And then the third is to institutionalize news and current affairs subjects in schools. We would like to ask uh, legislation that would institutionalize the practice of having through the Department of Education and uh, the Commission on Higher Education 
to be able to uh, include in their curriculum for primary, secondary, and tertiary levels a subject on news and current affairs. What we are thinking, what we're looking at is when this is, this is done, we will be able to provide the young uh, that opportunity to be constantly aware and have a keen sense of consciousness on the developments and happenings around them. As we say, you know, we, we'd like to develop the young people who are involved uh, to take them away from a sense of apathy. They say there are only three kinds of people in the world. People who make things happen, people who watch things happen, and people who wonder what happened. And that's definitely not what we want our children to be, to grow up as. We want them to be involved. We want them to participate in the affairs of state and society. We'd like them to develop critical thinking and analysis, analytical thinking to guide them in taking a stand and making decisions on certain or in different uh, pertinent uh, issues. We'd like to, for them to hone comprehensive reading as well as professional writing skills and reinforce their interest in such endeavors. In summary, Mr. Chairman, the print media industry is in a very serious critical condition. We are in dire need of help, especially from the state. The print media plays a unique and important role in society and in the life of people, as we have seen in history, and we should be foreseeing in the future. We'd like to surmise that reading and writing along with critical and analytical thinking are essential in development of a people and the print media can continue to play a role in being able to do this. So our prayer therefore, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, is our seek, seeking uh, your assistance, your help in legislation for the following, VAT exemption, both in the purchase of paper and ink, and also for our advertisers who patronize our ads. Number two is a tax reduction and assistance package from 25 to 15% and a tax exemption during crisis. And the last, we also ask for an institutionalized uh, creation of subjects on news and current affairs in primary, secondary, and tertiary levels of education. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much, Barbie. Um, I don't know if that was intentional that your appeal was backgrounded with some music. Uh, that was my alarm, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, certainly uh, all points uh, noted. Um, again, uh, we'll need a copy of all these presentations so that we can uh, sort of get to work on drafting any piece of legislation. And, oh, you know, Mr. Um, Chairman. Yeah, go yeah, ahead. Previous, previous to this presentation, we did submit through Mr. Ghana uh, our okay. position paper that uh, incorporates all this. Great. Uh, so, Siguro, since we have like what, roughly eight, nine weeks left uh, in Congress to discuss any kind of proposal. So, what, what we can do is already file all these bills and then uh, try uh, our best to at least start the conversation, get the ball rolling. Um, so, it expedites the process leading into uh, the next Congress. Uh, but certainly, yeah, uh, we are committed to helping the print media industry uh, stay afloat and also recover from the pandemic. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so while I have all the stakeholders here and BOI is also here, just a few uh, questions lang naman. Uh, the, there was a discussion of the incentives earlier as, as enabled by CREATE. Um, so I'm just wondering if any of the stakeholders present are uh, interested in asking any questions. And I heard that uh, it would need an endorsement of the NBDB, at least for the book publishing uh, sector. So uh, offhand, what are your comments on the new incentives regime discussed earlier by BOI? Maybe we could start with you, Barbie, since you're highlighted on the screen. 
Mr. Chairman? Yeah, with the, with the create law being passed and all those incentives being available, uh, has there been a discussion among your members as to anybody who is interested in availing or do these incentives apply to you at all given your capacity? Uh, well, the incentives that are available have been uh, uh, looked at, I think, by the individual companies. As a, an industry, um, there have been some, some of us who have raised, raised the issues and uh, up for discussion. However, uh, we felt, Mr. Chairman, we wanted to stick to uh, some prioritized uh, recommendations. So in this case, the incentives, any incentive, any other assistance, outside what we recommend are, are very, very welcome respite. I think it's going to be yeah. very helpful. I mean, all those deductions, all those income tax holidays mentioned earlier in Create, I personally have yet to digest all of that. Uh, I'm not an expert yeah. in, in taxation, but were any of those mentioned at all interesting to your members? Um, so you said you said Barbie that some are already discussing this on their own. There were there were some because during well we, we were preparing the position paper, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there were open discussions, and yes, there were some who have mentioned the uh, incentives that are available. And I am not so sure how many have really been keen on uh, availing availing of them so far. But as I said, uh, if they're available. Assistance, incentives, if they're there, I'm sure we'll, you know, we'd like to take it. Yeah, I mean, even goes to seven years of income tax holiday. Uh, but of course, it's contingent upon locating uh, outside of NCR. But again, that's another. Uh, I, think, I think it will be, I think it will be most helpful, uh, Comsec and Luis, if we can furnish the presentation of BOI to all the stakeholders uh, because it, it, you do need to really sit down and digest uh, all of those incentives. Uh, from the presentation, I personally didn't understand a lot of the things that were included there. So baka we can just you know, cascade accordingly, no, Luis? Yes, sir. Yes, uh, yes uh, Mr. Chair. For UPMG, we'll... for PEPA, for BDAP, all the industry organizations, if any of yeah. them are interested to know about this new incentives regime. Uh -huh. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, there was a. See, what was it, Ma'am Remedios, who who said earlier about uh, books being classified as mass media. And therefore, it doesn't allow for any kind of foreign ownership. Uh, yes, um, Mr. Chair. Uh oh, so that that would need what some kind of congressional action. Yeah, uh, that would need um, an amendment on the law, since it is since book is classified under mass uh, under media. So what, yes. What law amendment to what law? Um, I think that would on the, the constitution, right? Actually, um, Mr. Chair, I'm not so sure kung which kung paano natin iya amend to. So maybe um, we can ask the help of our lawyers here if ever. Oh, well, actually, Mr. Attorney Andrew is raising her hand. Go ahead, Mr. Chair. Oh. I'm sorry, uh, Chair Clink. Are you being? Ah, I was going to say, I was going to say, uh, Mr. Chair, you might want to look at the Foreign Investment Act. Specifically, the negative list of the FIA. Uh, okay. Um. For I, I think that is a DOJ opinion. It's an old one um, that classifies books under mass media. So um, it's just a DOJ opinion. I think it's a 1980s kind of opinion. Um, there are several opinions of whether books are actually mass media. Nowadays, the definition that's coming out is that books are niche media rather than mass media. I, sorry. Uh, you're muted again. Oh. Sorry. 
Um, so right now, um, people are saying that books are actually niche media rather than mass media. Uh, so um, because niche media meaning it's it's um, made for a specific audience, not for uh, let's say the general population. Um, but there are also uh, uh, there are categories to doing that. For example, there might be an interest in keeping textbooks um, all Filipino, uh, whereas inviting perhaps trade um, investors for trade books um, uh, for in the classification of um, uh, of trade books within niche the, that new, that new classification is coming out now calling books niche rather than mass yeah yeah uh janeline are you still here ma'am janeline yes mr chair uh -oh. so it's a doj opinion pala that defined uh, that included books under the scope of mass media. So, I mean, how do we how do we go about this? I mean, does does a case need to be filed, and then in the in the course of the hearings, that's when perhaps there can be a change of opinion. I mean, how does that work? Because I, um, I I doubt that I honestly doubt that at this day and age books fall under the mass media um considering that i have not read the exact uh, opinion yet but considering that it is under 1986 that's prior to our 1987 constitution so maybe uh the there will be a bearing if we will going to yeah if we are going to look to reconsider, I mean, um, the uh, circumstances attending during this period when the OJ opinion was issued in 1986. And whenever there will be a request that will be sought at uh, this time, uh, considering again the circumstances that we have recently, I mean, the changes of the landscape of publication might be different before than as of the present so i had to check as well if because the negative list is uh being changed from time to time uh well by personal um, position maybe there uh the possible step would be to uh make a clarification on that list or footnote on whether or not it is uh, covering, uh, mass media is covering uh, books. So I mean, uh, the DOJ opinion uh, that is uh, a 1986 issue once uh, may, may be set aside, uh, this is personal only, whenever our negative list will say otherwise. So I think there's no need for any case to be filed just to uh, change the context of whether or not the opinion of DOJ on mass media, including books, has to be changed okay. uh, by legislation or whatever. So I think the step is maybe the change on negative list may do. All right, uh, Chair Kling, since you mentioned the negative list, and I'm not so familiar with the Foreign Investment Act, but who is the one who prepares the neg negative list? Is it the BOI? I, uh, Mr. Chair, I believe it's the B BOI, but um, I, I do believe it's all, also it's part of the Foreign Investment Act, which is, and the, I, I think as the DOJ has said, that the negative list is updated from, from time to time. Uh, I'm not certain if it specifically mentions books. It does mention mass media. And I think this is where the DOJ opinion comes in on what constitutes as mass, mass media. Uh, so I think there is an opinion that perhaps, you know, uh, books cannot be, sub, you know, can be exempted or should not be subsumed under that broad definition. Okay, so, wh so where do we begin? The the DOJ opinion that needs to be reconsidered? Or is it the 
negative list in which obviously if it changes, it's not something that's codified in the law. Rather, it's on an implementing agency to update. I might have to uh, defer to the BOI, but you know certainly there may be room for some uh, legislative um, crafting here, uh, maybe a simple amendment to the to the Foreign in Investment Act, maybe specific specifying certain definitions, particularly the definition of mass media. Okay, um, Ma'am Remedios, would you like to chime in in behalf of the BOI? Um. Okay, um, Mr. Chair, I'll note that and maybe um, discuss it also and refer it to our legal team. Uh, and then just give us, uh, Siguro, between the three of you, maybe give us a recommendation, like where do we start? Uh, because again, it, it books hardly constitute as mass media in this day and age. Um, okay. Sige. And then, of course, we're going to have a separate meeting on intellectual property. Uh, but pending the submission of all the documents, and we'll just need a little bit of time to digest all of those issues that were presented by Phil Coles, um and Attorney Andrea, as well as uh, Peppa. Um, perhaps, yeah, we also need to uh, digest further the Florence Agreement, uh, but that's really with regards to importation and some kind of exemptions uh, to be able to further assist the industry. Um, actually, uh, I wanted to share this. This idea was inspired by what was shared by attorney Andrea about how e-commerce has become sort of like a, a lifeline for publishers that comes with its own benefits also, um, especially in this time of COVID. And I've, because I've been, you know, up to here with the, the food that I've been eating every day um, uh, in our household. I recently made huge purchases on Lazada and Shopee for cookbooks. Um, and I didn't realize that uh, all these publishers had digital storefronts uh, in Lazada and Shopee and other e-commerce sites unless you know, the need for it arose. Um, and so I don't know if this is something that NBDB would consider, but in all of your dealings with these e-commerce platforms, maybe there can be more prominent uh, display of these storefronts of our publishers. Um, it's maybe something that can be considered because I, I honestly, Chair, think I wouldn't have known about these books if the need for them didn't arise. And mm. knowing that these digital storefronts are, were there, oh my gosh, I was so trigger happy ordering all these books. It's like, oh wow, I don't even have to go to a bookstore. Um, and since I'm based here in the Gupan, a lot of the books, like the, some of the books are not with national books. That's available, yeah they're probably with fully booked or the specialty bookstores there. So I really have no means of like going and purchasing until I found out that through the Zad Shopee, oh my, wow, so many publishers are present there, but I just didn't know, know about them. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, Mr. Chair, the, the, the private uh, publishers themselves should be credited for that because that was really their initiative to onboard a number of publishers on the Lazada and Shopee platform. Uh, the NBDB, I think, only followed in their example when we uh, initiated um, a program promoting textbooks. But uh, yes, uh, we'll see how we can expand that collaboration, Mr. Chair. It just needs a, like a more prominent yeah. play in the app uh, as some kind of support to the sector. Uh, well, just, just a suggestion. Uh, Noted on all the points on in the SWAT, Attorney Andrea, 
Uh, so we're gonna study all of that. Uh, and then also the suggestions from UPMG on VAT exemptions and income tax reductions and the institutionalized news and current affairs subject. Uh, siguro we can, yeah, we can definitely draft the legislation on the on items one and three. Pero on the second, I think it needs a review vis-a-vis -vis the create law regime that has been created. But again, a lot of us still need to digest. Um, yeah. Okay. Are there any other comments from, I, I believe Kong Edward is also with us. Hi, Kong Edward. Kong Edward Maseda is present. Thank you for joining. Um, any, any other uh, participant who wishes to clarify anything? None? Okay, so, yeah. so let's go, let's move on to final reminders so long before we adjourn. Luis? Yes, so, yeah. Mr. Chair, uh, one moment, please. Yeah, while well, we're waiting for the slides, uh, I just want to encourage everyone to please support NBDB and uh, their uh, ongoing activities that are available and viewable in their Facebook page, uh, especially with their ongoing participation in the Frankfurt Book Fair. Uh, I just watched the video of JP Anglo cooking recipes from three culinary books, and it's really going to make you hungry. Um, so let's all support that. Uh, the next hearing will be November 11. This is excluding the special meeting that we'll be having with Dep Ed. Um, on intellectual property. But November 11, we'll tackle local government collaboration and authors and workers' welfare issues. All right. Next slide, if any. Uh, all right. So uh, we encourage stakeholders also to please participate in this design economy mapping being undertaken by the Design Center of the Philippines. Uh, definitely, it covers your sector. And I just, I had a, a Viber exchange with E.D. Charisse Tugade, and there is a lot of opportunity to be able to upskill our uh, book publishers in terms of design and design that resonates with um, international markets. So this is a collaboration that we're going to try to uh, create between NBDB and Design Center, but it just goes to show that design affects absolutely all areas of our lives and of our businesses, most especially publishing industry. So please accomplish this survey. And then also on the bottom left um, is the QR code to join the Create Philippines Viber group uh, in which you can learn about what's happening in the creative economy. And if you have any announcements that you'd like to post here, um, you can just get in touch with the admin and they will be more than happy to post uh, your announcements uh, for your businesses. Um, all right. And then ongoing also this week uh, are the Design Week Philippines of Design Center and Fame Plus of SITEM. So let's support those. Uh, registration is free. Uh, lots of really, really good panels and talks um, as curated by SITEM. Uh, and the previous slide uh, is a QR, no QR code, but maybe we can have one for uh, the Achieve, for the Achieve Instagram account and then there's also a facebook page if you want to learn everything about the creative industries and what the block is doing for them uh we should have a qr code for this Luis. but it's easier yes mr sure for people to uh join yeah, we'll right. also include the or facebook page any more announcements i think that's it okay that's it um, and th on that note, uh, thank you once again. And 
uh, can I hear a motion from a member to adjourn? Any member? Um, sir, you can just adjourn the meeting. Okay. Um, all right. So this meeting is hereby adjourned. Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Salamat.